We have four for a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the uh, first item of business is oral argument for non-adopted proposed uh, decision on uh, Dr. Lauren Morgan and uh, Dr. Carly, I mean, Judge Carly will uh, uh, conduct the procedures. Proceed. Thank you. On the record, please, Ms. Till. Before the Medical Board of California, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California. This is in the matter of the first amended accusation and petition Sorry, to re I have to bother you. If you use the yes. microphone, we wet cast this. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Were you able to get that, Ms. Uh, this is the matter of the first amended accusation and petition to revoke probation against Lauren Morgan, MD, Physicians and Surgeons Certificate Number C-23681. This is a noticed hearing on oral argument noticed hearing for oral argument, rather, on an order of non-adoption of proposed decision. OAH number 20111-20883, agency case number D1-2002-132501. It is July 24th, the year 2014. We're in Sacramento, California. The time, date, and place set for the oral argument on this matter. I'm Ann Elizabeth Sarley, Administrative Law Judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Counsel, will you state your appearances for the record, please, beginning with Mr. Tan. For the complainant, Jansen Tan, T-A-N, Deputy Attorney General. Thank you, sir. For respondent, Dr. Morgan, Lou Anapolsky, and Kurt Hendrickson. I'm sorry, I missed Mr. Anderson's first name. Kurt. Kurt, thank Hendrickson. you. Is that with a C or a K? K. Thank you. And is Dr. Morgan present? Dr. Morgan is present, He's sitting behind me to my left. Thank you. If you'd like, you can bring a chair up to council table and the doctor can sit with you up there. All right, before we begin the oral argument, are there any matters um, the parties wish to uh, address, any procedural matters? We have none, Your Honor. All right. I'll note for the record that the um, board has been provided with the written arguments of both parties. Um, the or rules for the or oral argument have been presented to both sides. We'll begin with an opening argument by respondent, uh, who may take up to 15 minutes, followed by a responsive argument by complainant, who may take up to 15 minutes, a closing argument by respondent, who may take up to five minutes, and a closing argument by complainant who may take up to five minutes. Following that, if Dr. Morgan wishes to address the board, I'll place him under oath and he may make a statement to the board. And after that, if any of the board members have any questions for the doctor or for either counsel, they'll be invited to ask those questions at that time. Are, are you ready to proceed, Mr. Tan? I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Anposky? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Honorable members of this medical panel, whenever an administrative law judge or a, the Division of Medical Quality exercises its disciplinary authority, protection of the public shall be its highest priority. We find that in Business and Professions Code section 229A, 2229A. Now, when considering a proposed decision, the board or the panel <coughs> shall give great weight to the findings of the administrative law judge. We find support for that in Business and Professions Code Section 2335. In the proposed decision at issue in this case, Legal Conclusion 12 states as follows. As set forth in the, finding, in the factual findings and legal conclusions as a whole, probation is appropriate. Why, after writing a 55-page proposed decision, did the administrative law judge, Marilyn Woolard, in this case, reach this conclusion? Why did the ALJ believe that the public would be adequately protected if Dr. Morgan were, was placed on probation for five years and allowed to continue to practice medicine and surgery? The answer is found in both the history and the evidence of this case. 
On May 9, 2011, the board filed a petition for interim suspension order against Dr. Morgan, alleging that his continuance of the practice of medicine would endanger the public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, on May 10, 2011, this matter first was considered by the Office of Administrative Hearings and a continuance was grant granted at that time to allow Dr. Morgan to be present for the hearing. What's the significance? By May 10, 2011, that's nine months after the board had first received information from its expert, Dr. Fromming, that Dr. Morgan suffered, in her opinion, Dr. Morgan suffered from cognitive impairments such that he was unsafe to practice medicine and surgery nine months before. The hearing was held March 25 and 26, 2011. Dr. Morgan was present. He extensively testified both under direct examination and cross-examination and took questions from the administrative law judge, Diane Borders, at that time. On June 9, 2011, uh, Judge Borders issued her ruling denying the petition for uh, ISO. And in her ruling, she basically found the evidence insufficient to indicate that Dr. Morgan suffered from cognitive impairments such that he was unsafe to practice medicine. The case proceeded. Five months after the board having received Judge Borders' order denying the petition for ISO, the board filed its uh, accusation and petition to revoke probation against Dr. Morgan. Based on the same allegations and the same evidence, in the petition for the ISO. Nothing different, nothing new, nothing had changed. Then the history reveals that as we got closer and closer to trial, when we came up on the first uh, pre-hearing conference, the board asked or informed the judge that it would be seeking a continuance because a first amended accusation was going to be filed. So then, Several months later, a first amended accusation was filed. This was filed in December, 20, on 20, December 28, 2012. We had initially set the hearing in this case for uh, uh, back in November. It was November 5 uh, through 9 and 13 through 14 of 2012. That's when the case was first supposed to go to trial. It didn't. The board sought a continuance. The board received a continuance. And now the case finally goes to hearing October 28 through November 8 and November 18, 2013. So, during the two and a half years that it took the board to bring this case to trial, the status quo was that Dr. Morgan was on probation and continued to practice medicine. Dr. Morgan successfully completed his probation and his medical license was fully restored. During the interim two and a half year period, the board had time to produce new or different evidence as to the critical issue in this case, and this has always been the critical issue in this case, whether Dr. Morgan suffered from cognitive impairments such that he was rendered unsafe to practice medicine. The board failed to do so, but to use the same allegations produced during the ISO proceeding. Same evidence, same allegations, that's what the board went to trial with. The board's two and a half year delay in bringing this case to trial is inconsistent now with its position that Dr. Morgan's continued practice of medicine poses a danger to the public. This delay is also inconsistent with the permanent revocation of Dr. Morgan's license. Throughout the 11 days of trial in this case, the board offered absolutely no explanation or reasons for its delay in bringing this matter to trial. If the revocation of Dr. Morgan's license was truly necessary in order to protect the public, why did the board delay for over two and a half years in bringing this matter to trial? The board's unexplained delay of two and a half years in bringing this case to trial in and of itself argues strongly against the permanent revocation of Dr. Morgan's medical license. So let's take a quick review of the proposed decision and penalty. On the issue of cognitive impairment and the alleged incompetency to safely practice medicine, legal conclusions seven and eight deal with this issue. 
In legal conclusion seven, Judge Willard found that the evidence, it was not established by clear and convincing evidence that Dr. Morgan's ability to practice medicine was impaired because he was either mentally or physically ill such that it would affect his competency. In legal conclusion eight, similar to legal conclusion seven, Judge Willard found that it uh, was not established by a preponderance of the evidence that respondent's probation should be revoked. And it's important to understand that the revocation of probation was predicated upon the same factual basis as the fourth cause for discipline, specifically that Dr. Morgan suffered from a mental condition such that he was incompetent to safely practice medicine. Now over the course of two and a half years, the issue of Dr. Morgan's alleged cognitive impairment and competency to practice medicine was put to the test of evidence by, in front of two different administrative law judges. Administrative law judge Borders and administrative law judge Woolard each reached, independently, each reached the same <coughs> result. Based on the board's evidence, each administrative law judge found the evidence insufficient to establish that Dr. Morgan's ability to practice medicine was impaired because he's mental, he was mentally or physically ill. So what are the legal conclusions that give rise to discipline in this case? And there are three, and only three. After 11 days of trial, the only violations that were found to exist and upon which discipline can be based are as follows. First was Dr. Morgan's former practice of administering Profoval. Uh, I'm sorry, for the first finding was that uh, Dr. Morgan's for former practice of administering Profoval during surgery constituted repeated negligent acts. Dr. Morgan was also found to have inadequate medical records in reference to two of his patients, a second basis. As a third basis, Dr. Morgan's interaction with emergency and medical services personnel <clears throat> on a single day, January 11, 2012, was found to be a third basis, gross negligence in this case. The, discipline, the, the, the disciplinary penalty in this case must be predicated on and consistent with these three violations. The first violation, we can find the violation addressed at legal conclusion number nine in the proposed decision which basically provides that as set forth in the factual findings and legal conclusions as a whole and particularly in factual findings 25 and 35, it was established by clear and convincing evidence that respondent engaged in repeated negligent acts by his conduct of administering Profoval to patients at his ambulatory surgery center. Now the use of Dr. Morgan's Profoval in surgery was not disputed in this case. He had safely administered Profoval to patients for over 20 years without any incidents. He was trained in moderate care anesthesia um, and the use of Profoval. He simply didn't realize that the warning insert on the drug package for Profoval had changed, which would required a separate anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthetist to administer the Profoval while Dr. Morgan was performing surgery. After he was informed of this change in protocol in November of 2011, Dr. Morgan immediately changed how he used Profoval in the operating room, such to bring in an outside nurse anesthetist or an anesthesiologist to administer the Profoval to his patients, and he continues with that practice today. There's no evidence in the record of any harm to any of Dr. Morgan's surgical patients to whom he administered Profoval, including the three surgical cases at issue and mentioned in the proposed. There is, is no issue as to protection of the public as Dr. Morgan has discontinued personally administering Profoval to his patients. Dr. Morgan now only uses an outside nurse anesthetist or anesthesiologist to administer Profoval during his surgeries. So Dr. Morgan's former practice of personally administering Profoval to patients during surgery can pose no threat of harm to the public. Probation is the appropriate penalty based on these facts, circumstances, and evidence surrounding the repeated negligent acts of administering Profoval to patients at Dr. Morgan's Ambulatory Surgery Center. The next legal conclusion at issue is legal conclusion 10, which finds that clear and convincing evidence established that Dr. Morgan failed to maintain adequate and accurate medical records within the meaning of Business and Professions Code Section 2266. Now, it was noted that Dr. Morgan's record-keeping style was terse, 
apparently based on the belief that only he and his nurse, uh, Nurse Morgan, were likely to rely on those records. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Morgan was charged with inadequate record keeping for three patients. These were surgical patients that were, on, that were only used by, uh, I'm sorry, the records at issue for these surgical patients were records only used by Dr. Morgan and Nurse Morgan. And many of the uh, allegations concerning the deficiencies of Dr. Morgan's medical records were simply not proven at trial. There's no evidence of any harm to patients as a result of the inadequate record keeping. And as a condition of probation, Judge Woolard required that Dr. Morgan enroll in a course of medical record keeping equivalent, equivalent to the medical record keeping course offered by the PACE program at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine to be approved by the board or its designee in advance. Now this condition of probation adequately addresses the issue as to inadequate medical records. There is no issue that exists as to protection of the public. The continuing medical education requirement uh, as a condition of probation adequately protects the public in this case. The last legal conclusion deals with what happened um, during the uh, evening of January 11, 2012 regarding Dr. Morgan's interaction with emergency room, uh, I'm sorry, with EMTs during a, visit, during a uh, post-operative visit to a patient's home. This, <clears throat> this situation resulted in a finding of gross negligence by Judge Woolard. <clears throat> now the situation that caused Dr. Morgan to interact with the EMTs at the patient's home was, very, uh, was a very, very unusual circumstance. Factual finding 73 provides that it was undisputed that it was an unusual situation to have a patient's physician present at a, at a home to which the EMTs respond. Mr. <clears throat> Kleinschmidt, who was a paramedic, has worked in the capacity in, in emergency, emergency services in various capacities since 2003. He testified that he never had an interaction with a physician on the scene before. Mr. Rutan, he was the EMT had only encountered this situation twice in thousands of emergency calls. Uh, Dr. Morgan testified that he had worked with many paramedics in the hospital, but never in this situation where both were on a house call. Now, Dr. Morgan was called to the patient's home after having completed an abdominoplasty on the patient three hours earlier. Upon arriving at the patient's home, he, he assessed the patient and he quickly determined that she needed to go to the hospital so he could repair what he believed to be an arterial bleed. An arterial bleed is a common complication of this surgery. Uh, Dr. Morgan, as the patient surgeon, was the person most knowledgeable about the patient and her surgical site. His intent was simply to take care of his patient. Upon arriving, he assessed the patient, determined she needed to go to the hospital. He instructed the patient's hospital, um, uh, the patient's husband, to contact, to call 911 uh, and um, have an ambulance come to the house to transport the patient to the hospital. Dr. Morgan believed that it was his responsibility and he was responsible for the treatment and care of his patient and he acted in accordance with his belief. This was a situation where Dr. Morgan assumed that the EMTs would work with him and follow his instructions about transporting the patient to the hospital and why. Well, Dr. Morgan, as a former doctor for many, many years, had worked with medics in the Army, as well as EMTs uh, at the hospital in the emergency room setting. And based on his experience, Army medics and EMTs followed the instructions of the treating physician in charge of patient care. In this case, however, the EMTs believed differently than Dr. Morgan. They attempted to assume responsibility for the treatment and care of this patient. And a disagreement ensued between the EMTs and Dr. Morgan. Ultim ultimately, the disagreement was resolved when the patient elected to go to a uh, by ambulance to Enlo Hospital in Chico. The administrative law judge found that Dr. Morgan interfered with the EMTs and delayed the transport of the patient to the hospital. Now, you may reasonably disagree with the way that Dr. Morgan dealt with the EMTs at the patient's house, but you can certainly understand that Dr. Morgan's intent was simply to try and take care of his patient. He needed to get to the, uh, the patient to the hospital so he could surgically repair the arterial bleed. There was no evidence of and thus no finding was made that the delay in transport caused any additional harm to the patient. 
The patient was ultimately transported to Inlow Medical uh, Hospital in Chico. Dr. Morgan's conduct in arranging for the patient's care by Dr. Cleek at Enloe Hospital so that she would be seen and treated quickly was found to be a factor in mitigation in this case. As to the gross negligence violation, it is extremely, extremely unlikely Dr. Morgan would ever encounter these circumstances again in his career. A patient's physician is rarely at the patient's home when emergency service personnel are called to the home. Probation is the appropriate penalty as no issue exists in this case as to adequate protection of the, uh, to the public in the future. Now after con conducting an 11-day trial, Judge Woolard carefully studied all of the evidence in this case in order to arrive at the factual findings and legal conclusions. What did she do? She studied and analyzed, in addition, the numerous documents in this case. She took testimony from all of the witnesses, including, most importantly, Dr. Morgan. Dr. Morgan testified extensively under direct examination, under cross-examination, under questions from uh, J Judge Woolard over the span of three different days. In her 55-page decision, Judge Woolard concluded, as set forth in Legal Conclusion 12, as set forth in the factual findings and legal conclusions as a whole, probation is appropriate. It is important to understand that Administrative Law Judge Woolard and Administrative Law Judge Vorters are charged with the exact same responsibility that this panel, as this panel, in exercising disciplinary authority over Dr. Morgan. Counsel, you have 30 seconds. As the ALJ, as the judges knew and understood, they're guided by the same principle, which is protection of the public. <clears throat> in this case, two separate administrative law judges have weighed the evidence presented by the board in an attempt to permanently revoke the medical license of Dr. Morgan, and in each instance, having stood the test of evidence, each judge separately determined that Dr. Morgan's continuance in the practice of medicine and surgery does not pose a danger to the public. This panel must give great weight to the factual findings and legal conclusions of Administrative Law Judge Willard. Revocation stayed with five years probation under the terms and conditions of the proposed order is the appropriate penalty and should not be modified by this panel. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Tam? Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the board, Your Honor, good morning. <clears throat> First off, I'd like to uh, state that the, the board may increase the penalty in this case. Under government code section 11517, subsection C2E, the board may reject a proposed decision and decide the case upon the record. Now with that said, the Medical Board of California not adopted the proposed decision of Administrative Law Judge uh, Woolard and requested the parties to submit oral and written arguments specifically to the question of whether the proposed penalty should be modified. We submit that the penalty recommended by ALJ Woolard is insufficient to protect the public. We submit that the proper penalty in this case should be revocation. Revocation is warranted to fully protect the public given the gravity, the brazenness, and the pattern of similar conduct displayed by the respondent throughout the years. This is not the respondent's first time before the medical board in a disciplinary proceeding. Respondent's acts of gross negligence in this present case are of such gravity that his actions could have resulted in the death of a patient, patient VA. Here, and let me focus you on the issue, the, the issue is Respondent's gross negligence in interfering with the EMTs that fateful day on um, January 21. Respondent had performed an abdominal plasty on patient VA and sent her home the same day with a wound vacuum. The wound vacuum malfunctioned and patient VA's husband called respondent. Respondent went to patient VA's home and after trying to fix the wound vac unsuccessfully, Respondent asked the patient's husband to call 911. At this point, he realizes that there is an emergency. It's imminent. He actually asked the patient's husband to call 911. At 7.36 p.m., emergency medical services arrive at the home of patient VA. Respondent told the EMTs, look, the 
patient needs to be transported to Oroville Hospital because that was where he had medical privileges. That was his reasoning. Unfortunately, Oroville Hospital was approximately 40 miles away. Now, I hearken back to um, um, respondent's attorney stating that uh, he was just trying to take care of his patient. Now, Oroville was approximately 40 miles away. On the other hand, the EMT told respondent that Enlo Hospital was closer. It was only 3.8 miles away, vis-a-vis -vis 40 miles away. Furthermore, the EMT told the respondent, we needed to assess the patient, we need to assess the patient first before making a transport decision. At this point, the, M the EMT, Mr. Kleinschmidt, tried to assess patient VA. Respondent suddenly become, became agitated and physically blocked the door so the EMT could not enter and perform an assessment. The EMT, the EMT, having the patient's safety in mind, tried to appease the respondent and went out to get the gurney. Mr. Kleinschmidt testified, I just wanted to avoid a conflict. I wanted to get her out of there. She wanted, they wanted to assess her, take her out in a gurney, and take her to Enlo, the closer hospital. When he went out to get the gurney upon his return, the EMT found a patient collapse at the floor. Respondent told the EMT that he tried to walk the patient to the door, but the patient collapsed because of loss of blood. The EMTs testified that they saw numerous canisters um, of blood from the wound vac, and they were worried that the patient had lost a lot of blood. Seeing the patient on the floor, keep in mind at this point the EMTs have not yet assessed the patient. Seeing the patient on the floor, the EMT tried to assess the patient. Surprisingly, despite the patient collapsing on the floor, respondent again verbally prevented the EMT from assessing the patient. Furthermore, respondent still insisted that the patient be taken to Oroville, the hospital 40 miles away. Now, respondent's conduct did not stop there. At a later point, Respondent then grabbed the gurney and began pulling it onto the front steps of the house. He wanted to take patient VA in her minivan, basically. The paramedic was grabbing the other side of the gurney, and there was, in the words of, a, of, the, of a patient VA and her husband, it was almost like a brawl. The EMT told the respondent to leave the equipment alone and stressed that an assessment was needed. Respondent blocked the EMTs using his body and stood aggressively approximately six to eight inches away from the EMT's face. The EMTs at this point were ready to call the police. Now keep in mind there was another paramedic at the scene and all of them testified, consistently testified, that the EMTs, the paramedics, they were all calm and professional. The only one who was agitated was the respondent. The only one that was standing, um, blocking the EMTs from assessing the respondent, I'm sorry, from assessing the patient was the respondent. Now somehow the EMTs managed to um, eventually assess the patient and told her, look, if we don't bring you to Enlo, you're going to die. So, Patient VA agreed to be taken to Enlo. They transported her code three. Code three means sirens, lights and sirens, close to the closest hospital. At the hospital, she was in shock. The EMT testified at the hearing, Mr. Kleinsmith, that the standard of care for emergency personnel in seeing a trauma patient is 10 minutes, 10 minutes. In this instance, because of respondents' histrionics, it took them a total of 25 minutes. Now, VA was in shock. Needless to say, had the EMT and the paramedic allowed patient VA to be brought to Oroville, which was 40 miles away, she would have surely died. At the hearing, instead of acknowledging his mistakes, similarly today, instead of acknowledging his mistakes, 
respondent remained defiant. He testified that he did not interfere with the EMTs. He minimized the situation, called it a disagreement. He denied physically blocking the EMTs. He denied struggling with a gurney and denied preventing the EMTs from taking the patient's vital signs and assessing the patients. The ALJ found otherwise. The ALJ found respondent's testimony as unpersuasive. The ALJ found both the EMT and the paramedic as credible. They both consistently described respondent's bizarre behavior. The ALJ also found the most neutral witness to be the paramedic. He testified that the EMT never became verbally aggressive towards respondent. At the hearing, as today, the ALJ also found that respondent tried to divert attention from his conduct to the EMTs. He argued that in his military experience that he was the, um, the one in charge of patient care. Of course, at the hearing, the, the ALJ disagreed and found that that is not the case. There are protocols for emergency services, and those protocols clearly state that the EMS, at that point in time, when you call 911, they are in charge. The ALJ also found respondent's testimony at times contradictory. Now, as an example, at the hearing, respondent testified that it was not necessary for the EMTs to obtain the patient's vital signs in the assessor. He said he's already done that before the EMTs even arrived. But at the hearing, we played the tape, the tape of his interview with a board investigator, where he clearly stated that he was sure that patient VA was unstable. In his words, patient VA was unstable. That's why he called 911. That contradicts his testimony at the hearing and characterizes and demonstrates his defiant behavior. With regard to the ALJ's finding on the second issue, that is repeated negligent acts involving the use of propofol. Now, propofol is an anesthetic that may cause respiratory depression in patients and can either slow or stop breathing in patients. It, it's gained some no notoriety recently because of the Michael Jackson case. The warning label of propofol clearly provides, it's on the outside, it's on the package insert, it clearly provides, if you open it up, if you're using propofol, Unless you're blind, you will see it. The warning, label, the warning label, rather, I'm sorry, clearly provides that patients should be continuously monitored and that it should only be administered by persons trained in its administration and not involved in the conduct of the surgery. The reason is propofol is so facts acting, especially in an IV setting, the patient can just lose consciousness and lose control of airway management just like that. And if, it's, if, in, and if a physician is busy conducting the surgery, he's liable to miss it and the patient will die. Respondent engaged in repeated negligent acts when he administered propofol or allowed his nurse to administer propofol to three patients several different times while also performing other duties. Consequently, no one was responsible for monitoring the airway of the patients, placing them at risk. Keep in mind, at any point in time, Dr. Morgan was involved in the surgery and the nurse was with him. No one was monitoring the, the, the patient at this point. With regards to the findings of the ALJ as to documentation, the ALJ found that the respondent failed to document the time and date when drugs were administered, in this case IV medication, to patients. The standard of care is that proper documentation of time and date is important for continuity of care and to protect the patient from potential overdose. Respondent's records Record-keeping style was found to be terse and involved the use of standing and verbal orders for medications that are not documented. Again, patient safety was put at risk 
and the ALJ concluded the respondent failed to maintain adequate and accurate records for two patients. Now, respondent's aforementioned conduct, unfortunately, is not an isolated incident as um, he would like you to believe. No, he has actually engaged in a pattern of similar conduct before. And let me stress that during the times that these offenses or these incidents happened, he was in probation. He just completed PACE. And yet, he was not able to read the propofol warning label, and he still interfered with the EMTs. He was in probation. On September of 2008, respondent entered into a stipulated settlement where he was placed on probation for several causes of discipline. And let me run down to you this pattern of similar conduct, and you will see a pattern. The acts alleged in 2008, with regards to the first cause of action in that discipline, respondent failed to remove a stint and failed to document that he could not account for the stint. This was uh, an out-of-state discipline action and, um, and this is demonstrative that the respondent continues to have issues with documentation and has difficulty in following proper safety procedure. Um, he had issues with documentation at that point, and he still does today. And he's already undergone probation, he's already gone pace, and it still is not adequate to protect the public in this, in this instance. In the fourth cause of action in a 2008 discipline, respondent was alleged to have hit a patient on the forehead with the bottom of his closed fist as the patient was awakening from surgery. Now, this is strikingly similar to the present case where respondent presented with the same cavalier and reckless attitude when the EMTs responded to patient VA's home. The sixth cause of action involved respondent's repeated negligence involving patient SD's care where respondent caused a flexion type deformity at the PIP joint. Respondent also provided insufficient follow-up care, performed an inappropriate and unnecessary procedure, and failed to get an unsedated pre-surgery consent form. The seven cause of discipline for the 2008 discipline involved repeated negligence in the care of patient NB, where respondent ordered the use of a DDAVP without medical justification. He also failed to get informed consent for a procedure and perform an abdominoplasty in a patient who presented with an extremely high risk for surgery. Now these past incidents are ominous in the present case where a patient almost died because of respondent's cavalier and reckless attitude and behavior in interfering with the EMTs. It also reflects on his poor medical judgment as evidence in the present case in ignoring the propofol package insert and administering propofol to three patients over the years in such dangerous conditions. It's literally like playing Russian roulette. We're lucky these patients haven't actually died or lost control of their airway. Counsel, you have 30 seconds. Furthermore, it is clear that the penalty in the prior probation was insufficient to prevent respondent from fall falling below the standard of care yet again. It would be disingenuous to mete out a penalty lighter than the one meted out in the prior probation case, considering the demonstrated inability of respondent to change his practices. It is clear that probation and pace is insufficient to protect the public since re the respondent reoffended with virtually the same causes of action. Keep in mind, in this case, the judge did not even recommend PACE. It's just a five-year probation with an education course and medical record keeping course, which is significantly lower than the penalty meted out in the prior probation. So in closing, we submit that revocation is fully warranted. The paramount duty of the board is to protect the public. How many times does the respondent get? How many opportunities does he have to take another bite at the apple? At this point, are we going to wait until somebody from the public actually perishes? We, re we recommend that the, the proper penalty in this case is revocation. 
given the gravity, brazenness, and pattern of similar conduct displayed by the respondent. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Anapolsky? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we are... Uh, we are mindful of the admonition that we are to argue only on the basis of the existing record and no new evidence is supposed to be argued in front of you. Um, however, several things come to mind. <clears throat> you heard over and over about the patient, the post-surgical patient that Dr. Morgan saw um, and the interference with the EMTs and this patient almost died, this patient almost died, this patient almost died. Where in the record, ladies and gentlemen, do we have any medical testimony from competent physicians that this patient almost died? There is none. If there, and there's plenty of medical records in this case, starting with the EMTs at, and, and all the way through the hospital when she's admitted, where if the board really thought that was the case, one would think that a medical doctor would have been uh, obtained as an expert witness to render the opinion, this patient almost died. There's no such evidence in this case. I told you before that the board or panel is to give great weight to the findings of fact of the administrative law judge. Now, why would we have that in our, in our legal system. Why is that policy important in our legal system? And I would submit to you it's as simple as this. You're at a disadvantage when you look at a cold record of this case and try to assess and figure out what happened. Judge Woolard, in turn, had the, had the advantage where she could take live testimony. She can see the witnesses. She can understand the context of the evidence in a different context than what you're left with because of having to look at a cold record. And her ability to review witnesses, assess their demeanor, assess their credibility, figure out the evidence within the total context of the case is one of the reasons why we have, as a matter of public policy, great weight should be given to the findings of Judge Willard in this case. It's really that simple. And what, what did she find? After hearing all of this evidence, what was proven, and most importantly, what was not proven, she still found that probation was the appropriate penalty in this case. And if she's charged with protection of the public, just like you're charged with protection of the public, why did she find that probation was important, in, or was the appropriate penalty in this case? Because she, most importantly, heard from Judge, uh, Dr. Morgan over three days of testimony he, she heard his side of the story. She heard his explanations. She listened to him, and she listened to him closely. And she trusted him enough to understand that he poses no danger to the public in the continuance of his medical practice. Thus, probation is the appropriate penalty as found by Judge Woolard. So should you find in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tan? How is probation sufficient to protect the public? I ask that of the board and those that have heard this story here today. How is it sufficient? We've heard about respondent's long history with discipline. We've heard about him, his cavalier attitude with patients, using his bo the bottom of his fist to hit a patient, not getting pre-operative consent He's gone rogue, and now we hear that he's interfering with an EMT in trying to get a patient to the closest hospital. Let me assure you, a, a cursory review of the transcript reveals that the EMT, Mr. Kleinsmith, stated that if we don't get you to Enlo fast, you're going to die. That's in evidence. That's in the transcript. Minimizing the event does not help the public. We know the seriousness of this event, and we know and respectfully submit that revocation is the only penalty that can protect the public. We've tried probation. We've tried PACE. It didn't work. In fact, during his probation, these incidents occurred. How many bites at the apple does respondent get? I don't know. 
But all I know is it's the duty of this board to protect the public. And we can't roll the dice because the next time we roll the dice, someone might actually die. So we submit that revocation is the only penalty in this case sufficient to adequately protect the public. Thank you. Ms. Stranopolsky, do you wish uh, the doctor to testify? Um, Dr. Morgan's not prepared to provide any remarks to the board today. All right. Do any of the board members have any questions for either <clears throat> Mr. Tan or Mr. Anapolowski? If you do, please uh, raise your hand. All right, thank you. Are there any other matters, counsel, before this is submitted? We have none, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. The matter is submitted and the record is closed. Thank you. Off the record. Good afternoon, all. I want to ask all of us to please turn our cell phones to silent and make sure they're off the table so we can avoid feedback noise. You may notice board members accessing their laptops during the meeting. They are using the laptop solely to access board meeting materials that are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California. As such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful of the need to conduct the board's business. Should anyone disrupt the meeting, I will ask the person to conduct themselves or herself in such a manner that permits the board to transact its business. This meeting will be available via teleconference. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, <coughs> press star 1. You will hear a tone indicating that you are in the queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not want to make a comment, press the pound sign. Assistance is available throughout the teleconference meeting. To request a specialist, press star 0. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. However, during agenda item two, public comments on no items not on the agenda, the board has limited the public comment period for individuals on the teleconference to 20 minutes. In addition, public, that would be 20 minutes total. In addition, public comment from individuals here at the meeting will also be limited to 20 minutes total. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for comments from individuals on the teleconference line and those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. C. Vang will be assisting me with receiving the public comments via teleconference during this meeting. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board act taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and my colleague doesn't hit me and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand and you'll be recognized. I would like to remind all speakers to complete a presenter slip so I can call you by name at the appropriate time and that the record of this meeting can be full and complete. Please give the speaker slips to Ms. Pavlaka. Ms. Pavlaka, can you identify yourself? I will do my best to call upon everyone who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to make a last minute comment, but will ask that you fill out a speaker slip after your comments so we can have it for re the record. I want to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to three minutes or less. We plan to end today at 2 p.m. I would like to call the meeting to order and ask that Ms. Pavlak please call the roll. Thank you. Dr. Lewis? Present. Ms. Pines? Present. Ms. Shipsky? Ms. Wright? Present. And Dr. Bishop? Here. 
Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. Moving to agenda item two, public comments not on, or on items not on the agenda. Are there any speaker slips? Anything from the teleconference line? There are no comments at this time. Thank you. Then absent any comments from the public, we'll move on to agenda item two. I'm sorry, three. Thank you. I can't count today. Approval of minutes from the January 31, 2013 licensing committee meeting. After review of those minutes, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? May I have a motion to approve these as submitted? I motion to approve. Is there a second? We weren't there. Right. We were staying. Oh, all three. That's right. Can I second? Came after that. That's right. So if there's a second, you can vote to approve. Okay, I will second it. I was present. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Is there any public comment? Any comment from the phone? There are no comments at this time. Thank you. All in favor of approval of the minutes? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Very good. Abstain. Oh, abstentions, pardon me. All right, the, meet, the minutes are approved. All right. Now, moving on to an exciting presentation today. Uh, Ms. Clothier, did I get that correct, ma'am? Yes. Great. Vice President, American Board of Medical Specialties, State Health and Public Affairs, will be providing the licensing committee with a presentation on the ABMS maintenance and certification requirements today. Ms. Clothier joined the American Board of Medical Specialties in March 2011 as Vice President for State Health Policy and Public Affairs, and has over 20 years of communications, strategic planning, and health policy experience, including a 15-year <coughs> tenure with the Federation of State Medical Boards. If you'd like to proceed, we're looking very much forward to your report. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you um, this afternoon. I have spent a lot of time working with licensing boards around the country, and I have a deep appreciation for the work that you do. It's really difficult, and you, um, the work that you do on behalf of the public is really very important, and so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to spend some time this morning, or this afternoon, excuse me, um, going over quickly uh, who ABMS is in an or as an organization and the work that our certifying boards do to ensure that physicians are, who are certified um, have the appropriate qualifications to represent themselves as specialists in their area of expertise. I'm going to talk a little bit about some updated standards that our board of directors adopted earlier this year that create the framework for how the, uh, our member boards develop and implement their MOC programs. And then Kim has asked me to spend a little time talking about the way the certifying boards use disciplinary data that um, is provided by the Federation of State Medical Boards to ABMS on a daily basis to keep our boards informed of, of diplomates who have had significant actions taken against their license. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about a policy effort that ABMS is pursuing to um, seek alignment between maintenance of certification and other organizations who have reporting requirements in place that to hold physicians accountable for maintaining the competence and the practice of, of um, and care that they give to their patients. So let me start a little with an overview of who we are as an organization. ABMS was uh, formed in 1933 by what I call the House of Medicine because in effect it was certifying boards that had uh, been established at that point in time, plus organizations like the Federation of State Medical Boards, the American Medical Association, and some of those types of groups to uh, coordinate the activities of the certifying boards that were beginning to pop up. If you, it was at a point in time, if you'll re 
well, you wouldn't recall because none of you are this old. So, <laughs> but it's, it was at a point in time when there was increasing uh, public demand for accountability, uh, for competence, and for qualifications of physicians who were holding themselves out to be experts in particular areas of practice. And so, uh, so ABMS was formed to coordinate the activities of those certifying boards. We have evolved and changed through the years, added member boards, um, the structure of the organization has changed somewhat, but the mission for the most part has stayed the same. And so what you're looking at here is what our current mission is today. Um, this was actually just recently adopted a couple of months ago by our board of directors. And so our, char our charge as a 501c6 is to provide support services to the member boards in their efforts um, and work to certify that doctors have the appropriate expertise to hold themselves out as board, certi board certified um, specialists. Uh, we function in much the same way that the FSMB provides support to you. We you know, provide policy guidance, we do advocacy work uh, in Washington, D.C. on issues that are important to certifying boards. Um, we host educational activities and in fact we have an educational program for the first time this year uh, in September that we would certainly invite you to attend and it will be focused on assessment of competence and, um, and uh, different methodologies for what it takes to evaluate a physician across the competency areas that are deemed you know necessary to provide good care so at any rate that's so that's who we are as an organization there are 24 member boards within the ABMS umbrella. We refer to ourselves as a community of boards. We have a 35 member board of directors, um, six of whom are public members, which is just recently, within the last five years, uh, been a development, a new development, uh, because of the importance of bringing the public voice into the world of the certification boards. Our member boards are independent organizations, so they set their own policies, they have their own boards of directors, they make the decisions about how their certification programs are designed and implemented within the, within the parameters of broad guidelines that the community adopts, and I'll talk about that in a little more uh, detail in a minute. We, the boards collectively certify about 750,000 doctors within the U.S. and around the globe. Um, 65% of those now have time-limited certificates, and we're anticipating that number to increase to just under um, 100% in 2020. So that's an important sort of number to keep in mind. About 450 of the diplomates who are, are currently certified are participating in maintenance of certification. So again, an important number to keep in mind. We have data on the physicians in your state who are certified and participating in MOC, and we can provide that to Kim. I apologize for not having that this afternoon, but I will forward that to Kim so that you have that information. These are the actual boards, um, certifying boards themselves. The, collectively, the boards issue 37 primary care certificates and 123 subspecialty certificates. So this just gives you a sense of the scope of, of um, work that the board's community um, engages in. And just for your information, ophthalmology was the first board to be formed, and that was in like 1917, the most recent board to be formed and joined as an ABMS member board was medical genetics. We also have, in addition to the 24 boards, nine, we have relationships, formal relationships with nine organizations that um, have responsibility for overseeing the, what we refer to as the continuum of medical education training and licensure. So groups like the Federation of State Medical Boards, the um, Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, and so on. Those, we, those organizations refer to, are we, they're associate members of our organization and they participate in policy development. And they have you know, appointments to committees it's because it's important for us to make sure that decisions that are being made relative to certification are taking into consideration the potential impact or implications on other points along the continuum. So if there's a change that's happening in graduate medical education, for example, we need to understand how that's going to impact certification and vice versa. So those relationships are really important to us in making sure that we're um, upholding the public trust. Let me move now to a quick overview of how certification looks today. Um, for the physicians in the room, the, the, 
you'll appreciate that you know, while there hasn't been a lot of significant change relative to the requirements for initial certification, certainly there's been massive change in the uh, way in which boards, the expectations boards have of diplomates to maintain that certificate. So just very quickly, certification is a voluntary process. Um, you don't need a certificate in order to practice in this country. Um, I will say and acknowledge that increasingly certification is becoming a requirement for getting hospital privileges and, and so on, but it, but it is not mandatory, so it's not a mandated activity. The requirements for certification, if an individual coming out of residency training wants to apply uh, to uh, become certified, includes graduation from an MD or DO uh, school, a medical school with an MD or DO degree that's recognized by the certifying board, completion of um, a, a, an ACGME or equivalent training program in the full scope of the physician specialty. And that's a very important piece to keep in mind because you can in, on occasion encounter a physician who is certified in a particular area, but their actual training may have been in something different. And so they um, are basing certification on a work history. For ABMS, it's important, it's an important criteria that a physician be fully trained in the full scope of the, of the, um, re of the specialty that he or she's engaging in. So that's, just want to make sure that that point gets called out. And, and so in addition to the education and the training, then the physician has to um, successfully complete any of the assessments that the certifying board has in place. So mo all the boards require a multiple choice high stakes examination for entry into, the cert into certification. Many of the boards also require an oral exam, like surgical boards will require oral exams as well. Um, they in addition to those, then they also need to either be eligible for a full and unrestricted license or uh, have, actually have a full and unrestricted license. And in some cases, the boards, like the surgical boards, require the physician to have some years of practice, a couple of years of practice, because they want the physician to submit case logs so that they can review the case logs and see what kinds of cases they're actually um, uh, dealing with and making sure that they're providing an appropriate level of care, you know, necessary for, requisite for gaining certification. So that's initial certification. We are having some internal conversations looking at alternate pathways to um, becoming eligible for initial certification. This primarily has to do with recognizing that um, there, there is a whole cadre of very qualified physicians in practice in the United States coming from the international medical community that don't currently have an easy pathway into the certification process. And so that has, that's a, a conversation we're having internally and we're looking at different ways to accommodate that community of doctors because they should be recognized for the expertise of care that they're providing. So that's initial certification. And once a physician certified, they are, today they're automatically enrolled in what we're referring to as maintenance of certification. And maintenance of cer certification is a four-part program that um, I'm going to go through here in a second. But it basically sets the expectation of the diplomate that he or she has to be continuously participating in some type of activity that ensures that they are gaining the knowledge and uh, maintaining their knowledge and skills to uh, provide quality care to their patients in their area of specialization. Again, the physicians in the room will know that certification initially started off as a point in time assessment. You got a lifetime certificate and there was no requirement that you had to demonstrate that you were maintaining your competence in order to hold yourself out in, as an expert in, in a particular specialty. In about 1970, mid-70s, the boards particularly family medicine and internal medicine, started moving towards time-limited certificates. And by the late mid to late 80s, ABMS as a community had an official policy that only time-limited certificates could be issued. And it was, I think, sometime in late 90s, but mid to last board, last 
specialty board, ABMS member board, issu be, um, stopped issuing lifetime certificates and began to issue only time-limited certificates. So we have this bulk of doctors that have time, lifetime certificates, but today anyone who is certified by an ABMS member board gets a time-limited certificate and they are expected to participate in MOC. And MOC basically represents a commitment, a, a career-long commitment to participation in a continuous professional development program. The program itself is structured around the ABMS, uh, ACGME core competencies, and they're listed there. I'm not necessarily going to read them to you. There are four components to the program. Part one is focused on professionalism and professional standing, and the core of this today is that the physician needs to have a full and unrestricted license in at least one state. Um, the, that's also being not reconsidered, but I mean, I think there are conversations intern within our organization about ways to augment that particular requirement so that um, it's not just dependent on a license, but there, there may be some other like satisfactory peer review processes that get put in place. Part two is deals with lifelong learning and um, self-assessment. So that's really, and I'm going to go. Through, I'm going to. I have a slide that's specific to that, so I'm not going to comment on that right now. Part three is the examination. And the examination is a, currently is a multiple choice exam that's administered by the boards, most of the boards every ten years, and it is um, with covers the full scope of the area of, of um, medical specialty. The, again, I will be transparent in saying that the board's community is having some very serious discussions around this piece of the MOC program, in part because I think there's increasing um, interest in understanding how this can be more, how the exam process can be more effective in facilitating learning for doctors. So instead of, you know, so one of the questions, for example, is should it be a high-stakes exam administered every 10 years? Or should it be more of an informative approach that provides feedback to the physician and helps guide the physician's learning and professional development? And I'll give you an example of that. Um, anesthesia, for example, has a program called uh, the MOCA Minute, and it you know allows a physician on his or her schedule to get you know, to answer a series of questions, one or a series of questions that they get immediate feedback on. So it's it's integrated into the physician's daily practice as opposed to being a you know ten a milestone that the physician has to meet every ten years. So you know again I, I think in the next five to years or so that you'll be seeing some pretty significant changes in the way the boards perceive and administer their um, recertification examination. And I'm just talking about that piece of it. I'm not talking about the exam for entry into certification. That will continue to be a high stakes exam. But once you're in the system, what's the best way to help facilitate the physician's maintenance of competence? And then part four is focuses on performance improvement and improving care of patients in, um, in the day-to-day -day practice of the physician, the physicians engaging in. For part one, uh, this should say part two, I apologize for that. For part two, MOC part two requirements, you'll see that most of the boards require an average of 25 hours of CME per year um, that the diplomate has to pr uh, obtain. The CME needs to be relevant to the physician's scope of practice. Um, at least eight of those hours need to be uh, informed by some sort of objective external source, data source, whether it's data coming out of a registry, could be a chart review, could be a patient or peer satisfaction survey, something along that line, but, but it has to be some sort of external data source that informs, helps inform the physician's choice around their CME um, activity. And increasingly, the boards are incorporating patient safety modules into this component of the MOC program. For part four, the practice improvement, and this is really quite new um, and just since the implementation of MOC. The, for part four, diplomates are expected to participate in a performance improvement activity every two to four years, and it has to include an initial assessment of some aspect of their practice or, or um, care setting, an improvement activity that focuses on improving that particular aspect and then a reassessment to see if there's been improvement in that particular type of care. Um, I have some examples of types of activities that physicians could participate in to meet this particular requirement. One of the things we are working with in large, with larger institutions around the country like Mayo and Cleveland Clinic, 
um, we're actually beginning to have some conversations with the VA system, is collaborating with them to, rec to uh, recognize the quality improvement projects that the specialist is participating in within the context of that institution's um, operations so that, you know, from, from our vantage point, that, that's, that's a win-win situation both for the doctor as well as the institution because it's very practice-relevant activity um, to, relevant to what the physician's doing for that institution, the care they're providing to their patients. And it helps, you know, ensure this, the, med the um, certifying board that the physician is participating in a, a robust way in a structured quality improvement activity. So you know, it, it, um, we're reaching out over time to institutions around the country to try to enter into those kinds of collaborative relationships. As I noted, in um, January, our board adopted a new set of patient of standards that create the framework for how the boards evolve their and enhance their MOC programs. It was a very robust process of outreach to organizations around the country and to diplomates. Um, and it included a uh, lengthy public comment period. The standards are in your packets in front of you. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but uh, we like to think of them as being patient-centric and physician-sensitive. Uh, you'll see as you, as you review them that they are that they attempt to deal with a lot of the pushback that we've gotten from the boards have gotten from diplomates who are uh, feeling just com really completely overwhelmed, frankly, by a lot of the requirements that are being placed on them, not just by certifying boards, but by many organizations. And so um, the standards, it, you'll, you'll see a lot of language and reference in the standards to inc including incorporating diplomate feedback in the processes that the boards are using to evolve and, and enhance their MOC programs. There's a strong, um, a lot of language with regard to um, physician in, in, in involving the public in the way that the boards are developing their programs. So it's, you know, we're real excited about the opportunities that these standards offer. It encourages innovation and flexibility in, for example, how the exam uh, for part three gets developed. Let me um, skip forward here. Two components of the standards that I do want to call to your attention, I think, are of interest specifically to state licensing boards. It has to do with the way that the boards, our certifying boards, respond to day information that they get about a physician whose license has been either suspended or revoked by a state licensing board. Um, there's also some language in the standards that pertain to reentry programs and the requirement for certifying boards to have formal reentry processes for physicians who have stepped away from clinical practice for a period of time, either voluntarily or because they are required to by um, the licensing board. But that the recognition that you know the boards need to have our boards need to have a formal process in place that allows a physician to petition to be reinstated into the certification process. Let me just let me start with the certifying boards and how they deal with disciplinary actions. So our boards receive information about sanctions taken against a physician's license from a variety of sources, whether it's FSMB, directly from state licensing boards. Um, it can be from the diplomate themselves if they're you know reporting to the board that they have been sanctioned. In in situations where a certifying boards receives that kind of information, they'll look at the initial report and make some judgment about whether the sanction was appears to have been based on some significant or egregious behavior, particularly if it's a revocation or suspension. And when they make that judgment, if that it is, it does, it was for some egregious behavior, they then will go about gathering a, the information from the licensing board directly or from FSMB, and they'll put a case file together, they'll take it to the committee within this certifying board, and the committee makes some judgment about whether an action should be taken against the physician's certificate. There's a letter of inquiry also, inquiry, excuse me, also sent to the um, diplomate as well, and each of the boards has an appeals process. So, I mean, it is, it is not, I mean, I think the perception from 
the many years I was at FSMB and in conversations that I've had with some state medical boards, the perception is that when a certifying board get, becomes aware of any action that a physician has had against his or her license, that that automatically results in an action against the certificate. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, the boards increasingly are recognizing that um, their decisions to take action on a certificate has significant ramifications on the physician and their ability to work, their, you know, just their livelihood. And so it's becoming, they're increasingly very, becoming quite thoughtful about this process and doing the due diligence to make sure that the physician, um, that, the, that the sanction that the licensing board applied to the physician is worthy of and, you know, relevant to some, to professional, the professional standing that the physician has um, and that the certificate represents to the public. So we can come back to that and I'm happy to answer any questions about that at the end of the presentation. Most of the boards do have some process for re-entry for, in re -entry for physicians who have lost their certificates or had their certificates suspended, again, whether that was for voluntary purposes or um, b due to action of a, a state licensing board or action of a, of a certifying board. I, the standards call for all the boards to have a re-entry process. Um, I think we'll have to wait and see how that evolves over the next 12 to 16 months, but based on survey work that we've done with our member boards, those So we're, you know, we're excited. We're also in conversations with the physicians' health programs uh, around the country to understand how physicians who are participating in PHP programs, um, what that, what that pro appropriate processes that need to put in be put in place to make sure that when a physician has completed the order, or fulfilled the order that the board has in place for him or her relative to their participation in a PHP program you know, how best to bring that physician back into the certification process. So those, we're having that kind of conversation with the physician health programs around the country as well. Let me spend the last few minutes just talking about this, a strategic priority we've been working on in the last couple of years to align MOC with other organizations' accountability requirements. Um, so, our board has directed staff to look for opportunities to integrate MOC into the practice environment. I've talked with you a little bit about some of that work that we've been pursuing in the last couple of years. But one of the things we have also been talking with other state medical boards about and with other organizations like the Joint Commission and um, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services is the, is the opportunity to recognize MOC as a quality indicator and a robust a continuous professional development program that would meet their requirements, or in this case, your requirements, for continuing, um, not, I don't want to say continuing competence, but in your case, continuing medical education requirements for license renewal. Whoops, wrong way, sorry. So we believe that this policy would, has benefits both to the doctor as well as to the licensing board. It certainly would help reduce the administrative burden on the physician because they're able to use work that they're doing through the MOC program to meet multiple reporting requirements for organizations such as yours or hospitals that also have similar kinds of requirements, um, competence requirements for the to maintain uh, either their license or their admitting privileges at the hospital. It also has the potential to help you as a medical board streamline some of your auditing processes and reduce um, your, the resources you need to um, carry out effective uh, compliance audits when for purposes of um, ensuring physicians are upholding their CME requirements. Today, eight medical boards around the country accept MOC for purposes of CME license renewal, or CME requirements for license renewal. We're having conversations, and that's indicated by the red, um, the color red, the states are in red. We're having conversations like, like this with about, I don't know, a dozen states, and that's indicated by the um, gold color. And 
then and also over time we'll be having further conversations with the remainder of states in the country about the possibility of recognizing MOC as one pathway to meeting CME requirements. So I'll close by just saying I think that the, Calif the Medical Board of California has an opportunity to provide diplomates, licensees within your state, the opportunity to have another option for demonstrating that they're complying with your requirement for continuing medical education for purposes of license renewal and, and um, for engaging in continuous professional development activities. And, we, and, you, and you can do that through updating, in, in conversations we've had with staff, potentially updating some of your existing regulations. So you currently recognize passage of a certification or recertification examination and give credit for that for purposes of, of um, your CME requirement. To, given the changes in the way certification is carried out, you may want to consider updating your regulation to reference MOC as opposed to passing of the examination. There's also, I think, the opportunity to look at accepting from each of the certifying boards, you know, a, a, a documentation that would verify that the physician is in compliance with their MOC program and meeting all of the milestones and markers that the board has in place to ensure that the physician is, you know, appropriately and adequately uh, maintaining their competence as a specialist in their area of practice. So I'll stop there. I think I'm just at about 27 minutes, which is two minutes over what I was told to do. So um, let me stop there and I'm happy to entertain any questions or expand on anything that you might like me to expand on. Excellent. And on behalf of myself and the rest of the members of the committee, thank you so much for a very informative talk today. And staying on time is really remarkable. There should be some reward for you for that <laughs> as well. It kept me entertained the entire time. Uh, excellent. Um, so if you'll please keep your seat, because I'm sure, sure there are going to be some people who will be very interested in asking a few questions. Uh, do any committee members uh, have any comments or questions with respect? Dr. Lewis. Ms. Clothier, thank you very much. I, I um, have been looking at this topic for quite a number of years. Being a, myself, being a, a grandfather physician, not a grandfather, but internal <laughs> medicine. I like the term time unlimited. It sounds a little bit uh, more youthful <laughs> than grandfathered. Um, and I think we, we all agree we share the same core, um, core values and, and precepts, you know, the primacy of patient welfare and, and along with maintenance of professional excellence. I think those things are important, patient safety and um, professional competence. I think so we all agree on that. But I'm, I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite convinced what's the best way to achieve that. And, um, you know, and, and I've been trying to research and find data that says if you um, are recertified, um, does that make you a better physician? What are the outcomes that it? Does that really show that a physician is better, patients are treated better, there's, there's less adverse outcomes? I can't find it anywhere, and, and I keep searching for that. So that's my, my one, you know, my one sort of, it's, it's not convincing me yet that doing this is going to make better outcomes. So I, maybe you could enlighten me on that. And um, so, and then my second question is, there seems to be a higher failure rate now with the recertification, I can tell internal medicine, I can only speak for internal medicine, and I'm wondering why, I mean, it used to be maybe 10% would uh, fail the first round, and now it's up in the 20s, so I'm wondering why is that? I mean, so if you could help me with those two issues briefly that I would appreciate that and we can continue later because I think there's a lot of stakeholders in here right. a lot of other groups you know Americas physicians and state medical um, associations that would like to weigh in on this so I'll let me take your you. second question first and I'll just tell you I don't know the answer to that um, I, I am aware of I'm I am aware that that is the case with regard to the ABIM recertification okay. examination I can't tell you why that is the case and and frankly I'm not sure that ABIM is necessarily shared with others for example with ABMS why that's the case I will go back and inquire and see if I can get an answer for you and um, forward that to Kim if we have one I, I don't know that we do but I, I will see what I can learn about that 
With regard to your first question, you know, that is one of the biggest um, points of contention, I guess, heard from diplomats, not just time and limited certificate holders, but, you know, just di diplomats generally. And I from our vantage point, it, it, MOC hasn't really, it's a really young program, frankly. I mean, all the boards, it's only been since 2006 that the boards have really had their programs up and running. So you're looking at something less than 10 years that these practices have been in place. What we're, what we're seeing is that, first of all, we acknowledge that we need to do a, we need to really sort of like a laser hone in on doing the kinds of studies to develop the hard evidence that physicians want to see. But what we're also seeing is that increasingly organizations are recognizing MOC and the components of MOC as a lever for engaging physicians in professional, in, in activities around quality improvement and patient safety. Um, and that that, it, that that potentially holds as much value. So Cleveland Clinic has um, a, a wonderful presentation about the quality improvement work that they're doing within their organizations and the way they've integrated MOC Part 4 activity um, requirements into those sorts of projects. And so while it's not the kind of, you know, double-blind trial research that physicians are accustomed to seeing, it is evidence to show that MOC is contributing to um, improving care within the context of a organization's uh, setting. So, I mean, there's a lot of literature around adult learning and the importance of having objective feedback on, uh, and data to inform how physicians choose CME activities to make sure that they're being, they're appropriate and um, addressing issues that are of care that the physician may or may not be aware of. So, I mean, there is that kind of literature available too, but specific to how MOC changes behaviors and how MOC impacts outcomes, mm. we don't, there is some, some emerging data, we don't have a lot of it. And so I appreciate your um, comments and can say to you that the boards take that T charge very seriously. We have on our website, you may or may not be familiar with this, but we have what we call an evidence library. And there, there are, there's a ton of research there. Um, but again, it's not exactly specific to your question. Right, right. Yeah, I've looked and it's not. But thank you for that response. I appreciate it very much. Any other board members have comments? I had one comment. Um, recently, one of my orthopedic colleagues, I work at a university, and he's a hand specialist. And so the last time he looked at a knee was 15 years ago. Uh, and he recently had to do his recertification mm -hmm. and found that quite, a, quite an adventure. Is that, are there any conversations with respect to that? As medicine becomes more and more and more subspecialized, has there been any discussions about how to address recertification for those super subspecialists? Almost every day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, I think the challenge that we face is that it's, it, it's from the, so you've got two different audiences, really. You've got the physician audience, and then you've got the public. And when a physician holds himself out as a specialist in orthopedic surgery, the public assumes that he's a specialist across the broad scope. Absolutely. Of, care provided by an orthopedic surgeon, not just that the person is a specialist in hand surgery. So from the public's vantage point, if they're looking at the credential and what it represents, you know, that's, that's part of what we need really to figure out is how, is there a different way of representing a physician's area of specialty so that the public is informed and has the full knowledge of what the physician is ex an expert in. But we get a lot of pushback. I mean, we get, we get feedback on both sides of that equation. Physicians who find it very useful to have to go back and do a refresher course on the full scope of the specialty, even though they are you know, focused on just one thing within that, the context of that specialty. So it's not an easy, it's not an easy answer. I wish it was. But it's, um, it is, a, yes, the answer, short answer to your question is yes. We are having those conversations. And I think um, the, the jury's still out as to where we're going to land on that. I think it's very relevant to the licensing committee goals here because 
currently California does not license to a specialty. You are a physician and you can do the full scope of medical practice according to the license. And so there have been a random statements from time to time by people, well, should we license to a specialty? And if so, how? So I think, I think we're very important stakeholders. So please keep us advised of, of where you are because I think it's very important for us. Absolutely. Please to do that. Okay. Are there any comments from members of the public present? We have no one in queue. No one in queue. Um, yeah. Okay. For, if, if the public wonders what's happening, we cannot have a, a, a quorum of board members here. It would be uh, violating the, the Open Meeting Act, so we're getting rid of one of our board members. <laughs> <laughs> Temporarily. We can't have a quorum and have a board member speak, but a, oh. a quorum can be as observers. So we've corrected the issue so Dr. Levine can talk. So Sharon Levine, President of the Medical Board of California, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, as, a, as a licensing and um, enforcement board, um, we have, you know, we're very supportive of lifelong learning and continuing professional development. A couple of concerns have been raised about catch-22s created mm -hmm. by the move to the milestone, mm -hmm. the, the rigidity, if you will, of the milestone approach. So as an example, we will often see a petition for early termination of probation because the licensee is unable to continue on in the pathway. They lose eligibility for participation in maintenance of certification activities by, because they don't have a full and unrestricted license. So they are caught in a catch-22 on probation, involved in efforts to improve their practice, but prohibited from participating in a decade-long process of maintaining competence in their profession, and they fall out of the cycle. And currently, for example, the American Board of Internal Medicine does not have a very good process. Mm -hmm. And so two problems created by this. One, the very individuals you are eager to have continue on in maintenance of certification and, and professional development are prohibited by their board from participating. And um, so they lose, they lose that, and um, they, the, you know, the consequence for them is then they do everything they can to terminate probation. Not exactly the best reason mm -hmm. for terminating mm -hmm. probation early. Um, and so it, and it, so it seems to me, this is my personal opinion now, that while <coughs> their, their board certification status may be changed until they have suspended or put on hold until they have completed probation. Prohibition of participation in maintenance of certification that makes them eligible for board certification seems to me contrary to the desires and, and intent of this. Um, so that's one, I, I think, one issue that we we hear. And then the other issue, which is not your issue, but I think f for issue for us as a state, what do we do about physicians who have never been board certified right. Um, or whose board certification was, you know, is um, time unlimited, if you will, um, and you know how how do we ensure that we have an entire practice community moving uh, or con involved in continuing professional development? But I do think that the issue for the boards is, um, on the one hand, you want that certificate to mean something. On the other hand. Um, you're creating problems by barring entrance to it. The other issue it creates for us is that a physician who is, whose participation in the milestone work will be reflected on the board's website as not meeting the criteria for board certification. Right. That physician has all their materials in their practice declaring them as board certified in a specialty. If they're pulled out of that queue, they're essentially violating the law because they are falsely advertising their certification status. And so uh, we, we have to resolve the issues around where, where you're, the intent of the boards is actually in conflict with the rules that have been established um, to ensure continuing professional development of the practice community. 
I'll, I'll comment on your first observation um, relative to access to tools and resources that the boards make available through two physicians. When I started working for ABMS, there was very little to allow non-board certified physicians access to MOC resources. Um, that's changed a lot in the last five years. I mean, there hasn't been any active policy that's been adopted, but, but the willingness, at least theoretically, on the part of our board's community is that needle's changing and I, is moving. And so I think the potential for that to happen is within the next several years is, is great. I mean, it's not today. Today, I'm sh I can tell you that the board's don't do that, but I think that they increase, at least a good percentage of the boards are increasingly recognizing the importance of being able to offer pathways to physicians who had been actively certified and for whatever reason have stepped away, you know, stepped out of that, whether for disciplinary reasons or voluntarily, to continue to engage in some aspects of their MOC programs so that they can more easily re-enter into the certification system when that point in time is right, whether they're, you know, ready to come back to work or they're because they've raised children or they've been in military service for some period of time and haven't been able to participate in MOC program activities, those kinds of things. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know if that's in part an answer to the, your first observation about some of the challenges that we have as an organization and the community of boards to figure out how to adapt to some of the changes that physicians are facing in their practices. I just think it, you have to understand that in the, con in the context of the pushback you're getting. Oh, I appreciate. I mean, it's not small. I understand that, <laughs> um, yes. It's creating enormous frustration um, from people who want to do the right thing. We, Thank you for that, and thank you for reinforcing that. I mean, it's very clear from our, our, much like the conversation about the certificate and whether you know you should focus in on just a part of the specialty versus the broad specialty for purposes of the examination. This conversation is happening as well, almost daily, within our board's community. They're highly sensitive to it. Thank you. Well, I think this certainly is not going to be the end of the conversation, and we certainly hope you take some of these comments back, and we would appreciate you continuing to give us feedback so we can be active uh, part of the solution. Absolutely. Was there another comment that, uh, all right, we have one more comment from the audience. Give us just a moment to become legal. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dave Gandhi, Dave board member, but I had to go out. Uh, I'm actually, it's not just my personal issue, but also many people in the academics have this mm -hmm. issue. Uh, for 20 years, I was triple boarded. I finally gave up one because every 10 years, each board exam comes. So that means every three years, I'm taking a board exam. It takes time, it takes money. So why, if we are so now, I'm board certified in vascular surgery and general surgery, I gave up the critical care three, three four years ago because it was certified long enough. So my question is, if we're going through MOC, this, your uh, other part, three parts of MOC, why do we need part three, where every 10 years you have to go through an exam, which doesn't make sense to me when I look at it, what we want people to do is continuously educated, lifelong commitment, continuously learn, and actually not only when they take CME, but also take a post test. We are all doing, we're going that route, but so are, is the ABMS or any of the boards considering eliminating part three of that MOC? Actually, there, those com I keep saying those conversations are underway, and I appreciate that that sounds like a pet answer, but it's true. I mean, we are, um, most recently had a meeting with the representatives from the AMA and some of their stakeholders uh, in June to look at different innovations within how knowledge and judgment is, are both assessed beyond just a high stakes multiple choice question examination. Um, and at least the feedback we got from some of the AMA folks was that they were quite impressed at some of the ideas that the, our boards are beginning to toy with in, to uh, 
if not replace, then make the examination process more um, relevant and uh, less burdensome, less onerous to the applicant, I mean to the physician, uh, looking at moving, as I said, moving away from, for, and I'll give you a tangible example. The American Board of Family Medicine is uh, it, very interested in how outcomes data, data from the physician's clinical practice and care that they're giving to their patients could be used to replace um, an evaluation of the physician's medical knowledge on an, on an every 10-year basis so that if the physician is willing to participate you know, in whatever this looks like, this database, it could be a reg something similar to a registry that shows that the physician is providing is, you know, exceeding clinical benchmarks in particular areas that they would be exempt from having to take the examination. So, I mean, the boards are starting to look at those sorts of projects and, and um, innovations as, as a way of supplanting the, or at least um, giving options to the physicians so that they aren't expected to just have to take the um, MOC, MCQ exam every 10 years. I don't know if that helps at all, but there are those, those kind of innovative um, conversations taking place. I mean, the bottom line is multiple choice questions or exams are, that is one area where we have lots of data about the correlation between good performance and good care. And so it's hard to give that up because you can do those for relatively inexpensive compared to some of the other assessment processes that can be quite expensive, like simulation and so on. So it's, but I, I though they are, they are considering in a, innovative ways to get away from the high stakes examination. From the, from the physician perspective, I can give you, I'm sitting here anyway, it's easier than sitting there, uh, is that there is a pr prevailing we information. Still be mindful of, of yes, time restrictions. Yes, uh, is that, uh, the boards, if they stop giving these exams, their budget will be cut so much that they might not, uh, they, they might not be able to support each board. Is that accurate? Remember well, that each, each recertification exam costs significant, several thousand dollars each time I take an exam. Right. Not only exam fee, the course, right. and, and uh, the travel, and all kind of stuff. So if, is that accurate that the boards can have some serious financial problems if that recertification exams are eliminated? It would be an accurate statement to say that they would have to really figure out what the business model would be if they did away with their 10-year um, every 10 year multiple choice exam question. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, we have time for one last question from a member of the audience or from the telephone line. Anyone else uh, wish to make a comment or question? There are no questions from the phone lines. Well, then again, thank you so much for your time, and I hope you don't have too many bruises. Yeah, no. We certainly appreciate you being here with us. It's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Well, I know that Mr. Warden is, and Ms. Webb are eager, eager to, to give a presentation to us today. So moving on to uh, agenda item five. Uh, presentation on the minimum number of years of approved postgraduate graduate training required for licensure and the licensure exemption while participation participation in an ACGME approved training program in California. So um, what I'm doing this presentation on is to, for us to consider increasing the amount of minimum requirements for postgraduate training. Um, currently, uh, uh, the, we have two types of postgraduate training that we recognize for licensure in California by the Medical Board, and that's the Accreditation Council for um, Graduate Medical Education and uh, also known as ACGME, which are only for the programs completed in the United States and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada for the programs that are only completed in Canada. Um, the current minimum requirements for training for a U.S. 
um, and Canadian medical school graduate is just one year of successful completion of either their training programs and for an international medical school graduate it's two years of either the ACGME or RCPSC accredited. The um, current, um, California's current license for residents for U.S. and Canadian graduates is a maximum of two years that they can train without a license. They, um, uh, and then for an international medical school graduate, it's uh, a maximum of three years. The minimum number of years to obtain licensure in uh, California if, if, um, for uh, um, postgraduate training for uh, U.S. and Canadian graduate is one year, and for an international graduate was two. And then for um, the number of years to complete an accredited ACGME or RCPSC accredited residency program is that the minimum number is three, for example, like internal medicine, general, or family medicine, and up to seven years for neurosurgery. Um, there are some transitional one-year programs which are basically used for residents who need some clinical experience before they go into a specialty training program. Um, it is the, one of the questions is, is one or two years of ACGME or RCPS training enough for a physician to obtain licensure and practice ma medicine safely without supervision? Um, I suggest that it's possibly not and that the practice of medicine um, and medical education is very different today than in 1980 when our current statutes of business and profession code 2065 and 2066 became law. Um, here you'll see a sort of uh, what is the minimum number of years uh, for residency training required by other states and you'll see it varies from one, two to three and for one state it's a full program for the U.S. and Canadian graduates. Uh, for IMGs it's the one, two, three years and also a um, full program for one state and then there is one state that's just 30 months for both um, uh, IMGs and U.S. Canadian graduates. There are a few states that will accept other tr accredited tr um, training or postgraduate training that's not ACGME accredited. Um, the Federation of State Medical Board recommends a minimum of three years of residency training to obtain licensure, um, uh, either uh, ACGME or AOA accredited um, graduate medical education. Uh, the AOA accredited graduate medical education is, uh, was for, is for um, uh, DO graduates. Uh, the FSMB's proposal for interstate license compact states that successful com successfully completed graduate medical education approved by the um, uh, graduate medical education and it should be three years. So uh, that's their standard for the the proposed compact. Um, how many years of HCGME or RCP training should the board consider requiring to be eligible for licensure in California? Uh, the board uh, should consider increasing it from uh, one of two options um, for the U.S. Canadians graduates is for either to go up to two years for both U.S. and Canadian graduates and, and for IMGs or up to three years for U.S. and Canadian graduates and IMGs, which is the international medical graduates. So, um, two years or three years, and uh, basically we, by going to two years for U.S. Canadian, you're adding one year. If you go to three, you're adding two. For an international medical graduate, if you go to two, it's, it's the same, and if you add three, it's one more year. Um, if you just add um, one year uh, to the U.S. and Canadian graduates to make it a two, you're still not meeting the minimum, even the minimum number of years to complete a program uh, for even the internal medicine, family medicine, which is that the minimum programs are three years um, at this time, and it does not meet the minimum requirements that is recommended by FSMB. Um, it really doesn't seem reasonable to only add one year for U.S. and Canadian graduates. Uh, so that's 
sort of where we're at with that. Once again, sort of talks about the t two years and th um, and versus the three years. If we go to three years, um, it would meet the minimum requirements to complete uh, a at least a ACGME or RCPS program. Um, it would meet the minimum recommendations by FSMB and meet the um, FSMB Interstate Medical License Compact proposal and increases consumer protection. Identified issues uh, to consider is um, will the board still need to have a medical school recognition process? Um, what type of licensure exemption is needed? Is a training license for all residents necessary? How and when will residents apply for a training license? How and when will residents apply for a full license? Um, how will the change affect the California's current ACGME programs? How will the change affect residents? The need for residents to have a uh, DEA registration um, and how and when will re residents qualify for DEA registrations? The need to write prescriptions without a cosigner. What is needed to make a decision? We need. Um, Um, is we need to get input from the ACGM, California ACGME programs, input from residents, input from physician associations and organizations. We should hold interested parties meetings. We need to identify all the statutes and regulations that would change or could be affected by the proposed changes and draft proposed uh, language for statutes and our regulations and possibly identify if we choose to go down that pathway and author to draft those statutes. Uh, here is just a quick list of uh, minimum requirements by each state. Uh, and, and that sort of concludes my, my um, presentation. I believe that the board should be considering going to three years of mi minimum postgraduate training for licensure. And um, I would like to request the committee to authorize licensing staff to proceed with uh, investigating and holding the interested parties meetings for this concept. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Now, we're certainly going to entertain comments from board members, the public, and people on the phone. I just want to be, have people be mindful that we're running very short of time here, and we are planning on having, I believe we will pass something today with respect to interest party, parties meetings, so there will be ample opportunity for all to, to have input uh, in the process we anticipate will be uh, much more robust than this today, but uh, nevertheless, that being said, um, are there any short, hopefully, comments um, f from board members? Really short comment. Uh, most of our licensees come in uh, for how many year of uh, postgraduate training? Do you see more of a three year, or is it one year, or what, do we get a get a sense? Um, currently, we're licensing most of our residents after their shortly after their one year and yeah. two year graduates because that's what the programs are, Allow. are allowed to do and that's what they're pushing to do. Uh, it gives them uh, more opportunity to use their residence and uh, uh, in, in, you know they can write their own prescriptions right. without co-signers and uh, they can sign death certificates and they can do those kind of things. Any other board members? Any members of the public present want to make a comment or question? Anybody on the phone? or no comments from the phone line. Thank you. Well, as stated, uh, I would like a motion to have staff proceed with an interested parties meeting and subsequent meetings to obtain input regarding the impact of extending the minimum requirements of the postgraduate training for licensure in California. Do I have a motion? You have your motion. And do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any public uh, comment of members present? Yes. Please. Sharon Levine, Medical Board President. Just is the motion to uh, in uh, um, agnostic as to the number of years of extension, or are you being specifically um, suggesting three years? I believe my interpretation is that we're just the impact of extending the minimum requirements with no specific time uh, specified at this point. 
I would think that would become more clear with the with the discussions. There's a lot of serious impl implications. I'm sure that's what you're, in, uh, you're talking about. So at the present time, there would not be a specific time uh, specified. Any members uh, on the phone? No comments from the phone line. Very good then. Uh, May we have a vote? All those in favor of the motion uh, to have the staff proceed with an interested parties meeting and meetings to obtain input regarding the ex impact of extending the minimum requirements of postgraduate training in California for licensure. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Very good. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Very good, we're moving on then to agenda item six, which is future agenda items. Do any committee members have agenda items uh, they'd like to put on the agenda for the next committee meeting? I assume this will be on the next, this topic will be on the next agenda? I would presume so, at least an update on where we stand with the, from the staff. Right. With respect to that, yes. yes so okay. follow up on this, on this agenda item, Should absolutely. Be, yes. Absolutely, thank you for that comment. Yep. Any uh, members of the public have recommendations for uh, future agenda items? Anybody on the phone? There are no comments from the phone lines. Great. Well, if there is no uh, further business to discuss, uh, this meeting is adjourned. And let me thank everyone present for making my first meeting interesting and enjoyable as, as a new uh, 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 what am I, anyway? Chair. Chair of the License Committee. Chair. Thank you. I wasn't even sure what I was, but thank you. Thank you to the Education and Wellness Committee. I'm Barbara Yaroslavsky, Chair of this committee. I'd like to remind you to please to turn off your cell phones and uh, turn your Blackberries to silent. Make sure they're off the table so we don't have any feedback for the sound system. Mm -hmm. You may notice committee members accessing their laptops during the meeting. They're used uh, solely for the committee meeting materials and they are electronic, some of them are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California and as such I expect everyone to uh, hold accord to their behavior in this room, please. This meeting will be available via teleconference as well, and individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconference process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before making your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, please uh, Number one, you will hear a tone indicating that you are in the queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not want to make a comment, press the number key. Assistance is available throughout the conference. To request assistance, press zero. The committee uh, welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the committee's intent to ask for public comment prior to the committee taking action on any agenda. For some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand or identify yourself on the phone and you will be recognized. I would like to remind all speakers physically present to complete a presenter's slip uh, there in the back of the room and that way I will be able to call you by name appropriately, hopefully pronouncing your name correctly. And that also gives us a record of who is uh, making public comments. Please give your speaker slips to Ms. Hawkinson. Ms. Hawkinson, would you put your hand in the air, everyone that's the person you should give your slip to. And uh, for those on the phone, please provide your name and your organization uh, that you might represent. Each person will be limited three minutes per agenda item. However, during the agenda item number three, public comments on this item not on the agenda, the committee has limited the public comment period for the meeting of up to 20 minutes. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for comments from individuals on the teleconference line and for those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Uh, Vang, you, you're gonna moderate this for me. Thank you very much. I wanna remind all speakers to please stay on topic and to hear the time limits. Uh, there's a three minute time limit for people present. And Ms. Hawkinson, would you please call the roll? Yes, Ms. Palmer.
in the audience may i have a motion to accept the minutes please I move. second second all those in favor aye any opposed or abstain no thank you very much we're going to move on to number four and a presentation on healthy living programs and first up is loma linda university wellness campaign barbara i'm going to just suggest it's hernandez because i'm going to mess up the middle name so i apologize <laughs> Uh, Director of the Physician Vitality Program. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome you, and I, I, I apologize, it's spelled out for me, it's Cowden, right? There you go. Uh, Dr. Hernandez is from Loma Linda University, where she is the Director of Phys Physician Vitality. She will be given a pre giving the presentation on Loma Linda's wellness campaign. Dr. Hernandez formerly served as the Director of Doctoral Clinical Training at the School of Behavioral Health and coordinator of the Medical Family Therapy Program at Loma Linda University. She holds a master's degree in marriage and family therapy from Loma Linda and a PhD in family and social science from the University of Minnesota. Thank you very much for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to talk about our programs at Loma Linda. Um, I want to say that um, when we talk about health, we're really talking about a lot of the emotional health and the uh, psychosocial health of our physicians. So this, what I'm talking about today, it pertains strictly to our physician population. As some of you might know, we are a faith-based uh, organization and we have a lot of emphasis on uh, health. And so we are one of the blue zones in the country. We have people who are very conscious of their health and living long and very healthy lives. So in the context of that, we thought what would be a good, good way to help our physicians since it's pretty common knowledge uh, on our campus how to stay healthy and how to live long, et cetera. Um, what we know from social psychologists is that um, when individuals are unhappy, unsatisfied with work, have unsatisfactory relationships, their work relationships fail. Uh, as well, and so there's a very strong correlation between the two. Um, so let me start by saying what I am not, and that might help define. So I am not an employee assistance program for physicians. I am not part of the well-being committee for our impaired physicians. I'm not part of the professional committee, professionalism committee, which is a punitive, has a punitive function. I'm not a behavioral health educator for our family medicine. Um, I'm not part of physician relations. I'm not part of the campus uh, health program. So we have all of those things that are functioning well. So I was hired three years ago and asked to please create some kind of uh, prevention programs to enhance physician satisfaction, phys enhance physician general well-being, and, um, and to address the wholeness. We have whole person care, which is a major uh, thrust of all of our programs on our health campus. And so everyone is talking about whole person care and how to deliver biopsychosocial spiritual care for patients. However, physicians do not always feel that they themselves experience that because everyone's on the run and trying to keep up with patients. So I was invited to create a role that would have um, some, some ability to uh, be a preventive for some of the physicians. A question that framed my uh, approach to this job was, what actually makes a good physician? And how can I offer anything at all given my skill set? Because anyone else in this position would configure it a little bit differently than I have. Um, we quickly agreed that it would be really, really useful to change some of the culture of medicine um, because we have individuals who are working themselves to death, uh, not caring for their own emotional or physical health, um, and burnout, as we know, is a burgeoning problem in, the, in this country, so we tried to create something that would be of use. So I began to observe our, our physicians and understand what might be useful for them. I began by creating a needs assessment, and I surveyed uh, physicians across the career, students to interns, fellows, junior faculty, senior faculty, academic fellows. And uh, you can see on my slides here what the issues are for each, uh, each group. Students, of course, are overwhelmed. Uh, they're looking for free food. Uh, they want to be told that they're in the right field. Interns and residents uh, don't feel that they have a lot of control over their lives at this juncture. 
hungry, tired, want to be appreciated, and want some kind of reprieve from the stress. Our fellows um, are interested in how to become um, more developed professionally and refine their current skills, etc. Junior faculty are very tired, um, are trying to develop research agenda, uh, practice, figure out how to balance everything and to manage their practices. Senior faculty are um, trying to keep up with all the administrative tasks uh, and deal with litigation, etc. So my strategic plan in forming this goal was we start with basic support for the first couple years, figure out what works, what is responded to in a, in a positive manner, do what I can to change culture for the institution in terms of seeking care for self and making self-care a priority, um, educate the new generation by um, being involved in the medical school, and then hopefully to produce some um, objective outcome data. This is what my role has evolved into, and I'll just say very quickly, I won't go into every single thing on this slide, but this has been a lot in three years. Um, we have about five research agendas running right now, for example, doing a nationwide survey on physicians who are involved in abusive relationships themselves. Um, there's very little reliable uh, information about that uh, phenomenon. Do, I do a fair amount of education. I give a lot of grand rounds. Um, there are programs that we have that I'll discuss and then direct support, which involves uh, consultation and referrals and crisis management. To start with the education that we provide, um, I do believe that if physicians uh, have a, a strong competence base in psychosocial uh, behavioral competencies that does reduce anxiety from some of the very difficult patient uh, issues that are arising. Well, one of the things that I've done is I've worked with the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Care in, in Boston and we have this program on our campus. We partner with uh, residency programs uh, during their grand rounds so there's a large attendance for these, um, for these programs. Um, our evaluations are very high for these. The uh, students and the residents are really appreciative of these things and hearing their attendings talk in a very open manner about um, some of their concerns about the psychosocial issues of medicine. We have a medical humanities concentration. Some of you may know Dr. Phil Gold, who's a pulmonologist, has been uh, in our institution for many years, and he reads fiction with his fellows every, uh, every week uh, as a way to develop empathy, to try to um, get them to think outside the box a bit. We're offering uh, peer coach training for both of our residents and for our fellows. We also are offering this in the faculty. We now have a faculty peer coach training program. Um, because I'm an educator, grand rounds have been fairly straightforward and easy for me to put together. So I put together a lot of them about psychosocial issues and things uh, that come from my field such as suicide prevention, burnout prevention, resilience management, um, have, have family conferences in some of those difficult situations, et cetera. One of the programs that we developed uh, is an interdisciplinary program about teaching uh, individuals how to give bad news. We learn from our attending physicians who learn from theirs, et cetera, and we want to make sure that there is positive feedback about how to do this and what works and what doesn't work. I've pulled together a lot of uh, doctoral uh, family therapy interns to observe simulations in our simulation center of physicians giving bad news to uh, paid confederates. And then we process this in a very stylistic way. We are now collecting data on this and we've presented around the, uh, the world and the country about this approach. What I'm finding is that the, the residents are telling me that we love hearing what the therapists have to say about us. It really heightens our awareness. We also find that they are much less anxious to go into these situations to discuss bad news or other sensitive issues with families. One of the aspects of support has to do with residents and um, like I mentioned, the peer support training. Um, we are currently building structure around our peer support program for our faculty physicians. We have ongoing trainings for them on a quarterly basis, um, and that has been a very interesting program as well. 
I'm running support groups in family medicine for their interns. I'm running debriefings for various programs that undergo changes that um, have crises. I do get crisis calls about once a week for someone who had a patient die in the office or maybe it was a first patient death, et cetera. It can also be personal issues. And again, I've said I'm not an EAP person, but I am there and available 24-7 um, for those individuals that call and do need to process something. What I found is that as people realize that I'm not talking about what they tell me and it's not in the uh, electronic medical record, people are beginning to speak very freely and I'll often be stopped by the coffee pot and say, hey, I was wondering about this or I was wondering about that. What do you think about this or that, et cetera. It's, it's been a very casual kind of a on the ground um, consultation process. I also participate in palliative, palliative care rounds. Uh, we have a number of uh, programs such as our intensive care, our, our NICU uh, program, our fellowship program, all of these require some, some support which I, I take lots of people to lunch and I take groups of departments to lunch at a time. In terms of the outcomes for these programs, like I said, we have a lot of anecdotal uh, outcomes. It's hard to really put your hands around the kinds of things I'm doing and saying what difference does it really make and what outcomes do we have. But we do know it costs about $300,000 to replace a faculty physician. And we also know that if a physician commits suicide or has a psychotic break, that there is also a dollar amount with that, not to mention the untold emotional impact on patients, uh, colleagues, et cetera. And so we are looking constantly for objective data to be able to report the effectiveness of what some of these programs are. I do a lot of retreats and conferences uh, every year. Uh, this is actually the year when all of the departments are having their retreats. We go up to the mountains for a day, have a lot of meetings, breakout sessions, et cetera. Uh, you can see we have, uh, I took crayons up for our pediatricians and they, they drew what uh, burnout looks like here. You can see that. Uh, we have conferences for families. Um, we talk about how to enhance health of a relationship. And these kinds of things are, uh, are having a positive impact because um, I often get phone calls from spouses of our physicians saying, uh, my husband or my wife really needs to be evaluated. Would you please see them? And that's been a, a very helpful um, approach. Quite by accident, we found that our physicians are phenomenal artists and photographers and musicians. Um, and one of the offsets for burnout is creative endeavors of many different kinds. And so we now, in the entry of our hospital, have a physician art gallery that changes out. Um, you can see a portion of it there. We've also had um, a local art exhibit that was a benefit exhibit for, um, for the Children's Hospital. And the physicians were elated about this, as this uh, we know that um, altruistic endeavors also have a positive impact on burnout. In terms of the School of Medicine, I started to work in the School of Medicine as well because we want to change culture from the get-go. Uh, we'd like to be able to train our, our medical students that we actually want to be thinking about seeking help as an adult and a professional skill set, not as a sign of weakness. And so we have been working on changing the culture there. We have a lot of reflective activities in our medical school. Um, we have an orientation to religion and medicine course, which is a, a, about spirituality, and it's very high in We are bringing reflection into a lot of the assignments and the, the work that we do on the campus. We are trying to help the students stay mindful of the kinds of reasons why they went into medicine. So many physicians will say, I went into medicine because I was A, good in science, or B, I wanted to serve humanity in some way. And we know that burnout gets at its worst in the third year, and so we're actively taking steps to be able to connect the students back with their original goals and reasons for going into medicine during their third year. I do some medical, school, medical student coaching. Our students uh, bring you the typical kinds of issues that, that you would expect, time management, uh, trying to balance life, 
um, self-defeating attitudes, or maybe I really don't belong here if they were the first one to go into medicine, et cetera. Um, what, what we do is we try to teach them how to reach out for what it is that they need to give themselves a positive experience. There is a lecture that I give to all the senior medical students, and I think this is a pivotal and a very important lecture because uh, they get very wide-eyed when I go through all the statistics about all of these things, which are occupational hazards for not only medicine but a lot of professions. And at the end of this lecture, we build intentional programs into their experience so that they have an exercise program. They have some kind of a hobby lined up ready to go. They have some kind of plan so that they know who to talk to when they get burned out or to prevent burnout, et cetera. So we try to identify those things that they can do to actually uh, help themselves through medical school but also into the coming years. Many of our students actually go on to the employee assistance program and get some kind of uh, help for themselves as well. I would like to say that whenever I do coach our medical students, I find out that a number of them who are experiencing depression are not exercising. They're merely poring over their books, and so we try to get them hooked into an exercise program in our athletic center um, as quickly as possible. We have some electives that are high on reflection and that um, are based on learning communities. Um, these things focus on issues of self-management, uh, how to relate to patients in a, in a more holistic way, um, and emphasis on diversity. And again, we feel that to have a greater sense of um, interpersonal effectiveness would diminish anxiety and also have less uh, negative correlations with health because you know when you're stressed, your physical health would not be as good. In uh, the fall of uh, next year, we're going to roll out a student vitality track, which is a program that students can elect into. It'll be 72 hours of learning community on top of standard medical education. It'll be high in reflection and experiential learning. Um, it will be programmatically um, offered. And we do have a very large database um, prepared so that we should be able to have some kind of hard data on our outcomes for that. Really, the, one of the questions that we have is, you know, we hear about the, quote, hidden curriculum in medicine, and the hidden curriculum might be things about not taking care of ourselves as, as well as we should, or possibly putting patients first, uh, et cetera, a number of things. We're not really sure what exactly it is, but we hope to, by um, uh, explicitly addressing some of those issues, that we might be able to find out what yet remains that we're not addressing that could be helpful for physicians. So again, what we are really trying to do is to try to address emotional, physical, spiritual health of our physicians because when those things are more intact, um, physical health is often, as you know, uh, affected positively by positive mental health and satisfaction. So those are my remarks to you this morning and I'm certainly um, open for questions. I want to thank you very much, and I'm going to open it up to questions from first from the panel, and then we'll see Dr. Kraus. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, our board uh, restressed the importance of physician health at our last meeting, and the Federation of State Medical Boards has uh, stressed the importance of physician health. Physicians are sometimes fearful of divulging because of us. Of course. Uh, if I divulge that I have a substance abuse problem, if I divulge that I'm depressed, uh, will it be reported to the medical board? Uh, will my practice be restricted? And I tussle most every day on how to deal with that. So I have two questions. Sure. One is, we're eager to hear any recommendations you may have in terms of how the medical board should encourage physician health and yet deal with public safety. And two, in your own capacity, you must have an occasional circumstance where a physician will divulge to you something that may cause your concern about whether or not they should be actively treating patients while they're dealing with the problem that they have divulged to you. And how do you deal with that? And, and what mechanisms exist in your institution to deal with that? 
Yes, thank you. Those are great questions. Let me start with the latter, if I could. Um, at Loma Linda, we have a very active and effective uh, impaired physician diversion, uh, diversion program so that if I, for example, come across someone who's under the influence or who divulges that they're using some substance, I can immediately pick up the phone and say, I'm going to take you over right now to meet with our uh, addiction specialist. And this person has such an excellent uh, reputation that people are really usually not, not too upset to go see him. We emphasize very, very emphatically during orientation that even though we're a faith-based institution that is known to be teetotalers, that even if someone ha comes in with a substance abuse problem or they have DUIs, we need to know immediately and get them into to monitoring so that they can be watched over the course of their career while they're with us. Um, at this point, I've run into two individuals that um, I had some grave concerns about. Both were residents, and I was able to work very quickly with our GME director and with our Behavioral Health Institute to get them immediately, and in a very discreet way, to get them treated. And um, I think we're well set up to, to be quite redemptive with our students and our residents. We have referred 41 students, or residents, excuse me, we've referred 41 residents, I, it might be students as well, to our impaired physician program over the last three or four years. So it's, you know, roughly 10, 10, 11 a year. And all but three have completed treatment and have come out the other end uh, of the program very, very well functioning. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, but I, I also am very clear from orientation that the only reason I tell anyone, even that someone came to see me, you know, I'm a therapist so I can say this, is that if you're going to hurt yourself, if you're going to hurt someone else, or if you're unfit to work um, and patient safety is an issue, then I will move on things, but I will let you know immediately what I'm doing and I'll stick with you the whole way. And so I think we have, uh, we also have some confidential resident advisors that these our residents can go to immediately and speak with them and they're very confidential and will only do mediation or something like that if they're requested. In terms of recommendations, um, I'm going to be quite biased. I think every campus needs somebody like me who's on the ground. Uh, but of course we don't have that. We do have um, I know many campuses have chaplains and social workers and, and uh, resources for students and residents. Um, I do think that, that there has to be somebody in the community that administration knows well and they're able to set up a contract to be able to refer people to them in a discreet manner. Before I took this position three years ago, I was that person in the community for many of our medical students. And um, I would often get phone calls, would, do you have time to see so-and-so? I'm walking them over or I'm calling, uh, would you please be able to see them and, and get them, uh, deal with the disposition issues because they need to either be hospitalized or treated, et cetera. Um, so I, I do think that if there is no one on a campus, there needs to be several individuals in the community identified and with an understanding they'd be able to see someone very quickly and make the referrals necessary. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Uh, I, I also invited you, if you have any comments, uh, to offer advice to the medical board in terms of what approach we should take uh, in either sponsoring some kind of physician health program or expecting that this is the responsibility of the community and the medical board should just stay here to discipline physicians. but. I think we do have a concern about rehabilitating physicians and at the same time protecting the public. So if you have advice to offer us, we're eager to hear it. Well, I would be very hesitant to offer advice to you folks, uh, but I, I think I could say that there has to be some kind of mechanism for monitoring and for support. Um, not just to be punitive, because if you are a punitive body only, people will not trust you and people will not come forward as much. There'll be great fear about licensure. Um, 
I really don't know that I could offer much in, in terms of suggestion because I'm fairly new to the, to the workings of medicine uh, at this level. Thank you. Sure. Do you have a question? Um, so since you started this three years ago, what criteria are you using to measure success? Well, that's what I'm talking about when I say we've got all these soft measures. Um, I keep track of how many physicians come to me who want to quit, who are suicidal or terribly depressed. I don't know really how to set a dollar amount to that. I can say I've kept about eight doctors from, and these are faculty, from leaving medicine. And as I said, there's, that's, if, if we're really going with what the insurance companies say, that it takes $300,000 to replace a, a faculty physician, I think I've paid for my keep. But it's really hard to know in hard data what that value is. Um, what I can tell you anecdotally is that the culture is slowly changing there at Loma Linda. So that now, um, for example, we had a suicide very sadly uh, last year and people were on the phone to me immediately, whereas before they'd just kind of be frozen and think, well, what do we do and how do we do this? But immediately, we have somebody identified to deal with these things, and I was able to walk in, do a debriefment in a very short period of time, and follow up with all the parties involved. And I think we can see the morale slowly changing, mm -hmm. uh, and people coming forward with more issues that they would have felt more shame about and not brought forward. So at this point, we are still trying to figure out how to identify the, the dollar value of this. I might suggest that the, the dollar value is not the only way to measure success and would look to you for possible some suggestions, some real um, uh, best practices that you found. I know that we've had issues with medical schools in the past with situations of their students and residents going through programs and getting themselves into a hole. And so our stress has always been prevention comes beforehand. You have to educate them from the time Correct. they walk in and make sure that not only are there people and places and programs in place, but they have to do hands-on meetings and working with students. So I don't know if, if you guys are doing anything like that at Loma Linda, but if you're able to put your finger on and suggest these are two things that we've seen that maybe should be considered or looked at, because what we want to use is this forum is not only for the opportunity for us all here to hear what you're saying, but for us to take this and sure. give it some legs, use it through our public information outreach for our newsletter outreach, because there's a whole lot of people that can be best benefit from hearing what Sure. The good, bad, and the ugly. And preventing a suicide is a whole lot better than dealing with it afterward, Absolutely. as we all know. Absolutely. So if you could say in, in your mind's eye, you know, for me to hear that you've got 10 students a year that are having issues, that's, for me, a, a red herring. I mean, that's, a, I don't know if it's a lot or not. But for me, as, as a public member of this board, that's a lot. But are there things that you could point to and say, these are things that we've tried, we're working on, and this might be something for other people to think about, beside having the person available to speak to? I'm talking about more proactive. Sure, and let me just clarify one thing. The 10 people a year are not those who have substance abuse problems. Any kind of they problem. They might have had a DUI and they're any being kind of followed. Any, any issue. You know, they woke up and they had a headache as an issue. Okay. So, so I think what we do from the outset is we have an, a, a number of assemblies where our, um, our Dean for Academic Affairs in the School of Medicine will talk about all of the various resources that we have on our campus. We have a panel where we sit in front of these medical students and we each talk about issues that could arise and where to go and how to get help for all of those issues. Uh, they see our faces. Um, we have a series of assemblies, like I said, so I, I stand before the medical students and I circulate with them probably three or four times in the first six months. Then I lead a small group with them. So I think we have, we are on the ground and they see us and they know and they hear over and over and over that we're trying to be helpful to them. Um, the Dean for Academic Affairs has an open door policy. Um, he has students streaming in and out and makes referrals accordingly.
top of the scale for MCAT scores or GPAs for undergraduate science courses, but, but they are very committed to service and they are very committed to being open and, um, and being somewhat self-revelatory. And I think we are unique in that way. I think that does in, impact what we offer and, and, and the quality of student that we have. So I think it's just being steady with them. We have retreats for our medical students. Um, I think because part of it is a faith base, and so we have more frequent, uh, we have required chapels, they get together every week. Um, we have a lot of activities for them to do, and I think just that learning community and support is helpful for them. Okay, good, thank you. Are there any, I've got a public comment uh, sheet from um, Barbara Hernandez. That's me. Oh, you're Barbara, so don't take a part, okay. Uh, Maria Hollingsworth. I apologize, please come forward. Yeah, hello, my name is uh, Marion Hollingsworth, coming as a private citizen. Um, I was wondering with your group, if you do ever come across a doctor uh, who is um, clearly involved in an addiction or needs help, do you ever report them to the medical board or is this all discreet? And, and another one is what um, religious basis um, is a program uh, associated with? Okay, so the last question first, we're Seventh-day Adventist mm -hmm. University. And whether or not th these are reported to the medical board, I believe they are. Um, I can tell you that I'm not part of that piece, but I do know that our residents do get reported to the medical board and these individuals go straight into addictions counseling should we see them. And we have something called 90, 90 meetings in 90 days, and they, they complete 90 meetings in 90 days. And they're evaluated throughout that whole period of time, and they have group once a week on top of those 90 meetings for 90 days. Um, and at this point, we've had really excellent outcomes with that. In terms of the reporting piece, since I'm not part of that administrative piece, I couldn't tell you more about that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. It's been very informative, and I look forward to continued. I see a hand. I apologize. I dialogue after we hear what's on the phone. Sorry. Do not. My apologies. Well, again, thank you very much for being here, and we look forward to ongoing conversations. The next presentation is going to be from uh, Dr. Michael Goldstein, who is a professor of public health and sociology at UCLA. He will be giving us a presentation on UCLA's Healthy Campus Initiative. Dr. Goldstein is a Brown University alumni and is the association vice provost in charge of the Healthy Campus Initiative. He has also served the campus as interim vice provost for graduate education, the dean of the graduate division. He is the author of two books, The Health, uh, the health Movement, Promoting Fitness in America and Alternative Healthcare, and medicine, miracle, or a mirage. Dr. Goldstein, thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. It's certainly a pleasure to be here and tell you a little bit about what we're doing at UCLA through something called the Healthy Campus Initiative. Um, the Healthy Campus Initiative began when the UCLA Chancellor, that's Gene Block, uh, made a decision uh, to make UCLA the healthiest campus in America and uh, an important uh, set of philanthropists who've already been very supportive of the university uh, decided to, uh, to assist in that, and they gave very generously of their time and money to try and make it a reality. And about three years ago, I was selected to be the person who would turn this into a reality. Uh, so what does it mean to be the healthiest campus in America? The people who decided to do this really didn't have a clue uh, what it meant. And um, as we started to think about it, it was clear that it wasn't so obvious what it meant to be the healthiest campus in America. Uh, university campuses are filled with young people and their health status is usually pretty good, so you can't simply measure uh, the absence of symptoms and disease. There's relatively little symptom, symptomatology and diagnosable illness on the campus, so we couldn't use that as a definition. Uh, things like the World Health Organization definition uh, were really too vague to be of any uh, practical use in guiding us. 
Uh, and we also became aware that uh, we had to think beyond uh, merely thinking of individuals, uh, that a healthy community was not merely a collection of uh, healthy individuals. So what was the best way to uh, build a healthy campus? Initially, people thought, well, there are all these targeted interventions out there. You know, you, you have a bunch of problems like obesity or binge drinking. There are so-called best practices. Let's find these things. Let's get all these programs, make sure they're on the campus, and bingo, you're going to have a healthy campus. Well, um, this is where we started. It was actually a pretty depressing experience because uh, to reveal the truth, there are no best practices for many of these things. There's a zillion people out there who will sell you programs uh, to do these things, but when you look at the programs, when you look empirically, you find that they have a pretty minimal record of success. Uh, and when they, even when they are successful, uh, very often the success is marginal. The success really doesn't extend over a long period of time. It doesn't really reach the people who you most want to reach. And even when it's statistically significant, it's often practically not significant. For example, uh, something like binge drinking, which is a tremendous problem on campuses, there are any number of interventions that will have statistically significant results showing that if you take a population of, of students who are having nine drinks a night after administering a certain program, they will have 7.8 drinks per night, and that is statistically significant, but it has no real practical or clinical significance in the world. So it was pretty, um, pretty depressing. And what I've done on this slide there, and I know you'll have access to these slides because we don't have time to get into the details here if you're interested in this, is I've just enumerated a whole bunch of um, meta-analyses of different types of uh, preventive programs, which all point to the, the minimal success of this kind of best practices approach. So we knew we were going to have to do something uh, different than the standard sort of approach. Uh, and, but we became optimistic. Why did we become optimistic? Because we knew that over the past several decades there had been a tremendous amount of change on university campuses in America. Uh, whether we think about issues of diversity or uh, feminism or disability rights or gay rights or environmentalism, uh, the campus of 2014 is, is incredibly different than the campus of uh, even 20 years ago, no less 30 or 40 years ago. So we knew that change was possible. Uh, and what all of these things had in common, there was one thing that they had in common, and that was that all of them were based on what might be called a social movement model, rather than a kind of programmatic intervention uh, to take a much broader approach. And so what we decided to do was to use the same type of approach at UCLA and to build a social movement around health and wellness. And uh, that's what we've been doing. Um, so what does it mean to, uh, to have a health-driven social movement? I have to do this very, very briefly here because of the time constraints that I'm under, so I'll try and be semi-coherent about it, okay? Uh, basically, uh, what it means is this, is understanding that the unhealthy choices that people make in our society are typically normative choices. It's not so much that they're individual choices, but it's people carrying out the norms. And it's acknowledging that so, uh, society has not made healthy choices easy choices. And that third, it's realizing that these norms, these unhealthy norms, uh, reflect, uh, they're not there, they're not there magically. They haven't dropped down from heaven, these unhealthy norms. The norms are what they are because they reflect the needs of certain groups in society who benefit from people making unhealthy choices. So once you adopt this approach, you move away from a, an individually oriented approach towards health behavior change to a more socially oriented approach. For example, a couple of hours ago, I arrived at the Sacramento airport. I hadn't been at that airport in a few years. And I was struck by uh, how the aesthetic changes. It looks a lot nicer. But I was also struck by the fact that you can't find anything healthy to eat in that airport. It looks like you can. And if you really search and spend a lot of time, you can pin one item and another item and you can do it and spend a lot of money. You can get healthy food there. But it's really quite difficult to do. The norm of eating in that airport is to eat junk. Okay. Why is that there? It's there for a reason. It didn't happen just accidentally that it's very difficult to get healthy food at the Sacramento airport. Okay, so that's the approach that we take to understanding health problems on the campus. Uh, so in other words, a health-driven social movement evolves. It shifts the focus from changing individuals to changing the structure or the context within, those, within which those individuals exist. 
Now, uh, let me just speak for a moment. Is it realistic to think about having a health-driven social movement on a campus today? Because institutions of higher education, uh, there's a lot of reasons to think that it's not a very easy thing to do on a campus. Uh, higher education places a great value on skepticism and questioning authority. Uh, it doesn't place emphasis on conforming to rules about how to live one's life. If we're just thinking about students, for example, students don't come to UCLA or any other college in California or anywhere to be told what to eat, to be told not to have sex, to be told not what substances to imbibe. They come for just the opposite reasons, so they can stay up as long as they want and have as much sex as they want and drink as much as they want. The norms are very much uh, would seem to be resisting the kind of thing that, that we wanted to do, and that's just a reality that you have to uh, deal with. Uh, on the other hand, there were certain things that led us to believe that you could take a health-driven social movement approach and apply it to a campus. Uh, the campus themselves, and, and more and more campuses are like this, want to brand themselves in, in ways that differentiate themselves, and health and being healthy is one way to do that. Uh, there's also this notion, and you'll see there on the slide, I made a point of putting it uh, in parentheses, that if you do these, these sorts of healthy things, you're going to save money for the campus. I would say that's, that's hypothetical, okay? But it certainly is an important motivation for the campus to get on board with this kind of thing if they think they're going to save money. Uh, but the most important thing was that when we looked around the campus, we saw that there were dozens and dozens, if not many more, groups that were concerned with issues that were already related to health, whether or not they articulated it in exactly that way. So for example, many groups concerned with issues of gender and sexuality, ethnic groups that are particularly concerned with health disparities, uh, the whole environmental green movement, sustainability, very, very uh, similar to um, a lot of the concerns that health groups have. And then, of course, scores of groups that are specifically health-oriented, built around specific issues of physical exercise or nutrition or meditation or whatever. So yes, we thought it was, there was the possibility that you could really build a social movement around health or wellness on the campus. So the key organizing principle of what we've been doing is a bottom-up perspective. You start where people are. You allow them to define health according to their own ideas and needs and values. And however they define it is the right way to define it. Uh, with the assumption is that you start where people are and you help them achieve success using the def their own definitions. And then if they are successful, that will naturally expand out in ways that will eventually reach the things that we might be uh, concerned with, for example. Um, and that you uh, emphasize personal shared experiences of people using their own definitions of health, and that you think in terms of what people really want, particularly young people, as you know, are very often not concerned with health, not concerned with outcomes that may take place many, many years in the future. But what are they concerned about? They're concerned with getting good jobs. They're concerned with being happy, uh, feeling fulfilled, creative, uh, being sexually satisfied, that all of these things, that we, in other words, we can sell health or we can build a movement around health the same way Coca-Cola sells Coca-Cola. You know, if you go to the movies, now you'll see a commercial for Coca-Cola before the movie begins. That movie says, that, that commercial says almost nothing about Coca-Cola. What it does is it gives some image that they're trying to sell. That if you drink Coca-Cola, you'll have friends, you'll be happy, you'll be creative in some way. Well, the same thing can be done using this as long as it's not imposed on people, but using it in a bottom-up sort of way. However, people themselves uh, decide, whatever they decide is, is healthy, that's what, what health means. That's a way of beginning, bottom-up principles. Uh, so let me give you some examples of the kinds of things we do and what makes this kind of social movement perspective a little bit different than what uh, many other institutions and campuses are doing. First of all, you can't be afraid of conflict. Uh, there's often an assumption in the world that health is a value that everybody agrees with, and that's not true. Uh, many people, as I mentioned before, are anti-health, and many people have different definitions of health that are in conflict with each other. There's no reason that we have to choose one or the other. First of all, don't be afraid of conflict, and I put up some examples there. Uh, students who want to protest the quality of food in the dining hall, support them give them money to do what they want to do. Faculty who complain about the quality of air in their offices uh, support them, pay for the, uh, to do the um, atmospheric analyses that will allow them to challenge the administration. 
uh, fight with politicians uh, in the local community over uh, building bicycle lanes uh, to help people get to campus. Health, if you're going to make a healthy community, you're always going to be involved in conflict and we can't be afraid of conflict. The second thing is not to be afraid of groups with opposing goals. So, t for example, there, there are bike groups that foster the use of bike helmets. Obviously, bicycle helmets are a very important thing. I'm 100 percent supportive of bicycle helmets. We support those groups. But there are other groups that want to advance the number of people who commute to UCLA by bicycle, and those groups are anti-bicycle helmets because they feel that if you impose regulations about bicycle helmets, you'll cut the number of people who will commute that way. Well, we support those groups as well. There's no need for us to make a choice. Uh, there are groups that support having a uh, labeling how many calories in food, how many grams of fat in every item that is uh, made available in the residence halls, that that is posted online, that's posted on uh, television monitors outside the dining halls. We support that, but then there are other groups, not only student groups, but staff groups that oppose that because they think that is very bad for people with anorexia or bulimia. And they said that's the worst thing you can do is post calorie counts. We support those groups too. In other words, there's no need to take a definition, an arbitrary definition of what health means. If people define health as one way and they believe in that, they can be supported, okay? Similarly, in terms of gender and ethnic specific programs, which of course are very, very important on campuses, all those groups can be supported. The only thing we ask when we support a group and when we give them money to do things is we demand a certain type of evaluation, an empirical evaluation of programs, and we also demand that they use our logo on anything they produce because one of the goals is to create a feeling that the campus is healthy, to see our logo in as many places as possible. So we support all of those groups. Uh, now, there are also some emphasis on top-down <coughs> approaches. Leadership is very, very important, but for the most part, uh, what we emphasize is that the top is responding to the bottom, not telling the bottom what to do. Uh, there has been one very important top-down uh, initiative that we, where we led the entire University of California, and that was becoming a 100% tobacco-free campus, and that's an example of sort of the opposite of what I was talking about. But the other kinds of top-down things that, that we've done for example, trying to get a preamble in our planning documents that state that all uh, building in the, on the uh, UCLA campus has to be pedestrian and bike friendly. We've used top-down, bottom-up approaches to pressure people on the top to insist on that sort of thing. So again, it's primarily uh, a bottom-up uh, approach that we are using here. So we try to build alliances, build awareness, build our brand, and build the movement, and you can see some of the logos that we use there. So I hope I have been minimally coherent in talking about this to you as a model for universities and for other institutions as well. The past month, I've been talking to uh, people concerned with military bases and other kinds of institutions where it's the same, the issues are basically the same, that if you read this empirical literature on health promotion, it all ends by saying, gee, these programs haven't led too much, we need a culture change, and then the article just stops there. No one has a concrete idea of what it means to actually, what you actually have to do to bring about these sorts of cultural changes, and that's what we're attempting to do here. So thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Goldstein, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of yours, and I want to thank you again for being here. Um, I, I have to suggest that the model that I see at, at, on the campus is one that could be translated easily to any corporate American company in ending business in any entity period, end of discussion. But to that, proving that point, how many um, people are on the campus at any given time during any given day? Is it? Well, it's, uh, they use different numbers depending on whether they're trying to make themselves look big or small. So it varies between 45,000 and about 63,000. Is that um, students and faculty? That, that's students, and faculty, and staff. Uh, about 28,000 students and 16,000 staff, and then there's faculty and visitors. And so you're talking about a small city of 50, roughly 50,000 people every day. So that city of 50,000 is bigger than the city of Beverly Hills? Yes. FYI for people that are comparing, contrasting. Questions, Dr. Uh, Krauss? Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll start with my uh, disclosure that I'm a big fan of UCLA and I oh, serve I'm on the clinical faculty there. Uh, and uh, that my father warned me to believe nothing of what I read in the newspaper. But the press has been having a heyday of recent 
claiming that American universities are not doing an adequate job of suppressing what they claim is an epidemic of sexual assault on campus. Uh, is this an issue at UCLA, and is UCLA actively working to reduce that risk? It's absolutely an issue on most campuses. It's certainly an issue at UCLA. Uh, again, the campus response has been primarily, for, for years and years, there's been no response or minimal response. Now it's a legalistic response, and that's entirely appropriate and necessary. Uh, but again, the, the issue that you're talking about demands cultural change, okay? That's where the Healthy Campus Initiative has become involved. Uh, we support uh, many groups on campus that are trying to, f to, to change the culture. Some of them are campus-wide groups, but some of them are very, very specific groups. Let's say particular ethnic groups focused around certain, certain gender identities who want to do things that the campus wouldn't usually be able to support, but because we have non-state money and we see ourselves as somewhat independent of the administration, even though I am an administrator, we can still support them. Uh, and we can take a somewhat independent line on these things. So, uh, for example, we've been producing videos. Uh, we paid for an instructor in the, in the School of Theater, Film, and Television to create vid videos about microaggression, to create videos about binge drinking. They're the kinds of the videos that you would not see a university administration creating. Uh, and the overall, uh, the, the goal is not only to influence specific behaviors, but to create a culture change on the campus about what is, um, uh, what is essential to talk about and how these issues can be spoken about from the perspective of the students themselves. Okay, so yes, this is absolutely uh, an issue, and the traditional way of thinking about it has uh, not been very highly effective, so we must have this kind of cultural change. Um, I have a question around the, the norms, right? So the norms that we live in is sort of anti-health. Um, and so within the university, you're creating this um, new culture, but most of the people going to the campus live outside the campus. How do you, how, how are you looking at that aspect of well, it's very, very complicated, and in my comments here, I focused on students. The Healthy Campus Initiative deals with students, faculty, and staff, and the students are the easiest to deal with, even though increasingly, of course, many of them live off campus. Uh, for example, uh, graduate students, international students, have tremendous problems, health-related problems. Take something simple like cooking. Often here we have people who are living on their own for the first time. You'd be amazed they don't know how to shop. The, and many of them have families. They don't know how to cook. Cooking classes have proved to be incredibly successful and attractive, and then the cooking classes are used as a way of people who have children bring their children for child care, and the cooking classes naturally then lead to parenting classes. And most of what we do, the goal is to, uh, to do it in a way that after it's done one or two times, the people themselves can do it. It's very much uh, not a professionally based pr uh, approach, but rather a peer-based a peer approach. Because if you're gonna have to rely on professionals, it's A, it's much more costly, B, uh, you, you're constantly redoing and redoing and redoing, and also, frankly, it's generally less effective uh, than dealing with people who are actually living, living the problems and who can call on professionals for help. But this is a, a, a major, a major, major um, issue. I could give you many, many, many more examples, but you're absolutely right. I don't have any magical solution. Thank you. Do we have any comments from anyone in the audience? I have no slips. Do we have anyone from the uh, phones? There are no comments from the phone lines. I want to thank you again for being here. I could keep you here for another several hours, but we have another meeting that's going to start in about a half an hour, so I have to move on to speakers. But thank you very, very much. And thank you very continued much. Continued success. So now I'm going to call forward Dr. Jessica uh, Nunez de Ibarra and ask you to introduce yourself since I don't have any written. Any. The third page. 
I would venture to say that's correct, except do you want me to introduce you as um, Ronald Chapman? I apologize. Right. It's here. She's absolutely correct. Okay. It wasn't in my script, so I apologize. Uh, Dr. Nunez de Barra is a physician and public health medical officer at the California Department of Public Health, working as the chief of coordinated chronic disease prevention section since October 2012. She's board certified in public health and general pre preventative medicine and a fellow at the American College of Preventative Medicine. Starting July 1, 2014, she will serve as the director of coordination and the implementation of the California Wellness Plan, the state chronic disease, disease prevention and health promotion plan that she and multidisciplinary team developed in collaboration with internal and external partners. In this position, she will work with partners to convene a statewide work group to increase integration of public health and the healthcare sector. She will also monitor and track specific program activities relevant to the CWP implementation for collective impact in the prevention and control of chronic diseases and associated risk factors. Uh, Jessica previously worked for CDPH Center for Infectious Diseases, facilitating internal public health communications, training and preparedness activities to address emerging public health th threats, including creation and oversight of the CTPH lab, as lab Aspire, a public health laboratory director's training program from 2006 to 2012. Um, she received her medical degree from UC Davis in 1997 and a master in public health in health Admin service administration from uh, UCLA in 2000. Uh, it goes on, so I want to stop because your presentation should be longer than mine. <laughs> thank you and so And thank much. you very much for being mm -hmm. here. Uh, again, I'm here to represent our director at the California Department of Public Health. It's a privilege to be here, and I am very much appreciative of the presentations presented earlier. I've been asked to present to all of you this afternoon an update on Let's Get Healthy California Task Force report, as well as the California Wellness Plan. My objectives with you are to briefly tell you about the Let's Get Healthy California Task Force report from 2012, to tell you a little about the plan for California wellness that was just released in 2014, and to provide you just a quick glimpse of some opportunities that may be coming to California in the form of uh, the California State Innovations Model federal funding. Back in 2012, Jerry Brown uh, provided an executive order for our secretary uh, within California of the Department of Health and Human Services Agency to think about with many leaders how we would keep the state of California's budget solvent. The concern was that due to growing health care expenditures and state obligations, uh, the, without reining in those costs, we would go bankrupt as a state. So he was very serious and gave her in this executive order six months to put together a plan. <coughs> so again, she was successful. She was able to bring together many leaders. And her question, similar to what was discussed earlier, was not for the campus of UCLA, but the state of California, what will it take for California to be the healthiest state in the nation? Mindful again of improving health overall, controlling costs, thinking about the quality of health care, promoting personal responsibility for health, and advancing health equity. I want to show you this quickly. You can all find this information on the Secretary's website, but I want to give you a feel for the expertise that came together uh, in this state to put together the task force. So I'll just leave that there for a moment. You all have copies, so you can all review that page. Again, what will it take for the state of California to be the healthiest? This graphic is important because it describes at the top the triple aim, and it's basically a way to think about what I've just described in three frames. 
better health for the community, better care in terms of health at a lower cost. So the way that the group approached it, because this, this is the outcome of the report essentially, was looking at, um, you know, Dr. Hernandez talked uh, earlier about whole person care, which I completely um, support. But in public health, uh, we think about um, the beginning to the end, the lifespan. So what you see at the top in that first arc is health across the lifespan. Healthy beginnings, laying the foundation for a healthy life, living well, preventing and managing chronic disease, and then the end of life, maintaining dignity and independence. Pathways to health, where are the opportunity to impact those three areas of a lifespan? And what is our foundation for that work? And again, at the bottom you see health equity is the overall foundation for our work where we're trying to eliminate disparities, meaning the difference in health outcome uh, in populations. So they thought about, well, we need to redesign the health system to make sure it's optimal. We need to look at creating healthy communities. In other words, the core of what was described earlier, how can we really create opportunities for healthy choices? And then finally, lowering cost of care. So just to give you a flavor for the length and the specification of the document, if you haven't looked at Let's Get Healthy California Task Force, published in December of 2012, um, this is a little glimpse of what it looks like. So if you think about healthy beginnings, and back to also what you pointed out, which is we need to not just talk about actions, activities, gaps, problems, but also think about how are we measuring success? So for every area that I've described, there was an effort to define a measure so for instance, number one under healthy beginnings was looking at infant mortality or deaths in infants in California per 1,000 live births. And our baseline in California is 4.7 deaths of infants per 1,000 live births. We looked at our target that had a specific race ethnicity category because our our idea in terms of promoting equity was to say if the white and Asian children born have a rate of death of 4.1 out of 1,000 live births, all groups should have that as our target. The national baseline is higher, so we were happy to see California was doing better overall. Um, and obviously there wasn't a national target available, but we also wanted to show ourselves in this schematic, in this diagram, our failings. And our failings include that for African American children, that death rate is above the national baseline and is 10.6. So again, page after page, table after table was developed and um, these are a few more. So I'll just leave it there so you all can go to that document. I've given you a link to that document. Now let me tell you about why the California Wellness Plan is important. Number one, we took the priorities out of Let's Get Healthy and said, well, it's great to know what we want to do in 10 years and where we need to be and where we are currently, but the real question is how we're going to do it. What is the there there? Who should be on the hook for doing something about it? Well, we decided to put our best effort at doing that very thing. So we took all the priorities of Let's Get Healthy and put them in the frame of four goal areas with equity and wellness and health as the overarching goal. Healthy communities, optimal health systems linked with community prevention, accessible and usable health information, and finally, a mechanism to pay for the first three um, goals, which is how do we pay for it? Prevention, sustainability, and capacity. 
Our outcomes for the plan included understanding of the multiple factors that contribute to chronic disease, um, increased transparency of our activities at the department and throughout the state, roadmap for collaborations between ourselves and others, longstanding partners, and the ability to um, measure improvements in chronic disease outcomes, inequities, and costs. And you may wonder why, after all of this um, conversation, why chronic disease ended up being the place where much of the movement could be made in saving um, the state from insolvency or an area of focus. Well, it's for the reasons that we've just described. It is the place where we can actually do something, uh, where there is an ability to do better. Um, there really isn't that kind of opportunity in any other area. So that being said, uh, what I'm presenting to you, because the, the plan itself is lengthy, and uh, I just wanted to give you a glimpse, for goal two, um, it was decided with a group of uh, experts that we would be best served by thinking about improving patient and community health by building on strategic opportunities that are here in California as a result of the Federal Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act to also look at the opportunity of new uh, prevention services that are to be in place for health insurance plans without any co-pays for uh, enrollees, and to look at what can we do if California is on target to expand managed care, specifically in our Medicaid population. So um, our commitment at the California Department of Public Health is to convene a statewide work group to increase integration of public health and the healthcare sector. I will be leading that work group over the next couple years, and I wanted to let you know that my strategy will include um, understanding as a result of our work to date that there is no problem from the prevention or community side about this integration. The real place to start for this work group will be the health side of the equation or the partnership. So I intend to work with health plans, health systems, medical provider groups to figure out where they could use our support in terms of prevention work and integration with public health. Um, and so we are beginning that process. I want to also let you know we are going to bring a health economist on board in a few months to be able to provide real return on investment analysis of our activity so we can give the dollar but also some of the outcome measures. Um, also, we have a health reform coordinator at the department who will look at the opportunities and make sure we're not missing any in terms of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And we intend to coordinate with partner organizations. I can tell you this is the kind of level of activity in every goal area, and it, it, it's a very exciting time. And finally, I want to close with this slide, which is that the reason the California Wellness Plan is is uh, important for you all to be aware of is that when I went about trying to develop with a small group of stakeholders the work um, or the plan and, and to frame it, because we were given no guidance for how to do it. Um, it was a lot like Dr. Goldstein probably felt when he was asked, you know, develop a way that we're going to become the healthiest campus in America. It's, it's, um, it's very difficult. But what we had, again, was the um, benchmarks developed by that group of leaders. We also felt very proud that we had so many partners in chronic disease prevention and in the work that was described. We were able at the California Department of Public Health to find different programs in every measure that we were interested in. So for instance, for the infant mortality information, we have vital statistics. We have birth certificate records. We have maternal child and adolescent health. We have groups that work to prevent babies that are low birth weight, our black infant health program. So when that measure came up in our plan, we had a place for it to fit. We had programs that had the data. We knew what we wanted to do in the short term to get to the 10-year objectives, and it is incorporated in the wellness plan if you look at it. For every measure, 
there was somebody that we were working with within our department that could help us. And so we captured that information. And so it really is accountability for our department, for all of you, the public, California, to see who has what information, who's on the hook. There were other measures that weren't within our bailiwick, but we went to those partners and said, this sounds like you, Department of Healthcare Services, this sounds like you covered California. This sounds like you, California Department of Education. This sounds like you, et cetera, et cetera. Those agencies, departments were willing to be a part of our plan and their objectives are in our plan as well. So it ends up being larger than our California Department of Public Health, which is very important because health is a group effort. And we are very proud that the California Wellness Plan was scrutinized and approved not only by our agency secretary as a core document for, um, you know, that has her blessing because it took into, uh, took to heart the recommendations of her report and her leadership and her programs, but we also had um, review and approval from our Department of Finance. So you, it really um, can stand up to any scrutiny, at least at the state level. And we invite people to look at it and to come on board and to join us. That being said, the secretary is going after a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation grant. In case you may not be aware, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, there were billions of dollars put into this center for Medicare and Medicaid innovation. And we are applying for $100 million over the next few years to come to California to work in um, four core areas if we get the money. Maternity care, palliative care, accountable communities of health, and health homes. So each will have a target of focus. We, we are um, pretty much um, excited about it and think we can make some real um, investments in those areas and save lives, save money, do some great work innovations here in California. Uh, so I will, um, I believe, close that here. And if there are questions, I'm happy to take them from the board. Thank you very much. Let's go to questions from committee members, please. Dr. Krauss. Thank you very much for being here. I think this is a very exciting program that you're spearheading. Uh, I didn't see it explicitly stated, but I assume the medical board would be a welcome partner organization? I'm happy to report that a, at a previous uh, meeting of this committee, I informed the committee of my work on this plan and this committee was interested in partnering and so being that the plan was just launched in March of 2014 and this is my first committee meeting since <laughs> uh, yes is the answer a, a very enthusiastic yes thank you Ms. Pines? No question. so I have a question I, I it's very exciting it sounds like it's all really gonna finally come together it's gonna start working everyone's gonna be at the table playing Ball. The one question missing link I seem to notice in prevention and all this other thing that you're trying to move forward was the role of the insurance companies and their participation in reimbursements for wellness and for activities that lead to staying out of medical offices. Are they at the table? Can they be at the table? Can you bring them to the table? Yes, 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 and yes. So, Great. Um, I think the way that you all need to appreciate this plan is that it is our plan. And when I say our plan, any person that resides in California should think of this plan as their plan. And what I mean is this, because right now I'm being approached as the coordinator for the plan um, with what can I do, what is my role, what matters. And I said, well, it all matters. The truth is, as we've kind of discussed today, the, the standard has been set, the targets have been set, the information has been shared. So then the thought is that the plan speaks to what could be done, what we try to speak to in terms of um, strategies are evidence-based, um, the kinds of things we think are important, you know, is it all very scientific, but the activities, the interventions are our own to develop. 
And what I'm asking every um, entity that's interested, because the entities range from a small group in a rural county in California to very large institutions. What I tell them is you take from it what you need. You communicate, you partner, you make it what is necessary for you. So for instance, for the California Department of Public Health, this is very important for our accreditation purposes. We also know local public health departments are going through a new accreditation process also. And the thing that is nice is that when you think about changing uh, communities, getting healthier, this is a, a template to do that and they can pick what they feel in their convenings with stakeholders are critical for their region, look at what the standards are and try to do something about it. The what they do is up to them and per, and it's kind of back to what Dr. Goldstein talked about, like we wanna be supportive of any effort because the other thing is that if we're doing a good job and monitoring and we're all kind of looking at the same standard per se, then we can find the best practice because then we can find what works. Then we can retreat from something that doesn't work and move to something that does work. And we really want it to be a frame for people to the, do what they need to for their own communities and their own organizations. And so back to your question, doing some of the, or getting to some of those per performance measures are impossible without the health plans. And so that's where the work of the work group will go, is what is our activity to move the dial in some of these areas? And we're gonna need to decide on some focus areas, uh, but I kind of want it to be back to what I told you earlier, to what the health plans, the health providers, the health systems need right now. Because I'll tell you, and you're probably well aware, everyone is quite inundated currently with all the change that is happening in like the health system right now. I want to thank you very much. I think it's a very exciting time for, for to be living in in a situ in, in California, especially. But as we move forward, and providing healthy opportunities for Americans so that they they stay healthy longer and it costs us less money so we can survive, that this becomes part of the puzzle and it becomes the framework. So I want to thank you and look forward to working with you in ongoing dialogue. And so, do we have any comments from anyone on the phone? I don't have anyone from, I don't have any slips, so I assume there's no one here that wants to speak. David, do we have any comments? There are no comments at this time. Thank you very much, and thank you again. Any comments from anyone in the public? Oh, Frank Cooney, would you like to come forward, please? And welcome to our meeting. Please. First, I'm a layperson. I'm the Executive Director of California Citizens for Health Freedom, which is a 501c4 nonprofit organization that works on legislative activities where citizens have access to alternative, safe, effective alternative medicine and treatments. And I want you to know that I, I appreciate the comments that were being made here. Uh, a bill we will be presenting next year will be a bill, hopefully, to make integrative, treat, integrative medicine legal in California, so that physicians, naturopathic doctors, particularly oncologists, will legally be able to do integrative treatments. And integrative treatments in the past were referred to as alternative medicine or holistic approaches in this area. And what is taught in medical school is primarily medical medicine. And the result is that the other side that is available and, and often less expensive mm -hmm. is something they don't receive information on. We do have a number of hospitals like Harvard and others that have now put integrative medicine in as part of their hospital program. How integrative they're doing, I'm not sure. But it, it is movement, the health movement of becoming healthier is a movement that is a public movement. Otherwise, the population is moving in the direction of saying, we need to get more natural health, we need to move in that direction, and it questions the medical system, are they moving in that direction? So I think the physicians, particularly the ones in the medical school, need to have the opportunity to know what is integrative medicine, and that it is legal for them to partner, say, with a naturopathic doctor or a nutritionist, 
and be able to move towards the integrative side instead of moving heavy to the drug side when they're aware that drugs are not particularly working. Just like today's news we're saying, the treatment that we've been using for back pain <laughs> is not working. And they're recommending alternative treatments and the drug treatment they've used for years saying at the TV is this is the way that goes. So if you want to reduce the cost of insurance, you want to reduce the cost of the Medi-Cal, Medicare, integrative approaches are the way to go. So I agree with the speakers and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very comment. much, Mr. Cooney. It's good to see you here at our meetings. Thank you again very much for being here. And I'm going to move on the agenda now to item number six and ask Ms. Hawkinson to please come up and present. Are oh, you here? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this is with regards to the strategic plan. Um, the mic, sorry. This regards to the strategic plan and um, you have a copy of it. And basically what I did was I, I pulled out the stuff that was pertinent to the public information, public affairs office. So um, I assume everybody's had a chance to look at it and I'll ask if anybody has any questions and then I have some updates. Any committee members have um, questions? It's, it's kind of, um, it's kind of thin, so I, I don't know if in this time you want to give us some examples, but in the future maybe it would be a good idea to have some examples of, we don't have the time for it, I know. No, we don't, and, and so, and I do, I do have some, some examples and some things that are going on, so we could certainly revisit that good. in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I have any comments or questions from people on the phone? There are no comments. Thank you. And then no questions from anyone in the audience, I assume. Thank you. So uh, we suggestions for future agenda items uh, from members. We'll work with staff to figure that out. And any, any comments from members of the audience for future conversations? Anyone in the, on the telephone, any conversations they'd like to have in the future? They're absent, I know. There are no comments. Thank you. So I'm going to um, ask for a motion for adjournment, and we are like two minutes late. So moved. Thank you. Second. So we're now adjourned. Thank you very much. meeting of the Medical Board of California and this is we are now convening our full board meeting you may notice board members will be accessing laptops during the meeting they're using them to access board meeting materials that are in electronic format um, and they may be eating peaches and nectarines provided <laughs> graciously by Mr. Cuny so um, we'll forgive the mess um, this is an uh, official meeting of the Medical Board of California and we will conduct our business without disruption. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and we'll ask for public comment also on each agenda item. We ask that you be respectful of the need of our need to conduct the board's business in an effective manner and um, we will do everything we can to avoid disruptions of the meeting. Um, the meeting is being teleconferenced Individuals who are listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment both on items not on the agenda as well as on agenda items and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. This is our second board meeting teleconference and I think we're all very pleased that it's gone as smoothly as it has given our experiences with um, high-tech uh, equipment. Uh, for those members of the public who are participating, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you start your comments so that we know with whom, to whom we're listening. Um, to request to make a comment during the public comment period, please press star one. You will hear a tone indicating you're in the queue for comment. If you change your mind and don't want to make a comment, just press the pound sign and it will remove you from the queue. And again, assistance is available through the teleconference meeting. 
to request a, a teleconferencing specialist, just press star zero. So star one to put you into the queue, pound to take you out of the queue, and star zero to get help from a teleconference specialist. Each, each individual will be limited to three minutes per agenda item, whether you are in the room or on the telephone. During agenda item two, public comments not on the agenda, um, we will, excuse me, limit the public comment period for individuals on the phone to 20 minutes if we have 20 minutes of comments, and for those in the room, also 20 minutes. So we will be allocating the same amount of time if you are on the phone or if you are in the room. Um, and we will have to limit the, the total comment period as described. Um, during public comments on agenda, uh, on items not on the agenda, it will be 20 minutes each. For agenda items, it will be 10 minutes for uh, individuals in the room and 10 minutes for individuals on the phone. C. Vang will be, will be assisting me with receiving public comments via teleconference during this meeting. Could you raise your hand? See it on your phone. Um, and we welcome public comment on any item on the agenda. It is our intent, uh, my intent, to ask for public comment prior to the board taking action on the agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, either Ms. Kirkmeyer will pinch me or um, please raise your hand, raise your hand so that I can acknowledge you. And for those of you who know now that you want to um, speak, please fill out a speaker slip. For those of you who, who decide to speak during the, converse, during the discussion, I'm gonna ask you to fill out a speaker slip after the fact so we have an accurate record of the spelling of your name and um, uh, everyone who spoke on the agenda for our records. Um, uh, please give speaker slips to uh, Ms. Lisa Toof, who is our able support, um, and I will do my best to call on everyone who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and also recognize those who, who decide to make a, a, a comments at, um, at the last minute. Um, again, all speakers, please stay on topic and keep your comments to three minutes or less. Our goal is to end the meeting at six o'clock today. We may take some items out of order depending on how quickly pr we, pr we will progress. Um, and do we have a list of guests with us? Oh, um, Christine Lally, oh, guest with us, Christine Lally from the Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, board rela in charge of board relations and G.V. Ayers, who is our ABLE liaison with the Senate Business and Professions Committee, um, who is our um, caretaker, angel, conscience, <laughs> advisor, all things. Um, and we're delighted to have both of you here today. Um, and now I'm uh, going to call the meeting to order, and, and Ms. Toof, could you please call the roll? Absolutely. Dr. Levine? Here. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Here. Dr. Bishop? Here. Dr. Gananadev? Here. Dr. Krause? Present. Dr. Lewis? Present. Mr. Louie? Ms. Pines? Present. Ms. Shipsky? Ms. Wright? Here. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Present. And Dr. Yip? Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Great. We'll move to agenda item number two, public comments on items not on the agenda. Um, at the moment, I have no, Mr. Cooney, please. Please sit at the microphone so we can hear you. It's a pleasure to be back before the board again, and I'm Frank Cooney, I'm the director of California Citizens for Health Freedom, which is a nonprofit 501c4 small organization that primarily does legislative issues dealing with the right of citizens to have access to alternative treatments, both in the medicine field and the health field. We worked hard on the license of naturopathic physicians and also the right of lay midwives to practice in California. And at this time next year, we will be presenting a bill, hopefully, that will deal with making integrative treatment of cancer legal in California. 
the bill will define what integrative treatment is, what the various factors are, are, are part of the integrative treatment, and what kind of rights the patient has. They need to know what background the provider has for providing it, what the conventional approaches are, and how it's different between the conventional and the integrative treatment systems on it. We have fought for this issue for many years, particularly on the issue of cancer, that um, currently under the cancer law, cancer treatments must be approved by the FDA, which is strictly the drug approach, which means chemotherapy and radiation, and physicians who practice that is not falling in that field could be disciplined by the medical board or by uh, on other groups. And we feel that those treat that there are other treatments out there um, that are very successful. Uh, often those treatments are treatments that people go to when they're in stage four cancer because they've been told by their oncologist, we've done everything we can do with the chemotherapy at this particular point. You'll have to live with it or you have to go home and die. And we have numbers of cases where patients have gone to the physicians doing the integrative treatment and use a different treatment approach. It was very successful and even stage four, stage four and five patients become well after a time period and, and can live very happy and on that process. So in the package we're giving you, for first we have a copy of videos, CDs here, which basically are a number of years old, but Burton Goldberg, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with Burton, but he'd been a member of my board for, for a number of years, and it was a person who wrote, developed Alternative Medicine magazine and uh, has done a lot of research in the area. So these are CDs that he prepared on cancer treatments, conventional and alternative cancer treatments, and you'd be welcome to one. We also have a packet of material that uh, we'll leave with you, a packet for each one. And in it is material. First is a copy, uh, a little bit of a letter to you from myself. And also then, it has a copy of the draft of the proposed bill that we want to present next year. And we've indicated to your director that if there are any suggestions Please or- Please conclude your statement. Pardon? Please conclude. Your three okay. minutes has passed. If there are any changes or suggestions that they would like to make in the bill to enhance it, we are open to do that. It's still early. It'll be next year when the bill will be presented. Uh, please read the packet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shall we just leave it here on the desk? Actually, yeah, if you can give them to Ms. Tooth, she will distribute them. Thank you. Mr. Vang, are there any comments on the phone? On items not on the agenda? There are no comments at this time. Great, thank you very much. We'll move on to our next agenda item, which is agenda item number three, approval of the minutes from the May 1st and 2nd, 2014 board meeting. Um, so moved. Second. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes from members? Okay, um, is there any public comment from those uh, in the audience on the minutes from our May board meeting? Are there any comments on the phone? There are no comments. So we have a motion, um, a motion to approve and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? <clears throat> any abstentions? Minutes are approved. Um, we're going to move on to agenda item number four, presentation on improvements and changes to the Controlled Substance Utilization Review and Evaluation System, fondly known as the CURE system. Um, is Mr. Small here? Where? Oh, there you are. I'm, I want to introduce um, Mike Small from the Department of Justice, and, and I will tell all of you that Mike is one of my heroes. Since December of 2011, Mr. Small has essentially single-handedly been manning the phones um, and the computer for the, the cures system um, under you know, a, a resource-constrained environment and has been a leader in making the case for and, uh, and leading the redesign of an updated cure system. 
Mr. Small has 30 years of criminal justice program and administrative experience with the California Department of Justice. He began his career as an intelligence analyst in narcotics enforcement and organized crime, managed firearms regulatory activities. He served as assistant director of the Western State Information Network and served as manager of the DOJ's intelligence operation program. And as I said, he assumed program manager duties for the Cures Prescription Drug Monitoring Program in December of 2011. And um, this is about, this is going to help us understand what we can anticipate in the new and improved Cure system. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, and, th and uh, good afternoon, Board. Uh, thank you for having me come visit you. I'm not going to show many of these screens. Um, for members of the audience and those on the phone, Mr. Small was kind enough to present us with background information, um, which I think we've seen multiple times here at the board about making the case for the role of the prescription drug monitoring program, both in California and across the country, in beginning to address um, our ability to uh, deal with the, um, op the over epidemic of opioid overuse and adverse events in the country. And there's, thank you, and there's two points I'd like to talk about today. One is uh, the registration process, which is of concern to all of us, uh, because historically I don't think it's been anything close to optimal. And then uh, what we're going to do, or what we're envisioning to do with the Cures 2.0, the new system, um, and just as a historical uh, background for you, uh, uh, the web-based uh, 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 face, database facing system to practitioners today was initiated back in 2009. Uh, like many of the PDMPs across the country, it was built on a couple of uh, relatively uh, small federal grants, uh, $300,000 each uh, over the course of a couple of years. Um, and it has uh, proven one thing uh, uh, unquestionably that it is uh, not robust enough, it is not uh, uh, sufficient enough to carry on the mission that we need with the ever-increasing uh, frequency of uh, opioid uh, uh, drug uh, abuse and uh, the morbidity and mortality uh, associated with that. Um, exacerbating that in budget year 2011, the uh, governor and the legislature did defund cures, so uh, we've been uh, really running on an unofficial status, uh, recognizing that it is an important uh, public health and public safety program. Uh, we've, we've been trying to sustain it, and as a consequence, we are been unable to satisfactorily respond to the important constituencies, uh, particularly the practitioners. Um, uh, we've been unable to answer uh, phone calls on a timely basis, and, and uh, we've been uh, uh, taking far too long to process applications that we get for uh, new registrants and new users of the system. And I do apologize for that. I can tell you that uh, we've tried many things to help ameliorate that. Um, and one of the best things we've done is in the last six months, we brought on uh, six student interns uh, because uh, our budget at least allowed for free work <laughs> in, in addition to the uh, uh, costs associated with just uh, hosting such folks. Um, and we've been able to take off of our website the fact that we're not accepting phone calls anymore or that we're not looking at the emails. So uh, we don't look at them uh, the day you send the emails, but we are getting to them within three days now. And we're usually returning phone calls in two days to three days. So uh, there are some slight improvements in terms of uh, Registration, we also recognize that it's an extremely onerous, uh, paper burdensome process uh, to try to help with that also. Um, we have uh, started what I colloquially call cures parties. If you have a facility that has 20 or more uh, uh, qualified participants ready uh, with their application packages ready, uh, minus the uh, notarization requirement, we will come out and we will verify the identity of the applicant ourselves in person and collect those applications. So we not only do those in person, but we made offers to uh, public entities uh, such uh, 
pharmacy board, uh, there are public health officers who will uh, accept those on, and then uh, sign off on the uh, confirmed identity of the applicant and forward those to me. We will process those, uh, waiving the notary requirement. And that is uh, why I'm a little bit proud of this figure. So with uh, no authorized staff, we have uh, increased uh, registrations by 216% since December of 2011. So uh, that's uh, uh, a modicum of effort that we've done with a modicum of resource. And uh, um, in, in the future, what can we do about uh, efficaciously addressing the uh, registration requirement because in SB 809, where the, uh, Senate, uh, the uh, Senate Bill 809, uh, which restores CURES funding uh, commencing July 1 of 2015, I will get authorization for staff again. Um, yet, in the same bill, all DEA uh, holding uh, pre uh, prescribers and all pharmacists will have to be registered with the CURE system, um, which to me is lose-lose from a po program point of view. Uh, especially if we sustain the current uh, vehicle for registering uh, licensees. Our only hope in my plan for the Features Cures 2.0 system, which is targeting uh, July of 2015 for implementation, is to work with your, the boards uh, that license prescribers and pharmacists to hopefully ingest your licensing data file, or at least elements that are necessary for me to uh, register CURES uh, users uh, in order to effectuate a uh, wholly automated um, registration program that would uh, take out the human touch. Uh, and since we're uh, reliant, have an official source of files documenting the licensure uh, rather than having to uh, start from uh, fresh, we should be able to uh, create a system where we can um, have the licensees uh, identify themselves to us electronically, complete uh, the necessary parts of the application form that are not presently in your own databases, such as DEA certificate number. Um, th and NPI number, things like that. And uh, then we can uh, complete that registration, give you a password, and then you'd be considered registered for the purposes of the statute and also for the purposes of getting in and using the system. So that's where we hope to go. Um, and we hope to uh, reach out to all the boards and uh, make an arrangement to, I understand the uh, Breeze system is not yet capable of, of of, a, of a, achieving a level of interoperation with us, and I understand that and I appreciate that, uh, but nevertheless, there's no reason we can't make arrangements to have a flat file uh, protocol transfers uh, arranged so we can still get that data, uh, update it, maintain it, and, uh, and effectuate a uh, streamlined uh, automated registration process. So if I have to take my lack of staff out of the loop, it'll be win-win and we can do that. So I'm very hopeful that we uh, together move in that direction and, and, and I think we will all be uh, uh, satisfied with that outcome. Aside from registration itself, CURES 2.0, we are anticipating, to uh, visioning to do a number of the things that the current limited system cannot do. And we are uh, planning to interoperate with all the major healthcare systems and all the major pharmaceutical IT systems, uh, pharmacy provider systems in the state so that uh, CURES queries can be uh, uh, sent electronically uh, based on anticipated uh, uh, appoint appointment visits or in the case of an emergency room visit, uh, the triage person or the person doing the uh, paperwork intake can uh, send the uh, necessary query data to CURES. And by the time the uh, patient is seen in the emergency room, hopefully that data will be back in that EHR that is established for that emergency room patient. 
And then for uh, patients at large in healthcare settings, uh, they get the entire patient load overnight, uh, process it, and then send the cures results back to the uh, respective IT system so it could render that data however uh, that system, uh, that practice sees fit, uh, most likely in the EHR itself. So when the doctor walks in the room, the data will be there along with the uh, uh, health record uh, for the physician to uh, uh, look at if need be, if he chooses to do so. Uh, we also hope to add a few features that do not currently exist. Uh, we are hoping and envisioning that the, uh, by achieving this interoperability, we will be able to keep a, create a bridge of disparate uh, email systems. So if a doctor in one uh, setting sees a cures report that is alarming to him, such that uh, several other doctors are prescribing the same drug, and that in total this is not a good situation, that we would be able to affect a peer-to-peer -peer communication where he can send an email to those other doctors and other uh, pharmacists uh, either prescribing or dispensing to that patient to say, hey, we have a common problem, we need to work on patient X here because I think together we're going to kill him possibly. So uh, we'd like to uh, effectuate that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, collaboration system. At the same time, if you're a doctor and you have a compact with your patient, we'd like to give you on an optional basis the ability to uh, sort of set a watch on that patient, and by that I mean if you enter that patient's name into the system and the patient, unbeknownst to you, goes to another doctor, if the doctor were to run the cures report, he would see that that patient uh, it, uh, has a compact with you and that is your desire to be contacted before he prescribe any additional narcotic drugs so you can collaborate and decide what's best for that patient. And that's a, a feature we do not now have that I think would be extremely beneficial. And then on top of that, I would like to uh, provide you some, uh, I think, helpful analytics on the dashboard um, uh, of your sign-in. You say, uh, when you're, when you're uh, in the office and you just want to, uh, you know, check on some patients or do some work and, and you want to look at uh, your cures sign-in, um, I'd like to give you a list of your patients um, on, on, your, on your landing page. It'd be a listing of your patients who currently in total have been prescribed more than 100 milligram equivalents of, of more of, uh, of uh, opioids, uh, you know, from the from all various sources of, of prescribers. Just just for your benefit, uh, I think it's a good alert. I think it's more efficacious than uh, sending you emails that you probably don't look at in terms of uh, uh, what a government agency uh, perceives as as over prescribing. I mean, excuse me, uh, over. Uh, um, acquiring habits, uh, you know, it's been, uh, I've seen other states that sent out uh, um, uh, unsolicited reports, they call them, if someone's seen six doctors and six pharmacies and over a six month period and, and I, I haven't seen any good studies uh, that indicate the efficacy of that and, and I kind of think they're a little bit like uh, the wanted posters on the post office wall, you know. So I think if you just simply had a listing of your own patients, who are getting more than 100 milligrams equivalency of, of uh, opioids a day, that that's something you'd probably find of value to you. And then I have some uh, general uh, analytics on a, on a statistical page, not on your face page, but if you wanted to look, provide you uh, uh, rates of prescribing throughout the state and also by zip code and, and uh, numbers of patients in the state and your own zip code who are perhaps getting both opioids and benzodiazepine and uh, those kinds of statistics that help you view the uh, uh, California global and your own locality use of opioids. And the reason I want to do that is uh, twofold and if I just go back to one slide here is uh, we're familiar with uh, Dr. Uh, Pelosi's uh, of the CDC. His, uh, this is so telling to me where the correlation of, uh, emergence of hospital admissions and deaths from opioid uh, accidental poisonings uh, are directly correlated, statistically significantly directly correlated to the number, the amount of product that's actually made available to them. So the more we prescribe, or I should say the more you prescribe, 
the, the more uh, uh, unfortunate instance there'll be. The less that's out there, the, the less so. So it's good to make that uh, trending uh, prescription behavior data available, I think, for a sense of, 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 uh, of, of what's going on and maybe what should be and, and, and also as a uh, constant reminder that um, uh, uh, to keep in mind that uh, something so dangerous uh, uh, statistically what it can do and, and what's going on in the state. So that information would be uh, uh, pull information. That is someone would query, who queries. No, no, no. I'm actually going to present that as a just a uh, a tab that you can go to whenever you feel like, and it's just going to be ongoing analytics. You know, as of today, this is the data. Uh, because another thing I'm doing, and because of this, and this tells me that so much of a public health issue, and that Cures has never before uh, uh, recognized nor tried to assist the public health effort. I've uh, applied for a BJA grant, uh, whereby hopefully, will if, if awarded, I'm going to have some very uh, a good researchers uh, from uh, UC Davis, uh, uh, Dr. Wintermute, who I worked before, he's a prolific uh, firearms accidental death investigator. Um, so I convinced Garen to uh, help me with, uh, with uh, prescription monitoring. And um, a team of his researchers, as well as a, a epidemiologist from Columbia University. And uh, if awarded, what we plan to do is, uh, number one, uh, identify the one best manner to uh, uniformly always de-identify and, and, and uh, 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 deduplicate the, uh, the data itself, and then uh, create uh, sets of the de-identified aggregate cures data so we could present them to all the health, 58 health officers of the state. And uh, for those uh, smaller counties who do not have the wherewithal to do analysis of that data, this team would actually analyze that data for them, present them with a set of, of analytical findings so uh, we can uh, enable our health officers to uh, create data-driven uh, strategy and program implementation and give them a basis to measure their success. And this, I think, is a, uh, a very rich potential of CURES data that, that hasn't been uh, um, leveraged, I don't think, anywhere. And I really want to, uh, uh, us to uh, uh, contribute in the public health realm as well. Yes, sir. Dr. Lewis. OK, I, thank you for the presentation. And I have a few questions. Um, I'm going to try to take them Just as... Some, are you done with your... Yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, are there any questions? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> the system, um, until it's real-time data, is not going to really benefit us and physicians and patient safety unless we have real-time data. Like these, as soon as you enter data about a, a prescription, you need to have that data almost instantaneously available. Is that system now capable of doing that? Because here, and here's the reason why, if you have a dashboard, the dashboard works great for a private practice, group practice, you know, healthcare plan, right? It doesn't work for an urgent care and emergency department where you see a lot of abuse also. So sure. Unless you get the real-time data, in, you know, immediately, you know, it's, it's not as beneficial. You see what I mean? Oh, no, no. I completely understand. And I am restricted by my statutes and the legislation, legislator, the legislation, led, our, led, our the laws. Senate. Yeah. Um, in their wisdom, they've, uh, deci they've decided not to touch on the uh, um, requirement that the data be submitted as long as on a weekly basis to us. So there could be a weak lag. and. I'm, I'm straddled by my by our legislative authority. But, but you see how that's a problem. Oh, no, no, no. And I no, think, yeah. no, you're preaching to the choir, yeah. sir. I know. I'm preaching I, to the choir, I understand. Again, and, and we are building to accept and process data as it comes into us. So we have the capability to accept data on a real on a real time basis. 
And in fact, the practice is, despite that weak requirement, uh, so many pharmaceutical IT systems are equipped and they do submit much more frequently than that, sometimes even once and twice a day. So um, it's not as bad as the legislation requires, but it's not perfect. Okay. So just to be sure that everyone understands, the data gets to cures through the dispensing pharmacy, not yes. through the doctor. Right, right. Right. But there can be a weak lag. Towards the yeah, the requirement is not you must submit at least once a week, and okay. some do. Thank you. Dr. Gunadadev? Thank you, Mr. Small. I, actually, your presentation is a lot, lot more what is real compared to when I read the slides. It was a little, I thought, at, at minimum, it was just somewhat inflammatory to the doctors, so that's what I just want to make sure I point out. But if an associate of mine or one of my residents wants to go and sign up for cures right this moment, how long does it take? Right now, uh, we have approximately a five to six week backlog to process the application. Uh, that's why I, we truly appreciate what your candor, what, what you presented, what the troubles with the system are. So that's why I want to make sure that public knows it gives frustration to the physician and false sense of security to the, uh, to the public. And if Prop, Proposition 46 passes, there is no way the system will, will look into anything. So the, it really worries me with the entire process here where physicians do want to know, but they want to know instantly what the patient is taking so that they can treat that patient appropriately. Right now, we can't even register in time. And these are busy practices. Uh, and usually you got 15 minutes to 20 minutes timeline for each patient. St read, examine, document, and do treatment. So all that has to be done. So I'm just trying to see how, how about if a pharmacist or a physician, physician, licensed physician in California, if you enter your name, your license number, and your California license, medical uh, driver's license, and your California res uh, the pra office practice, why can't the rest of it all get populated through the medical board or through the pharmacy board, and then immediately get that phys physician registered because you entered everything you need, including the DEA. So I'm just trying to see how can we make it easy? Uh, well. I like to tell my staff, uh, don't get too disheartened at our inability to actually um, uh, uh, serve the public as well as we'd like to because of these limitations. But at the same time, I think this defunding actually uh, created an opportunity for us. And the new statute is going to enable us to make those uh, IT uh, integration connections with your board's data to actually facilitate what you're talking about where that probably would have never come about before so it does take uh, you know money to do those things it's not that it's such innovative IT thinking it's just the uh, legislative will and the funding uh, uh, wherewithal to do it and now all the twain has meet in that respect and I think we're going to achieve that uh, so the, that's registration. Then getting the information, you, I think you mentioned that you can get there where you can supply that information before even a physician goes and sees that patient once your system is fully developed. Is that what I'm hearing? For those systems that we achieve the interoperability with, if they choose to go to the expense to want to transmit query data to us in bulk, the day before the appointment, we can get the cures data back. So it's in the system uh, when the doctor walks in the room. Yes, that's what we're aiming for. Dr. Kraus? Mr. Small, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, holding on by your uh, fingernails to cures because I think it's a very valuable resource and without your single-handed efforts, it 
could have been uh, buried and, and non-existent by now. <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, if you were told today that we want 100,000 practitioners registered and able to use cures, what date would you project that that could happen, assuming that you have the staff and the funding that you will acquire on July 1st? Well, let me put my response in the context is how soon in this project can we build the registration piece because it doesn't necessarily have to be the entire project delivered at once. And are we going to uh, concentrate on the registration component first? You bet. And uh, when exactly that will happen? Because I don't think throwing any additional money right now, we got a very generous amount uh, to build the system uh, after indirect costs. I think we got $3.3 .3 million to build the system. So I don't think I would ever complain that we didn't get enough money to do this. Um, and I think our first goal is to effectuate a uh, registration process that could accommodate any eventuality and because I am with the Attorney General's office and the Attorney General does title and summary for all the public uh, initiatives I can't comment too much on any specific uh, um, uh, situation that may force a, a uh, contracted enrollment period except to say I'm going to do my darn best to uh, meet anything that comes down the road but assuming that you don't acquire greater funding than that which you're expecting July 1st, how soon could you produce a, SIP to, a system that would be serving 100,000 new registrants? We, well, I'm not trying to evade your question altogether. What I'm saying is my hope is that I have a registration component built in time to uh, register, register any number of registrants in an automated way when exactly I can deliver that since we just barely brought our vendor on board and I don't even have the project manager hasn't come on board yet so we're just at the at the uh, outset of our build project I'm not ready to tell you exactly now but it's going to be as soon as it possibly can be and it's going to be the first component of the system that will be built can that occur in 2014 I I don't know. I'm, I really don't know. I, you know, because I don't like to blow smoke up you. So I don't, <laughs> you know, you know, it's going to be around uh, uh, winter, spring, but when exactly? And since we haven't formally kicked into gear, you know, with the vendor, uh, it's, it, I, I just be speculative. Is Cures 2.0 pre presently? running on a bench somewhere, or is it still in process of being designed? Oh, no, it's at the very throes of being designed. Uh, it's, well, we have requirements, and we had the document, the requirements document upon which uh, the technology agency approved the project, and upon which we had the, uh, the contract for the vendor was based upon. So we have the but those, you have to understand, are, are pretty high-level requirements. There's very, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, meeting and design and planning that has to go on to, to refine those down to a level where you really have a, a viable system working. And we've yet to approach that. Most contracts with vendors have timelines. What's the timeline with the vendor for a functional Gears 2.0? July of 2015. Thank you. Ms. Yaroslavsky. I, I too want to add my thanks for, for the work you do and the job you do and the job you're doing and going to continue doing. But um, it's unfortunately not meeting the needs of what we have currently today. And we all realize that. Yeah, so I, I realize that as well. I'm sure you do, better than most of us. Um, but if you were to look at the barriers to wider use, while you have a program currently, you're building a bigger program or a different program or a more involved and engaged program. Is the program that exists as it exists today convenient for um, the benefit of the people using it? Or is that being put aside in order to build a more effective program for the future? 
When I came on in December 2011, it was made very clear to me that um, changes to the existing system were frozen because there was not staff funding on the program side to do anything to it. Uh, therefore, uh, all I can do is recognize that it is not the best system in the universe. It is not uh, the friendliest system by any means. I get kicked out myself and it doesn't tell me, oh, your password expired. It kind of leaves you to your, your imagination what happened. And, um, and my joke to my colleagues is, if I tried as hard as I can to build a terrible system, I don't think I could meet this. So, so yes, are we saddled with something? Absolutely. Can I do something about it? No. Can I plan for the future? Yes. Yes, I can do that. Okay, so the system that has currently been used is not effective and is not functioning and well, is wait. not usable. Well, I, I wouldn't go to so far as to say it's not effective. I would okay. say those users who use it, that uh, they're very happy with it and they feel it is indispensable to them. And if it's indispensable to a user, then I wouldn't say it's not effective. Oh, no, absolutely. I apologize. It, 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 absolutely. So um, in the last two and a half years, have there, been there been, have there been changes to the existing system? No, as I said before, it's, it's basically been frozen. been frozen. I have been able to do a few cosmetic things. For instance, I did not like the wording on the user agreement, which tended to, uh, well, it did outright convey that a practitioner could not share the data with anybody else. And that's, I think, far from the intent of the system. I think a... I think if a pharmacist is looking at the data, he should darn well call up a doctor who prescribed uh, that medicine and say, hey, what the heck are you doing? You know, this guy's had the same thing from six other doctors. I think that's exactly what the system's for. So we changed that wording to uh, say that uh, you just must abide by uh, HIPAA and uh, CMIA, um, which I think is the appropriate uh, uh, limitations we want to place on the use of that data. So I've been able to do a couple things. But insofar as uh, an improvement that would really make the system uh, more user friendly, something that takes dedicated uh, IT resources and programming and, and uh, development and infrastructure, no. So what the barriers to um, having something functioning on the timeline that you've been articulating basically next summer, are there barriers that could be remedied by something to ensure that it will be more effective once next summer comes? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding so the question. You, in, in, more effective in what? Uh, you mean the, a more effective registration process? Or total, a more, total picture, that the system is totally functioning and working and people oh, are I think the system it. is going to be extraordinarily more effective when it's implemented. And the numbers of people that will be able to use it will be extraordinarily higher than they are currently? Absolutely. In and fact. the numbers that you have on slide number 23, with the um, participation levels denoted to certain specific professions, what percentage are those of the total population are they versus? Are you referring okay, so to that say? slide specific. So of the in the world of dentist, it says 3744. Uh, I hope I, I apologize. My eyes are pretty good, but not OK, within 100 or something. So it says 37,400 something dentist. Is that the current number of registered licensed oh, no, no, dentists? No, no, no. Are those the current uh, number of dentists no, currently being able to use the system? No, that's, that's a picture in time of the number of licensees the board conveyed to me. In other words, that's the potential population that could use cures, not, not the actual users. All I have is the total number of users, uh, which as of uh, June 27th was 20,211. So is the to are the numbers up there, the licensees prioritized at all as to those that would prescribe opioids or not, or are they the total population of the profession? I can't believe that every single dentist in the state of California prescribes opioids or would be, you know. It, it, the, the population is those who, um, who have a DEA license. Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out. And that is what's represented, well, 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 
that's an estimate of that. Actually, it's, not, it's worse than that. That's actually the total number of licensees the board's conveyed to me. Right. And it's the only that's baseline I could. That's concern, exactly. Right. It's the only baseline I could use mm -hmm. um, because. Uh, you don't have DEA information. So within no. the system, is there a way of, of, of having tools that would allow you to have a more realistic ability to I, I don't know I mean what I'm trying to figure out is that we have a huge number over there some of them maybe need to use it maybe some don't the thing being is how is it being prioritized so that next summer that the people of the state of California have some kind of confidence that the prescribers that are prescribing are able to participate in this one tool and my understanding is that this is not the end-all and be-all to fixing the problem of opioid over prescribing at all so this is just a tool Maybe I can help. Thank you. Um, so, as of so, um, like any remodeling project, um, we're building a new house here. So the, we're not doing any upgrades to the existing. We're going to scrape it and build a new one. And between July of 2015, which is your estimate of when that house will be ready for occupancy, and December 31st, 2015 the law requires that anyone in any of those categories with a DEA number has to be registered on the system. And so over the course of that six month period of time, hopefully we have six months, um, as I understand from this, the flat file will produce everything that the boards currently have. The physician will have to register, log in, put in their DEA number and whatever, a small number of other pieces of information will get a password and will be registered on the system complying with the law. Um, and that, that's the minimum and, and able then to you to query the system, which should be able to give rapid, which will be able to give rapid feedback on any information that has been submitted on the patient by any pharmacies that have dispensed a, a narcotic to that patient. And the law, re the law requires, and hopefully we can deliver, 100% of DEA number license holders in any of those categories um, to be registered by the end of 2015. It's a tight time frame. So within the framework of building a house, which I really do understand, kind of, um, you usually use um, certain parties that have an expertise in certain fields within building that house. So has there been any discussion of having some kind of partnership within the licensing boards or the enforcement boards or the DC, I, I'm, I'll go as high as you want, with helping your entity get registered and get? Oh, believe me, uh, we are tied at the hip with DCA. We, we are. They are, they are in the joint steering committee, the executive level of the project. Mm -hmm. All uh, board staff uh, participate in our joint application development sessions. So we get their input as to their needs and their wants for, for the I'm system. I'm trying to get you past the needs and wants and trying to get you some extra hands on, on deck. So what I'm asking you basically no, is. Wait a, minute, wait a minute. What I'm telling you is mm -hmm. there is full participation by TCA and the board staffs in this build. Okay, so they that everyone are, will be at the table. Ms. Yaroslavsky, um, we actually have three individuals who are sitting in those JAD sessions, as Mr. Small just um, stated, and I also sit on the executive steering committee okay, good. Um, on the project. So make sure that everyone's going to give you the help that you need because I realize that you've got a huge job in front of you. I also realize that the monies have been twisted and turned and massaged, and it's not only money that goes to make this difference, but I'm concerned also that I've been hearing about this problem for quite a while, and it just seems that it's continues, it's, it's not going away. So I feel, I don't take it, for, it's not about you, it's about the system that's not allowing you to get your work done is all my concern, and the clock is ticking. I understand. So I just want you to know, I'm very supportive, I just feel no, that, no, you know, I'm, it's and not I'm, being fixed. I'm telling you that, uh, um, um, when I got this assignment and 
Here's a little bit of background. I have no expertise in this whatsoever. Uh, when the uh, Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement and my Bureau, the Bureau of Investigation, were cut, um, and then I came over to Information Justice Systems, and, and I have a couple other large programs I'm responsible for. And I think uh, they realize, oh my gosh, no one has, no one is shepherding cures. So um, I'm clearly the uh, DOJ employee nearest to end of life in my department. And so they gave me the cures program, uh, despite my lack of uh, expertise. Um, it's probably a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah, well, it's been a really good thing for me. Um, and um, I, I could tell you, though, from my past narcotic intelligence experience that this was immediately a uh, challenge that I embraced because all the years I've wasted my time trying to do this drug war fight where, which is completely unwinnable because the insatiable appetite of the American public for illicit drugs these are controlled products and it's the doctor and the pharmacist that decides whether they get out into the public realm or not. And it's the quantities that are made available that have very much to do with the levels of morbidity and mortality associated. So I see this as something that uh, not is only uh, attainable, but something that I think is worthy of all of our joint collaborative mutual efforts and employing all of the relevant uh, forces that can bear onto it. And I was aghast that our public health officers don't have the data they need to uh, uh, look at this in a disciplined way. And so there are some things we're going to do besides just fix the system to deliver to the practitioners. Um, uh, it is important to try and find those patients who have been iatrogenically addicted, but it's more important to prevent that addiction in the first place. Just one last question, and that is, um, what is the re engagement or um, participation by the drug companies? Either in financing I'm not aware of any. Or, pardon me? I'm not aware of any. Thank you. Um, Dr. Krause, Dr. Lewis, and then I have couple quick ones. Go ahead. And I think. So, so again, I want to reiterate that we are interested, supportive partners in this whole process. Uh, you know, in my practice, I probably write two narcotic prescriptions a year. Uh, but recently, I had a young woman who was assaulted and had an orbital fracture, and I was scheduling her for surgery. And she says, doctor, I'm in pain. I'm going to be in more pain when you operate on me. What can you do for me? Uh, and of course, Vicodin wasn't the answer for her. And she wanted Percocets, and I gave her a prescription for 10 Percocets with one renewal, and she didn't show up for surgery. So it occurred to me that this woman may have been spending the last week since she had her fortunate injury visiting a lot of doctors for a lot of prescriptions. And even if I had been a registrant on cures, there would have been no way with this woman sitting in my office that I could have accessed the data that, right. would, have, that would have allowed me to prevent myself from being victimized. Yeah. There are bad doctors who try to make a lot of money selling prescriptions, but there are a heck of a lot more doctors who are being taken advantage of by drug-seeking patients. And that's why we, the majority of physicians, need the Cures database so that we can look real time. I cannot agree with you more. And in fact, I would say my end game, what I see as a perfect world, is that cures always exist for you because even if we don't have drug-seeking patients, you need to know whether uh, if the entire drug picture is there for you, you can tell if something you're contemplating prescribing is not contraindicated, even if, even if the drug-seeking patients go away. My goal is that we do eliminate the drug-seeking patients and, um, and... Will 2.0 be a, a real-time system? No, in the sense that when you real time is real time ingestion of data processing and making it available. If we have legislation that only allows us to accept every seven days at the max, we cannot possibly have a 
real-time system even if we plan for it. We are building a system to accept data in real-time, but we cannot ever say it's a real-time system because we need legislation to say that the pharmacist needs to transmit that data when, when the patient walks away with that medicine. And we don't have that authority. Thank you. Dr. Lewis. <clears throat> yes, I'm going to make this brief in the interest of time, but um, when we look at some disciplinary cases and uh, we get information from uh, the DAG and, um, and you know, the Minister of Law does, sometimes the comments are, um, did not consult the CURES database. And we see that. And so, but the public, um, and my question uh, asks is, does the public, or is the public a partner in this, um, in these discussions for them to understand the, the difficulties of that database um, and understand it, it will get there, but it's not perfect. We want to protect the public, the consumer, that's our ultimate mission, but until we get there in real time, it's, it's just not perfect. And I'm wondering if you are in discussions with consumer protection groups to keep them informed of, of these encumbrances, these barriers, so that they have a better understanding appreciation. Well, let me say this. I'm uh, too low of a pay grade to do advocacy on behalf of my department, uh, but you can bet my advocates know everything I think. And uh, we have those kinds of discussions all the time. And let me just uh, make a comment about the imperfection of the system. Because uh, even in real time, the system will always be imperfect. The data in the system is only as good as transmitted to us by the pharmacist. And there could be bad actors at play, even in a real-time system. We could have bad patients that are forging scripts. We can have bad doctors that are diverters. And then we could even have bad pharmacists that might uh, misrepresent what they actually did in the script. So the data will not ever be always perfect, but it's great, uh, it's great indicator data. It's not, it never meets the standard of evidence itself. My investigators who are doing uh, diversion cases make great use of my system to go f actually collect those scripts from the pharmacy so they actually have evidence that cuts their investigation time by thousands of hours, but they can't use it as the, as the uh, uh, evidence itself. Um, I'm personally aware of one poor fellow who uh, had a little accident, broke his leg very, very, very badly mangled his leg, doctor says, can't give you any pain relievers because you have too big of a cures history. And he's there, huh, what? Well, in reality, it turned out his brother had stolen his medical identity, and his brother was very much an abuser using his name to get the drugs. So it still takes your professional estimation in the total of all the information you're looking at, and you can't just rely on cures in any one instance to be perfect because it never will be, and I never want to portray the system as such. Um, I, I just have, uh, first of all, I, I, I want to, someone said, and maybe I can't remember who, that for those who do use the system, it's invaluable, and uh, certainly emergency physicians who are registered and use it frequently, um, you know, have fought long and hard to get funding to improve the system. So uh, no one should leave here with the impression that. Yeah. And, and it's nice, it's also comforting that those emergency room settings that use the data the most, they have been on the forefront of creating a protocol so all the ERs in that county follow the same prescribing protocol. And they've had great success in, in, uh, 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 in turning away and, and, and then the uh, drug-seeking patients don't even go to those emergency settings anymore because they know they're not going to get. They won't get more than three days worth that's of right. meds. That's yeah. right. And no refills. Yeah. Second, uh, and, and just a question, um, response time for a registered user in the ED um, querying cures, what's the response time getting information back from the system? It could be anywhere from uh, just a moment to, and I have to be honest with you, because I've uh, ran some people, uh, 
that, that law enforcement was looking at, and they had uh, extremely long, over 50-page histories, and the systems actually crashed on me trying to get that back. So I'm not going to give you any one firm time, but usually in the existing system, it's, it could be anywhere from moments to never. And uh, uh, what could even be worse is trying to sign in. I think the biggest problem doctors face is the darn system, your, your, it seems like your password expires every second breath, and uh, then it's harder than heck to get the thing reestablished. Re That's, to me, is the most frustrating part of the system. And I can tell you right now, I do not enjoy spending three hours of my day just helping people get back on the system. And do you have an end users group that informing the JAD process or working with you? Uh, we do have a stakeholder group of practitioners that we had a, I wouldn't call it a formal JAD session, but we had a stakeholder session, and uh, that was established by when our Office of Legislative Affairs, uh, during the course of the legislative life cycle, um, all the interested parties' invitations went out, and and by word of mouth from uh, the various lobbyists and, 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 and those who are directly involved in that, uh, we had about 50 physicians and pharmacists at that stakeholder meeting. Uh, you recall that, yeah. And uh, that, that was, uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, that information is figuring into you know, our designs, yes. My, my suggestion would be that that not be a one-time event, that as you move down the sure. design Sure, and I process. do have, I have some very prominent physicians, especially for our interoperability JAD sessions coming up. I have Kyleen and Chan from University of California, Davis, because they have worked with MITRE, with the ONC, um, on trying to develop the pilot uh, interoperability for PDMPs, uh, uh, trying to develop the um, uh, uh, standard system. And I've been engaged with them, and I definitely want California system to work with them so we're not only adhering to the national standard, but we, we basically are the national standard. And uh, there's a number of other, there's Dr. Uh, Christopher Wade, who's basically one of the head IT guys for Kaiser System. He's gonna be, he's been, we've been in close touch with him and he's gonna be involved in that JAD session as well, as well as a few other uh, docs. Okay, um, any? May I ask one more question? Quick one. Every website uh, in every server bank has a utilization capacity, uh, which if it's exceeded, the website shuts down, the system crashes. Have you discovered what the, the utilization capacity is of the present CURE system? Uh, I'm not a technologist, uh, so I can't tell you in, uh, in any exact terms, except I would categorize the existing system as fragile. And uh, certainly, uh, we're not going to use the, uh, the, the foundational architecture or the features of the existing system for the new. I can promise you that. Um, it's uh, not worth building upon, and we're, not, we're going to abandon that. Can I ask if there are any questions or comments from members of the audience here? Seeing none, um, are there any on the phone? Are there any individuals on the phone who'd like to speak? And, and pardon me, uh, if you did uh, queue up to ask a question, please press star then one again to queue up for a question. And pardon me, just a moment, please. We have a question or comment from the line of Genevieve Palvru. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, this is Genevieve Travel. Just a moment, please. Comment from the line of Genevieve Travel. Yes, you know, I have, I have this is Genevieve Travel. I'm very concerned of the way with the two program, they are more efficient program who can, are up to the minute almost in the uh, in, uh, information. I, uh, I think we are looking at the antiquated system, and we're losing time. 
all the time, and I wonder why some research and obsess me. I've got me made to obsess, you know, as a program, especially like the one in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma State, which I have brought to your attention a long, long time ago. And, you know, why are we hanging on to the cure program? And if you're going to take five to six weeks to even be inputted in a program, that's huge. That's such a loss of time and energy. So I would like somebody who does more intensive research. And also I'm surprised that the cure system is under the Department of Defense, I mean of Justice, when all the other states, they do not come under the Department of Justice. Those are my two cents. I'm sorry, I don't know if the entirety of that. So the, the, uh, I understand her, her last comment was, why is it under the Department of Justice? And I think the answer is because it is. Yeah. Um, there, well, yeah. there's a historical basis for that. There are several states, seven states, that the, uh, the PDMP is housed in the department in the law enforcement sector. Uh, that is because those states' longstanding commitment to diversionary problems uh, California is the longest continuously running prescription drug monitoring program since 1939. Uh, there is a vested and uh, uh, law enforcement interest in drug diversion. Uh, there always will be. Um, and, and when the uh, problem of uh, patient misuse and abuse of drugs subsides to an acceptable level, whatever that is, there will always still be crooks at heart and there will always be diversion. So I would propose that law enforcement agencies are not a bad shepherd of a prescription drug monitoring system and then perhaps they're the ideal one because they can cater to the law enforcement needs as well as to the uh, public health and, and the, uh, to the uh, prescribing and uh, dispensing communities. Um, there are many other states that the systems are housed even in the public health department and yet the uh, I haven't seen as much aggressiveness in dealing this this in a public health way even in those settings. So I would say we're not really uh, at a loss for having California Department of Justice host this system. And I think our interest is less in terms of where it lives and more in terms of how it serves the needs of the multiple constituencies that, that have a legitimate and important use of the data. And I, I think Jean-Vivre's other question was, um, uh, or comment was about um, uh, other systems that seem to work well and why have we you know, looked at them um, in the process of designing the new system, at least that's what I heard. And she has in, in previous meetings pointed that out. Sure. And I understand that, but uh, the, the most important factor I see in uh, the few systems that work extremely well is they have a lot more money, and they've actually attacked it earlier. Uh, it's not really conceptually a difficult uh, program nor information technology challenge. It's just whether we, as uh, the state, have the desire and the will to do it, and we finally have uh, the legislative directive to do that, and we're going to proceed. And uh, could we do it without that? And the answer is simply no. Thank you very much. Are there other comments, questions on the phone? There are another, uh, no other comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Small. Thank you, and good evening. Are you okay? <laughs> I will be. <laughs> Great, let's move on to our, our next uh, presentation. Ms. Katie is going to uh, follow up cures with a presentation on physician impairment. I'm hoping you got all your questions out of the way. <laughs> this is agenda item five for those of you who are following the materials.
At the last meeting, a member requested information on what the board does in cases where a physician has a mental illness diagnosis. This request was followed, uh, followed the discussion of legislation sponsored by CMA to establish a physician assistance program within the medical board to provide services for physicians dealing with substance abuse and mental illness. Although this legislative effort was unsuccessful, members did raise the question about what resources uh, are available to, physician, to the physician community to provide services and support for physician wellness. Hospitals and large health systems are required by joint commission and by state le regulation to have a wellness or a well-being committee. The overall purpose and mandate of the well-being committee is to support the personal health of, of the practitioner and to facilitate rehabilitation rather than discipline. The role of these committees is to assist physicians with matters related to the prevention of impairment and the maintenance of health with a focus on substance abuse, mental illness, and behavioral issues. The Joint Commission requires that well-being committees provide a process for self-referrals by the practitioner as well as a mechanism for referrals by others which maintain the confidentiality of the informant. The committee offers the practitioner referrals to internal and external resources for evaluation, diagnosis, and treatment of their condition and maintains the confidentiality of the practitioner seeking the referral. Well-being committees are charged with monitoring the practitioner and the safety of patients until the rehabilitation is complete. Physicians who work in hospitals or within larger health systems can get the help that they need, but private practitioners do not have access, the same access to these resources. To that end, some medical soci specialty societies and component societies of CMA have also established well-being committees for their members. CMA also offers a 24-hour confidential assistance line for physicians who need help with problems of alcoholism, drug dependency, or mental illness. This service is free and is staffed with physicians who have experience dealing with these issues. The Pacific Assistance Group was established after the board's diversion program was sunsetted. This group provides drug and alcohol rehabilitation, which includes consultation, support groups, monitoring services, and referrals for comprehensive treatment and fitness for duty evaluations for physicians, and is used as a resource for physician employers and for hospitals. Physicians in California also have access to several well-known substance abuse treatment centers, such as Betty Ford, Hazelton, or the Professionals Treatment at the Promises Treatment Center, to, to name just a few. Finally, all physicians have access to well-trained medical specialists who can provide individual treatment and therapy for substance abuse and mental illness. In addition, in addition to the treatment options currently available to physicians, the board does offer several voluntary options to limit or restrict a physician's license during periods where the physician may not be in a position to provide full and unrestricted care to his or her patients. A physician can apply to change their license from active to disabled status. The application requires a certification from the licensee's treating physician indicating that he or she cannot practice medicine either on a temporary or a permanent basis. In order to return the license to active status, the treating physician must certify that the disability no longer impacts the physician's ability to practice. Another option available to physicians is to request a voluntary limitation on their practice which would allow the individual to continue to practice medicine but with limitations that they or their physician identifies. While there are options available to a physician to seek treatment for substance abuse or mental illness without board in intervention, once a complaint has been filed with the board, we are obligated to investigate and take disciplinary action if so indicated. During the last fiscal year, we received 102 complaints alleging the physician was impaired by either substance abuse or mental illness. With a total of 7,400 complaints received during this same time period, 
This equates to only 1% of all the complaints filed with the board. You can see that the number of administrative actions taken for allegations of physician impairment have remained fairly consistent throughout the past 10 years and constitute about 18% of the total disciplinary actions taken by the board each year. Once disciplinary action has been taken against the physician for impairment due to substance abuse, the board typically orders terms and conditions designed to monitor the physician's compliance with recovery, such as abstention from the use of drugs and alcohol, biological fluid testing, um, psychiatric and medical evaluations, and psychotherapy. Under the new disciplinary guidelines for substance abusing licensees, a physician may also be required to attend group support meetings and engage a worksite monitor. Once action is taken against a physician who has been diagnosed with a mental illness, the board orders terms and conditions designed to monitor the physician's compliance with treatment for the diagnosed condition, such as psychiatric and medical evaluations, psychotherapy, uh, a practice monitor, and conditions which prevent the physician from practicing alone. We use a variety of conditions to monitor the physician's compliance with their recommended treatment, and we do have the ability to require additional psychiatric or medical evaluations whenever it appears that the physician may be non-compliant with their recovery efforts, or when it appears that the physician has altered their treatment regime, like not taking their prescribed meds. Since 2012, the disciplinary guidelines have allowed the board to issue a cease practice order based on a positive biological fluid test. With this tool, the probation unit can quickly remove a physician from practice should it appear that the physician is non-compliant with their recovery. However, physicians placed on probation for impairment due to mental illness are much more difficult for the probation unit to manage and to monitor. BNP Code Section 2229 requires the board, whenever possible, to take action that is calculated to rehabilitate the licensee with the caveat that protection of the public is the highest priority. In the majority of administrative actions taken against physicians with mental illness issues, the outcome typically results in a revocation or a license surrender, but the guidelines do allow us to place the physician on probation. So in preparation for this presentation, I looked at the history and success of physicians on probation with mental illness diagnoses. There were six cases over the past four years that have been conducted or have been concluded so a post-mortem could be conducted. In all six cases, the physicians were ordered uh, to undergo an evaluation pursuant to Section 820 and were found to be unsafe to practice due to mental illness. ISOs were issued, and in all six cases, a stipulated agreement was reached to settle the case and place the physician on probation with the conditions that have been outlined in the disciplinary guidelines. In five of these cases, in five of these cases the physician's condition was not stabilized and the physician was not compliant with the prescribed medication regime, and a second action was taken resulting in revocation or surrender. The decline in these physicians' conditions occurred between about six months and two years after they had been placed on probation. And two of the five physicians were actively practicing medicine during that time. One of the six cases could be considered a success story, though. This physician came to the board's attention because he had been arrested several times for psychotic and erratic behavior. In this particular case, approximately 18 months had elapsed between the issuance of the ISO and the resolution of the administrative action. In that intervening time period, the physician began seeing a psychiatrist, was properly diagnosed, and was stabilized on medication. The physician returned to active practice and has had no uh, compliance issues on probation. The probation monitors will meet with physicians face-to-face -face every three months and receive reports from their treating physicians um, and their practice monitors every three months. If a physician's treatment regime is not well established or if the physician is not compli compliant with their medication, it may be difficult to ensure that the public is being adequately protected. The probation monitor looks for signs that the physician's condition is not stable 
but they're not, they're not medical professionals, nor are they trained law enforcement personnel. It can be difficult to discern whether the physician is just being difficult because of the stress associated with being placed on probation or whether the physician is suffering from a setback. The physician can be ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation anytime there is concern about their fitness for practice, but unless that evaluator finds the physician to be unsafe, no action can be taken to remove that physician from practice. In conclusion, I, there are situations where I believe that probation is appropriate to monitor a physician whose condition is stable and their treatment regime is well established. Physicians who do not meet this criteria might be better served by allowing them time to focus on their health and well-being without the demands of patient care and the stress of being on a board-ordered probation. The law allows a physician who has surrendered or lost their license due to mental illness or physical illness to petition the board for reinstatement after one year has elapsed rather than the three years required by most other uh, types of violations. This alternative may be more valuable to ensure physician well-being than placing the doctor on probation. However, the best option would be for the physician to find treatment prior to coming to the attention of the board and voluntarily placing their license in disabled or limited practice status prior to the board receiving a complaint. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Katie. Um, do I have any questions? Yeah, I just Ms. Have, I have one question that was excellent. Thank you very much for the presentation. I just had one question, and that was, um, how is this information disseminated, the ability for a doctor to apply for a disabled license or voluntary limitation on practice? Um, we do have that information on our website. It's one of the, the standard license status changes that can occur. Going into retired status is another license status change. But I don't, I'm not aware that we do any other further advertisement of that, of that um, option really good point. I wonder if we maybe should have, did you know, kind of a thing that, uh, in sure. our newsletter. Because I mean, good, very good I know point. that someone asked the question last night and I just remembered, I don't know who it was, so I apologize for stepping on whoever's toes asked about it last night. But I, Great it's a good, I, mean, I think it would be helpful to have okay. more information out there about it. I, I, I have one question for sure. you. On the, I uh, hope I didn't cut anybody off. Mm -hmm. On the chart that shows the relative stability of the number of, um, administrative actions for sub self substance abuse mm -hmm. or self-use and mental illness um, between 2002 and 2013. Mm -hmm. um, there's no denominator. Do you, can you, it would be helpful to see the size of the licensee. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Community. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, the, the, the fact that the absolute numbers have gone up, they kind of fluctuate actually, mm -hmm. but in some ways, I see that as a good sign that um, somebody's report being reported and actions mm -hmm. being taken, mm -hmm. and the disappearance, and that may also correlate with the emergence or, or the sunsetting of the diversion program. Um, mm -hmm. But um, we do want to encourage mm -hmm. both treatment and also yes. uh, reporting. But again, this variation is kind of like this. Yes. Well, you did mention, though, I, I do remember hearing that you said that this year it was approximately 1% of, of the, the complaints. complaints. So, I, right, I'm just that's saying. That's not, not the not denominator, the but still, that was Agreed. a much lower yeah. number than I even expected. Yeah. So I thought that was very right. important to remember. Uh, this is the first time I heard about the disabled license or voluntary limitations of license. How, when they apply, what do they do for, uh, they disclose? what, why they're applying for, and then when they want to go back to active practice other than a certificate from their attending physician, what else they need to do? I mean, this is, this is not uh, widely known. That's why I'm just curious. The application is fairly benign. So the physician initiates the, the request to um, change their license status. The attending physician will provide, I believe, some very generic information about what the condition is and basically the length of, of time, either it's a temporary disability or it's a permanent disability. The board tends not to follow up if, if your concern is that you look at the, the disability and, and pursue action, they're handled separately. It's a license status versus enforcement. Um, 
the the return that the return from disabled to um, active status is strictly the reverse. It's a very benign. The the attending physician says this person is capable of practicing or fit for practice, and the license status is changed. So there's no other. And Kurt may. So uh, am I am I on target, Kurt? Yeah, you're pretty much. On target. <laughs> so once. Take an example. I mean, these are important because if you want to convince the medical staff to do this, they got they got to know the details. Uh, once somebody applies for the disabled license status, and we grant it, mm -hmm. and uh, a month later you get a complaint about what happened six months ago about this pe this person with the drug abuse or substance abuse. So how does the licensing and the enforcement? Uh, they, do they work, they work on that? In, in all candor, if someone has, sub, has changed their, their license status to disabled status and the enforcement program gets a, a complaint um, about that physician, we're going to continue to, it, it follows the same track that any other complaint would follow, regardless of whether they're currently in disabled status or not. Any other board members have questions or comments? Members of the public, questions for Miss Katie. Are there any questions on the phone? We have no, we have no questions on the phone. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to the um, president's report. Um, and um, I, I was not able to attend the May meeting, and so I'm going to incorporate, and I will be brief, I promise all of you, <laughs> I will incorporate in my, in my report um, some information from the Federation of State Medical Board meeting in April, uh, which Ms. Kirkmeyer, Ms. Wright, and I attended, um, because I think it's important information for the board. Um, in general, I'm, we've been, I've been very pleased that Mr. Serrano Sewell has joined me on our every two week or sometimes more frequent uh, calls with the executive team of the medical board. Um, they've been very helpful um, for us and I hope for the staff in terms of preparing us for the board meetings and helping the staff to get direction on things in terms of work. Um, we, um, the, um, I want to talk a bit about, as I said, the issue of the um, Federation of State Medical Board meetings, meeting. And there are two major issues, one of which I'm going to describe and one which Ms. Kirkmeyer will talk about in her executive director report, which are separate but actually quite interde interdependent. And the first is the issue of telehealth and telemedicine. And the second is the issue of um, state licensure versus federal licensure. And the connection between the two of them is that the telecommunications industry sees an enormous opportunity in um, leveraging physicians to provide telehealth services across state lines and perhaps across country borders even. Um, and the current model of state licensure in the, in the U.S. means that if you're taking care of a patient in California, you need a California license. So there has been intense lobbying at the federal level and in many states to uh, reverse, the, reverse the requirement for state licensure and to, and to approve a national, federal licensure. Federation of State Medical Boards has an alternative approach, which Ms. Kirkmeyer is um, going to um, describe, but the, the Federation has also taken, um, taken this on and put out a position paper uh, or a model policy for the appropriate use of telemedicine technologies in the practice of medicine. And that was published in April of 2014 subsequent. And do we have copies for the? Yes, everybody should. Everybody should have a copy of this and there should be copies in the back. Um, the, I'm not going to go through this 10-page, 12-page document, but the, the core of it is that the policy um, supported by every state is that the practice of medicine um, occurs where the patient resides, not where the physician is physically located. And the critical issue for us as a, as a medical board is 
To do anything other than that would be to literally separate the licensing and enforcement functions. So um, California consumers treated by through telehealth by a physician licensed in Wisconsin or the District of Columbia or with an quotes national license, who would that who to whom would that consumer bring concerns about the physician? Um, we would be able to license physicians in California. We would have no recourse if those physicians licensed in California were creating mischief somewhere else. And so the, the, it is our belief that it is, it is critical to keep, to maintain the connection between licensure and enforcement. And um, the, the Federation of State Medical Boards and each of the individual medical boards have supported that position. And we have made that um, clear to the sponsors of federal legislation, uh, which attempted to redefine, uh, it was one piece of federal legislation which attempted to redefine the practice of medicine as uh, where the physician, occurring where the physician was located um, and licensed. And so um, we've been quite successful actually in making the case. Um, that this is not a good thing for consumers and that the state medical boards feel very strongly about their obligation to um, protect consumers by being able to both license and enforce actions against physicians. Um, and the Federation, as I said, has come up with an alternative approach would f which would facilitate um, the light, it would facilitate licensure in more than one venue, but it would still require licensure in each venue in which the physician intended to, um, to um, practice. Um, and I'm, I, before I turn this over to Ms. Kirkmeyer, um, I, I want to say this is, this is my last meeting as president of the medical board. We will follow this with elections. And I just want to share with all of you, the members of the board, um, in front of our, our public members, what a privilege it has been to serve as your president, how much I have learned from all of you, how much I have appreciated um, the confidence you placed in me and, as I said, the collegiality and, and the learnings I have gained from you. It's been a great pleasure and I'm not leaving. I'm just going to be sitting in a different seat from here on in. Um, but we have, you know, and I think we have, we have accomplished a lot in the last two years. We have really I think been focused, we have gone through sunset review, we have looked critically at ourselves, and we have taken action, maybe not as fast as some would like, but we have taken action in areas where um, it is pretty clear that we needed to, to, to up our game, if you will. Um, we've begun the outpatient surgery task force with a, with a clear commitment to raise the standards for accrediting um, those uh, outpatient surgery sites in which, which we have jurisdiction over. Uh, we've started great work on addressing the, the um, epidemic of opioid abuse and our um, Dr. Bishop and Ms. Yaroslavsky have done wonderful work in leading the prescribing task force. Um, we've got some great PSAs by Dr. Bishop, who's our TV star, um, and um, Natalie Coughlin, um, a, a wonderful, two wonderful PSAs that have been widely used across the state um, and that are available on our website. Um, and again, I just want to thank all of you um, for your help and support. And I'm going to turn this now over to Ms. Kirkmeyer. Well, thank you. And I'd actually like to indulge the uh, chair's prerogative to actually skip in my report, actually to. Should we, uh, call for Any public comments on my report? Here's long enough. Members of the audience, any comments on the phone? Sorry, I forgot that was an official agenda item. We have none on the phone. Thank you. So going back, I would actually like to skip to 8G, if that's OK, since that's what we're kind of talking about. Um, and so on uh, the on page 8F, I think it is actually, it's, I'm skipping to G, 8F1, is a staff report requesting a board policy statement on state licensure for telehealth. 
Um, as Dr. Levine has stated, this is actually an issue right now. We've had a couple pieces of federal legislation that have come up. And if they were introduced and enacted, it would basically allow physicians in another state to practice via telemedicine without requiring additional state licensure where the patient is resides. Um, HR 3077, which was actually a current bill right now that's out there and, and it hasn't been finalized, but it's, it's currently a bill. It would actually allow a Medicare provider licensed in any state to treat any Medicare beneficiary in another state via telemedicine without being licensed at the state where the patient is located. And so California law actually requires that physicians who treat patients in California, whether through face-to-face -face office visits or via telemedicine, they actually have to be licensed in California. Um, so just to, to kind of cut down on what I was going to say, the, basically what has happened is when these bills come up that are federal pieces of legislation, we usually don't take positions on these bills, but what we would actually like as staff for both Ms. Samoz and myself to make our job a little bit easier is that there was actually a board policy. As Dr. Levine, she outlined all of the problems that we run into when the physician isn't licensed in the state. And so we would like to, um, a, there was a proposed policy statement that was just handed out. We've edited it a little bit from the report that's in the um, board agenda and we would actually like to adopt have the board adopt this policy and then we could use this in the future to write to the um, legislature to Congress basically and encourage them and the representatives encourage them to not do these kind of bills so the policy statement would be that the Medical Board of California believes that the practice of medicine occurs where the patient resides at the time of the physician patient telehealth encounter and therefore requires the physician to be under the jurisdiction of state medical board where the patient resides sides. Um, this letter, just so you know, this information, we did put a letter together to send it to um, Representative Mike Thompson. He had a bill that was in draft form. We put it out there. I don't think that we were the only one. We can't take the credit 100%. I think there were several individuals, but his bill now has been actually changed significantly and there's no licensure issue in the bill. Um, I think it's important that we follow federal legislation because the last thing we want is to be somewhere where we don't want to be by accident. Um, and so if we could uh, have a motion, motion for this policy. So moved. Second. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, potential misunderstanding of the word resides. Mm -hmm. uh, as phrased in agenda item 8F, it uses the word where the patient is located. Uh, and I think that would be a, a better wording so that there isn't confusion at some later date. So I had a concern about located, and here was my concern. Um, and I may, you may all vote me down, but um, my patient is in New York, calls me up. Um, my, you know, my asthma, my daughter's asthma is out of control. I, the, the, they lost my luggage. I don't have my Ventolin inhaler, my daughter's Ventolin inhaler. Under, currently, um, I would call, not a physician, but a pharmacy, give them my medical license number, my office number, my office location, my DEA number, and they will allow a courtesy fill of the prescription um, so that my patient, I mean, the alternative is to send her to an emergency room. Um, under loca located, I would not be able to do that. And so that's why I suggested resides. Um, I, Can we use the word domicile or is that too legalist? <laughs> County where you reside. Yeah, yeah official. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Then, then you might consider reside or is currently located uh, because you know many of my patients reside outside of California. Uh, and they come and they see me in California and I provide services for them in California, but they don't reside here. So perhaps you would consider a revision to uh, where to the patient both. resides or is currently located. Sure. Mm -hmm. Dr. Levine, is, is, your, uh, um, is your intent or is the policy's intent to just state where that encounter, that telemed encounter has occurred, the, the location of that? or the residence, the official residence of the patient? It, uh, actually, what, I'm tr what I think our intent is California licensed physicians treating their own patients who live in or come to them in California, whether it's face-to-face -face or by telehealth. I, 
that's, you know, we want California licensed physicians to be treating patients, their own patients, through telehealth or through face-to-face -face visits. Those patients may live in California or they may be coming to California. Uh, but there's an established relationship, and maybe we don't have the language perfectly yet. We're trying to make sure is that the patient, wherever they live, if the patient is living in California and is being treated by a doctor because it's easier via telemedicine, be it India or New York, that doctor is not licensed in the state of California. It's a new patient contact. Telehealth was meant to promote the uh, ability of doctors to have referrals for specialties that were not maybe necessarily available. So the object is, is how do we protect California residents and California doctors at the same time as not limiting their ability to practice medicine? We're not really here to protect the ability of a New York doctor to practice. We are here to protect California doctors and California consumers. So as long California. as the consumer is in the state of California, regardless of where they're living, they're seeing a California doctor that's licensed in California. When you take it on the reverse, we're still dealing with the licensing and the discipline of the license of the California doctor. And therefore, the consumer that's being treated by the California doctor, it's because the California doctor is here. We're, we're dealing it from that. We're not trying to fix the whole problem for everybody. So I think that we need to keep in perspective what telehealth was all about and what the purpose was. It was not so that you could be wearing your Google Glass and get a a test and a doctor treatment on the airplane in the last, you know, come on. So we can't fix everything. So that's, we have to figure out what, what the problem is and what we're trying to. Carrie, uh, did you have some suggestions? I just, given the discussion, I, I do want to point out that, that laws will vary from state to state. And we have a code section on this. It's Business and Professions Code 2060, status of non-resident practitioners. And so a physician from another state may not provide care to a patient in California, whether there's an ongoing relationship between that doctor and, and patient. And so I just, I want to make sure that. It, but they can apply under certain kinds of situations when they're providing um, yeah. health care in a fair situation they've applied for a special permit. There are very select exceptions. Right, exactly, exactly, exactly. So maybe we need to think through the language. We know what we, what we want to do, Howard. So what I hear is that under current law, if you were a New York physician with a patient with a problem in Los Angeles, you would not be able to call a Los Angeles pharmacy to have a prescription filled. Apparently that's the case, right? But that's not the, the, the problem that we're trying to fix. That. I understand that there may be a difference between common practice and the letter of the law. But given the discussion, I wanted everyone to keep in mind that this is a statute on the books in California. Okay. But in general, I would go back to the issue that I'm more concerned about where the patient is when the service is provided than I am concerned with what their primary residence is. And what, what uh, Dr. Krause's point is exactly correct, and I don't think you're saying two different things exactly. Yeah. The issue is if the pr patient is here in California seeing a California doctor, we're fine, regardless of where that person's domicile is, they're currently here. And if the California patient is out of state and has a California doctor, the California doctor, as you suggested, would be able to call the pharmacy and for an emergency kind of a situation, well, hopefully would be able to work. The issue is that's n neither one of those are the issue. The issue is for the patient that is in California seeking treatment via telemedicine from a doctor out of state. The That's Federation is trying to make it, I think, so that in this virtual world of reality, wherever the patient is and wherever the doctor is, it doesn't really matter. What they want is a national license and they want national. So that what we're trying to do is make sure that for the patient coming, the consumer in California and the doctor in California, that we don't have any, we have a seamless ability to treat. So I think if we keep the, the focus, focus more narrow, and if Dr. Krauss suggested to just include both domicile and resides in the same sentence, you're, you're saying the same thing and not using I, I think, the intent. I think actually now I'm convinced that what we need to do is say located because, okay. because this, the issue of a California doctor getting 
a pharmacist in New York to okay a prescription is not a California problem, it's a New York problem, problem right. is what you're saying. Pharmacy. And so we need to stick with location. We need to narrow it back down. Yeah, okay. Location, location, location. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I thought you so then I would actually ask domicile, for domicile. a motion for the language that's actually currently in yes. the 8F um, as it is in there. Okay, moved. So which cha what is it going to, how is it going to read? The Medical Board of California believes that the practice of medicine occurs where the patient is located at the time of the physician-patient telehealth encounter and therefore requires the physician to be under the jurisdiction of the state medical board where the patient is located. So it's back to what was in original. Um, so we, I have a motion and a second. Any um, public comment on where we ended up? <laughs> Any comments on the phone? We have no comments on the phone. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You're opposed? I think it's straight. I don't think it's been clarified sufficiently. I, I think it leaves little loopholes. I would, I would suggest it goes back to uh, to crafting and look at all the possibilities. Application is uh, Madam President, uh, Dr. Bishop raises a good point. That's a good point. I, I'm concerned that that this this has not been fully discussed today, and there's some ramifications we may not understand. This is a new technology which allows for a lot of loopholes, and I'm just concerned that that we haven't we tried to do it today, but I'm not sure we really addressed all the concerns I might have. Um, and so I'd like to have some time to think about it personally, and I think we should consider it more strongly. Well, I, I don't, that's a very good point, and I don't view this as the end of the discussion, but as a, to aid staff and, and this board in replying to inquiries and having a policy statement. A policy statement could always be changed, and, but we need to get something on record today. That's fine. I, I would um, echo what uh, Mr. Serrano Sol is suggesting, given the um, legislation that is going forward on a national uh, national stage that we need to at least get something where even though I, I unless you suggest uh, Ms. Webb that um, what we have on the books currently protects what we're trying to do anyway and I'm not sure it does we have current law <laughs> I, I, I think you know having the the statute is supportive of, of the legislature's directive, uh, but a policy statement from the board addressed to the federal level yes. would be helpful for staff to be authorized to respond. Thank you. My, I support what you just said. So we essentially have a motion that passed, but that doesn't preclude us from revisiting this right. and thinking and having a broader discussion about it. And, and I also want to, um, Dr. Krauss has, has made an excellent suggestion that there, that there are other areas where we see frequent legislation um, on an annual basis and that in some of these areas may in fact be also useful for the board to articulate policies which would not be necessarily um, definitive on any given bill, but would be useful to staff in terms of working with legislative staff or the author's office in terms of how the board is likely to um, respond to a given piece of legislation. For example, the uh, scope of practice bills, some principles or policy um, that would be helpful to staff in working with the multiple bills on. So we, we will schedule that for a conversation at the board. Um, can, can I just mention something as we go forward here? I'm, I'm raising a scenario. A patient from California is, is vacationing in Hawaii and has an issue and seeks help from a physician via telehealth from Colorado who is licensed in Colorado. Now something happens, it's bad. Who does that patient talk to? They're going to come to us. They think that, hey, I'm a California resident. Colorado may say things completely differently, but by our policy, this is fine with us. So I, I think that's what I'm saying. I, I'm happy to, to, I just want us to understand what we're really saying here, because that, 
and I realize you can always find some exception, but this is awfully nebulous. And it's fine, we've, we've passed it, but I really do think we need to tackle this in a form that really protects our consumers, because the California consumer is going to come to us and say, hey, something bad happened to me, and <clears throat> who do I talk to? And we say, I'm sorry, not us. Colorado says, sorry, it's not us. Hawaii says, not us. The patient's out in the open now. I think that's an unfortunate situation. Which is one of the issues with telehealth. I, I agree. It's, it's a very yeah. difficult topic. Yeah, I agree. Uh, okay, um, you got more, more. Um, so back to kind of what we uh, also Dr. Levine had mentioned, um, the Federation, one of the biggest issues actually right now with the Federation is actually the Interstate Licensure Compact. Um, and within the compact, compact, what will happen, and I'm just going to walk you through briefly, um, if you look behind 8E, there's actually a tab for this, and there's a lot of information in there, and I would recommend that everyone read this over. Um, but I wanted to kind of just go through some of it. Um, this individual will actually have apply um, for a principal license, and I'm, the only way I can walk you through this is to actually give an example. So let's say that an individual is applying, and they applied, for example, in Arizona. At the time of the application, the individual would also state that they want to be licensed in California and Nevada. Um, Arizona would verify the individual's eligibility, including their primary source documents and all their paperwork. Once Arizona would notify um, the commission, and, and there's information on the commission in the interstate compact um, information, that's like more of a national organization, and then the phys physician would transmit the licensure fees to the commission. The commission would send the fees and the applicant's information to California and Nevada. At this point, California would then issue this individual a license. The requirements for an applicant to enter into an interstate compact license are actually pretty rigid. Um, so basically, and it's in your document, but it's basically that they would hold one full and unrestricted license within a compact state. They have successfully completed medical school and a GME program. They're board certified. They've passed the USMLE within three attempts. They don't have discipline on any state license. They have not been convicted, and they're not under investigation by any agency or law enforcement. So when the compact was first reviewed by staff, the one problem that we actually saw was that this didn't require the individual to be fingerprinted. And as Dr. Levine pointed out to everybody um, at the Federation meeting, that is a big issue for the medical board. Um, so fingerprinting is important for two reasons. First of all, because it verifies whether that individual at the time of their uh, application, if they have anything in their past that we don't know about or they didn't um, notify us about. The second reason is because you actually get subsequent arrest reports. Once that individual is fingerprinted, any subsequent arrests or the board is notified. So it's my understanding that the Federation is actually taking this into consideration and the next draft should include language that takes our concerns into account. The one thing that they are taking into account though is an FBI fingerprinting, not the Department of Justice. Um, so if the board were actually to decide to join the compact, we would actually have to seek legislation. This would actually be a legislative change. We'd have to go through that process. We probably need to wait for the next iteration of the compact to even begin discussion on it, but we wanted to put it out there to the members um, so you can kind of be thinking about that. Um, and again, we do have to follow it and monitor it because I don't think the California legislature would put through any type of interstate compact without having the individual light, um, fingerprinted in California. And so they actually, in talking to the Federation, they've said that that could probably put in, be put into a rule under the commission. So we're looking at not this legislative cycle, obviously. It would be something we'd be looking at at the end of next year. Um, they're still drafting language and putting everything together, but it will be something we just continue to follow and make sure that we're aware of because, again, the reason this whole issue is coming up is because the telehealth community is really pushing for a licensure that actually would not allow us to hold a license here in California. They'd be able to actually ha hold a license somewhere else and practice across any state line. And we want that individual to be licensed in California so we know what's going on. I think it's a really a decent compromise FSMD can, can come up with because <laughs> there is a lot of push in Congress to make it a national issue rather than state issue where everything falls apart. Uh, federal government can't even handle what they're supposed to handle. Now they take on the 
the, the, uh, the licensing and uh, uh, discipline, where, where, what happened. So I think it's really seriously we need to look at, especially with the fingerprinting, uh, we should insist on what our policy is, whoever is going to be in that compact, uh, hopefully probably all the Western states together. Uh, with that, I think you, 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 you did not lose anything. Number one, you, they still have license here. You cut down some of the bureaucratic work for the physician who is applying for, but they're still paying the dues. They still will be under the uh, California Medical Board, and so will be under everybody else. I think it's a great idea. The other benefit or the other safeguard, I would say, is that the, the compact stipulates that the physician has to be board certified and has to be current with their board certification. So. Um, that, that is, that's a higher standard than, than any state currently, and so that, that is a safeguard in terms of at least who's doing the, who's applying for a license. Question. Uh, will we be considering things that we would want to see uh, if ultimately there is some kind of international licensure, or are we just going to object to it? You mean national licensure? <laughs> Correct. I'm sorry, national. <laughs> well, I think at this point, uh, our feeling is that national licensure would be a real problem for the medical board. But I, I agree, but, but I'm hearing that there, there's a, a, a force that's pushing us in that direction. Well, well hopefully this the f expedited multi-state license through the interstate compact will take the wind out of the sails of the push to national licensure, and I think the fact that Mr. Thompson, who's been a strong proponent of this, actually changed his legislation suggests that that pushback is is having traction. Good. And I can tell you from conversations with the Federation, um, there the Congress is happy with what the Federation is looking at, um, and so I think that they, that will stymie them um, until something like this gets put into place. And then I'm going to actually move on to um, uh, agenda item 8H. And this is the proposed board meeting dates. Um, in your packet under 8G1 are the proposed, I'm, I'm totally off, it's G, it's G I'm so sorry. Um, the proposed meeting dates for 2015. The first meeting of 2015 actually has two options, as does the last meeting of the year, um, depending on how everybody can look at their calendars and what is the best date for all the members. Um, in addition, uh, the January or February meeting and the July meeting have two options for locations. As you know, in the past, our July meeting has always been held in Sacramento because we, prior in the prior to the last three years, we have never had a budget really on time and it's caused a tremendous um, financial burden for our staff. The last three years we've had a budget on time and I don't foresee in the near future um, any change in that. If we can always revisit that. So my recommendation is um, due to the heat of Sacramento in July, we may want to switch our dates around and do the Bay Area in July and, and Sacramento in the January, February. But I would need a motion to approve the um, dates in your packet once you've determined which date works best for all the members between the first and the last meeting. Can I make a personal comment about scheduling? Yes. Uh, the, the February 5th date and the November 5th date occur when I have a monthly obligation at the Veterans Hospital. Uh, and I understand that the public is uh, upset if a veteran has a delay in appointment. This is a a specialty neuro-ophthalmology clinic that occurs once a month. So I Ill, would move veteran, them. Ill veterans in Los Angeles will have to wait another month. I would suggest that in light of that, we go for the date that is will work for veterans as well as the medical board. <laughs> so the January 29th, 30th. Does anyone have the, a comment? The, the November 5th is Wednesday, 6th is Thursday. But are we usually meet on Thursday and Friday? They should be Thursday, Friday. But it'll be 6th and 7th. We're looking at 2015. It is Thursday, Friday, yeah. according to the calendar. 2015. He was looking at 14. Oh, so we've got. Is there anyone who has a conflict on January 29th or 30th, or or October 29th or 30th? Other than it's the day before Halloween. Oh, we should definitely be in San Francisco for that. <laughs> no, <laughs> not an option, huh, David? It's always cold in San Francisco anyway, so. Okay, so we've got 
I think we've so so we've got January 29th and 30th, um, April 3rd, uh, and that would be in Sacramento. April 30th, May 1 in Los Angeles, July 30, 31 in San Francisco, and October 29 and 30 in San Diego. So let me ask you the question. Um, I don't know which calendar we're going on, the fiscal calendar or the annual calendar. But since we're in Sacramento currently today, and it's July, right? Do you want to do start the start your new program with the January calendar and do? You're going to do January again in Sacramento, or you want to do January in San Francisco and um, July in San Francisco? I'm just thinking of the new chair. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Do both. Gregorian calendar. Oh, cool. We can, but it kind of violates the spirit of moving around the state. Okay. There's not, no prohibition. I mean, we're, we, we're bound only by the rules we make. We could do San Jose <laughs> instead of San Francisco, too. Oh. Oh. So, so, again, can I have a motion to uh, approve the dates so moved. and the locations? Second? Second, yeah. Okay, all in favor? Oh, Aye. wait. Any public comment? Repeat the dates. Sure. Um, January 29-30 in Sacramento. April 30, May 1 in Los Angeles area. July 30, 31 in San Francisco, usually near the airport. October 29 and 30, San Diego area. Fog. You don't have Tule fog in the winter here. <laughs> any comments before we vote on this? I, I should ask if there's any public comments in any part of Ms. Kirkmeyer's report. I know. Yeah. Just you can do it tomorrow. Good afternoon, Julie D'Angelo Felmuth from the Center for Public Interest Law. Regarding this compact and this issue of practicing across state lines and where is the patient located at the time of treatment. This is a, 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 a huge issue that you should not overlook or treat lightly. Um, it is not, the medical profession is not the only profession that this issue is bedeviling over at the California Board of Accountancy, which licenses CPAs, not, and not just individual CPAs, but CPA firms, i.e. the big four accounting firms, which are in every state. And they like to be able to send their CPAs anywhere they want at any time to practice in any state, regardless of whether they have a license in that state. This is a huge issue. Um, if you're going to let an out-of-state pra uh, doctor practice here, they have to agree to be subject to this board and California law. And I admit I haven't read this compact, but I <laughs> they are. Okay. Good. Um, I just wanted to uh, to. Um, warn you that this is a thorny, thorny issue, and your concerns are well taken, Dr. Bishop. Um, so uh, I will read the compact, and I urge all of you to do as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? All in favor of the, we have a motion and a second on the dates and look, oh, sorry. We do. Just a moment, please. We have a we have a comment from the line of Genevieve Talvrul. Please go ahead. Ms. Talvrul, your line is open. Yes. Can you hear me? We do. Just a moment, please. We have a. Comments from the line of Genevieve Talbrule. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, I think it's a very important issue, and I'm very glad. Talbrule, your line is open. Yes. Uh, I'm very glad that you are looking at that issue. That's a very important issue. Yes, can you hear me? Please do. Just a moment, please. Would you tell us who you are? We Record. <laughs> um, Jimmy, so, sorry, um, 
Jalviev. Mr. whatever his name is. Uh, David? Jalviev. She's not the problem. He, he's the, the person who's telling her, him, her to speak keeps okay. saying, your line is open. So I, he's I stepping think so. I, th I think she's Boy, got her audio on. on. Oh, yeah. 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 I think it's playing back through her audio. Feedback. Oh, really? Yeah. See, yeah. a technologically, I'm for really. public comment. Because I noticed that in an earlier conversation that there was a constant. But I'm hearing him. Through him. But I think it's through her, through her system. Again, it illustrates the problem of not having instant real-time data. <laughs> Point taken. Maybe she can tell you what she thinks, and you can tell us what she thinks. We'll play telephone. Gone? She's out. She's gone. Oh, okay, she's gone. She's finished talking. I couldn't understand what she was saying. I'm sure it was very uh, interesting. She's finished. At six. Madam Chair? Well, let me ask. I know. Um, we can retrieve our line again if you guys want. Madam Chair, she's gone. Thank you. Just go ahead. All in favor of accepting the dates and locations as described? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? If she comes back on the line, we'd be happy to listen to her. Um, we Our next agenda item is, um, actually I've skipped, um, communication with interested parties, and so I'm going to return to that right now. It's agenda item six. Um, do any of the board members have any communication with interested parties to disclose? Yep. Dr. Yip? Ms. Wright? No. Dr. Krause? No, I, I, I think I'm obligated to repeat it at each meeting, although there has been no discussion of, of board uh, positions to be taken, but I will remind the public uh, at each meeting that I do sit on the board of the California Ambulatory Surgery Association, which has many issues of mutual interest, and I'm still a trustee of the California Medical Association, uh, and I think it's my obligation to remind the public of that at each meeting. So that's, uh, that's under the disclosures as opposed to interested communications, have, specific there been, conversations. There have been no specific conversations okay. in relation to our On board. issues before the board. Right. That's really what this is about. Ms. Pines? No. Oh. Oh. All right. We have an affirmative negative for all board members, and I, I myself have had no conversations with interested parties. Nobody's interested in me anymore, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Um, <laughs> So I'm going to move on to the election of officers. Um, in your packet under tab nine for both board members and members of the public. Oops. Oh, okay. Sorry, we're going back to item eight. Eight A, we need an, uh, a motion to approve the board's approval of orders following completion of pro probation and orders for license surrender during probation, there is a list at each board member's place. So moved. Oh, second. second. Third. <laughs> Any um, questions for the staff? Any comments? Um, members of the public, any comments about this? Anyone on the phone? There are no comments on the phone lines. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? These are all passed. All right. Uh, back to uh, agenda item nine, election of officers. I would like to nominate David Serrano Sewell as president of the medical board for the following year. We have to start with the secretary. Oh. <laughs> Why don't we start from the you. top down? I mean, I heard today from the discussion, it was top down, bottom up, top down. What's going on? I think that's the way the president I apologize. Goes. I just was looking at the agenda item, and the first one is. We start with secretary, vice president. It doesn't say that. Okay. I would like to ask for nominations for secretary. <laughs> I nominate Denise Bond. Second. 
Any other nominations? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Public Any public comment, sorry. On each nomination? Okay. Any, ah, I see. Um, I'm, I'll get it down <laughs> now that this is my last, my last board meeting. Any, any comments from members of the public? Any comments on the phone? There are no comments from the phone lines. Okay, I'm going to ask for nominations for vice president, and I would like to nominate Dr. Gananadev for vice president. Second. Second. Any other nominations? Uh, any comments from members of the public in the room? or on the phone? There are no comments on the phone lines. Mm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. I would like to call for nominations for president. I Ms. would like to nominate David Serrano Sewell for president for the coming year. All in favor? Oops, no. Nope. Any comments? <laughs> <laughs> Any comments, character witnesses? <laughs> Leave the room. I think we have to have a silent, a secret ballot. <laughs> Any comments from members, uh, members of the public on the phone? There are no comments from the phone lines. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. It's a, a great honor to serve in this capacity. I look forward to working with uh, our executive director and staff in this next year. And I just wanted to take a, a moment of privilege uh, to, to express the board's great deep appreciation uh, to Dr. Levine for her leadership. Absolutely. Often in a, a challenging environment, um, we benefited from her intellect, her, her ethics, her commitment to public service, and her patience. Uh, simply put, uh, Dr. Levine leads by example, and she is an example to all of us. And as we begin this next term, that will be the standard. So to that end, uh, on behalf of the board and staff, <laughs> we have something for you. Thank you so much. That is very sweet. Very sweet. You have to open it. I will. I'll open it. It's nothing. It's it's not a bottle of wine. I can tell you. Um, before we recess the meeting, we have other one. We have one other um, business I, item of business, and I want to take this opportunity to recognize a board member who served on this board and served with great distinction from 2006 until 2013. Dr. Reggie Lowe, would you please come forward? I think almost everyone in the audience is very familiar with Dr. Lowe, and he served this board, this is for you, you. in many capacities. Um, he took a leadership role in serving as chair of the Enforcement Committee and was really a shining light for all of us in terms of um, enabling us to understand where we had problems and what we needed to do. He was instrumental in working with staff on the enforcement process and identifying ways to reduce complaint processing times. He also did remarkable work and remarkable leadership on the importance of training expert reviewers and uh, um, reduce, uh, increasing the sense of professionalism and commitment of those expert reviewers and trying to reduce the, the times when expert reviewers didn't understand the fact that they were actually participating in a legal proceeding rather than a, a medical consultation. Um, and he really has been a catalyst to the um, uh, and, a, and a beak, as I said, a shining light for the staff in putting together the expert reviewer training program along with Laura Sweet. I want to thank you for your outstanding service to the board. Um, we're sorry you didn't decide to reapply for another term. I've given you your gift, and I want to turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much for those very kind words. Um, <clears throat> First, I wanted to congratulate uh, Ms. Kirschmeyer for her appointment as executive director. Uh, I think that's uh, a great addition, and she's been here so long, and she has so much knowledge and expertise to lend to that position. 
And I too want to add my thanks to uh, Dr. Levine because she truly took over the medical board at a time when we were in somewhat of uh, disarray in terms of uh, the perception from the legislature and she really helped us through Sunset Review and it really was a pleasure and uh, <coughs> honor and a privilege to serve on the medical board. Uh, the work is challenging and uh, I can see things haven't changed a whole lot since I left and uh, <laughs> while I missed it for a few minutes, uh, I don't miss it too much now, although I get many calls about the medical board that I'm glad to forward on to all of you. So I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of challenging issues ahead and uh, I just uh, encourage all of you to continue your outstanding work and uh, thank you to all of you. And uh, I've been able to develop some incredible relationships uh, as a member of the board. I've met some very smart people and I've learned a lot from everyone else. And uh, thank you again for this uh, privilege. Sharon? Yeah, absolutely. On, on Sharon.